A seven-year-old girl and her 13-year-old brother are settling in for their favorite after-school activity, watching TV. The children's parents won't be home from work for several hours, and watching the after-school programming together before making a snack is a staple of their day. The boy takes his normal position on the couch as the girl plants herself right in front of the television and turns it on. This is the time when Pretty Pony Paradise comes on and she never misses an episode. Her brother would prefer something else, but he also loves to see his sister happy, so he always lets her watch the ponies have their adventures. Today, though, when she turns to the right channel, there's something else. Instead of the usual Pretty Pony theme song, circus music comes out of the television speakers. The girl watches as the brightly colored words, Bobble the Clown, appear on the screen. Hey, this isn't Pretty Ponies, she says to her brother, but when she looks back, he's asleep. The girl isn't happy, but she decides to give this new show a chance. And maybe her pony show will come on after anyway. The circus music stops, and a happy-looking clown cartwheels onto the screen. Hello, kids, the garish clown says. Do you like fun? The girl did like fun. Perhaps this new show wouldn't be so bad. She watches as Bobble walks down the street of an average, happy American small town. Everyone seems to love the happy clown waving at him as he passes by. Bobble pauses in front of a house where a man is mowing the lawn. He convinces the man to stop his yard work and join him, and the two happily head down the sidewalk together. The girl is a little confused by this show. There's not much in the way of jokes, but she decides to keep watching anyway. Bobble and his new friend stop in front of a house that is painted to resemble a circus tent. This must be where Bobble lives. He invites the man in, and they both enter the house. Inside, Bobble motions for the man to sit while he prepares some refreshments. The girl watches as Bobble moves to the kitchen. There, he begins sharpening knives as he explains directly to the camera the best way to prepare meat, the way the skin must carefully be removed from the flesh, and how the bones should be saved for future soup stocks. The girl watches with fascination as Bobble teaches his special lesson. Maybe this is a good show after all. Maybe this is her new favorite show. The girl gets up, her brother still asleep, and heads to the kitchen. She pulls out a drawer to help her reach the counter where the knife block is located, and pulls out the meat cleaver. She looks at it gleaming in the light, entranced by its sharp, shiny edge. The girl returns to the living room and gets up onto the couch next to her sleeping brother. She watches as Bobble steps away from his pot of red, boiling meat and looks right into the camera. The girl stands up and holds up the meat cleaver. Bobble walks towards the camera with fascination in his eyes, as if he can see through the screen and is watching the girl. She slowly raises the knife above her head as Bobble starts whispering, Come on, do it! Licking his lips in anticipation. The girl pauses for a second, looks at her sleeping brother one more time, and brings the cleaver down. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-993, also known as Bobble the Clown. But first, there's something I need from you. I need your help to spread the word about some of the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives, and the best way you can help is to subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This will help me bring you more and more SCP videos. Now, back to our file. SCP-993 is the designation the SCP Foundation has given to a children's television program entitled Bobble the Clown. At first glance, the Bobble the Clown show appears to be a standard children's educational cartoon with bright colors, a mascot, and a rote formula that involves the titular character of Bobble the Clown learning a new skill or engaging in a new activity. The program appears to have no recurring supporting cast, with Bobble being the only character who returns to each episode. The settings usually change between episodes as well, with Bobble often being seen in a new or unique location. Despite appearing as a show made for children, the anomalous properties exhibited by this strange television program make themselves apparent almost immediately. First, anyone older than the age of 10 who watches the show will immediately fall unconscious as soon as it begins, and will remain in a comatose state until the program ends. Upon waking, they will report having felt a painful, stabbing headache just prior to falling unconscious. 
The show's most disturbing property, though, is what has been described by those under the age of 10 who are able to view the program. They report seeing Bobble the Clown teach lessons similar to the way many children's shows extol the virtues of good hygiene or going to bed on time. But with Bobble, the lessons are quite different. Topics that Bobble has presented lessons on and encouraged children to try have included torture, murder, and even cannibalism. As the subject watches, the lessons appear to become ingrained in their minds, and repeated exposure to the show has resulted in permanent effects that resemble symptoms of psychosis and schizophrenia. Documented episodes of Bobble the Clown have included Bobble in the Big City, in which Bobble appears in a large United States city reminiscent of New York, and instructs the viewer on various ways to avoid detection when lighting fires with common resources like mosquito coils. The episode ends with Bobble setting fire to a large building before he exits the screen. The camera continues to stay locked on the burning building for several more minutes as the sound of screams can be heard. In another titled Bobble's Sneaky Saturday, Bobble is again in a major city, this time one that looks similar to London, England, with the Elizabeth Tower containing Big Ben visible in the background. In this episode, Bobble is shown to be quietly following a woman as she walks into her home. Once she arrives, Bobble attacks her with a large butcher knife before giving the audience tips on how to remain unnoticed in crowded places. Bobble gets the truth, finds the clown in a prisoner of war camp, where Bobble is shown torturing a captured soldier as he asks him nonsensical questions that the soldier cannot possibly answer. This continues until the prisoner dies, after which Bobble details methods for inflicting painful but non-lethal injuries. Bobble Hates You is one of the most unnerving of the documented episodes, and consists of Bobble sitting alone in a blank room, silently and angrily staring at the viewer for a full 30 minutes. But the strangest of all is from an episode title filled with expletives, in which Bobble appears to be in a Foundation Secure Site video archive room, the same one where recordings of Bobble the Clown are stored. In this episode, a rage-filled Bobble describes methods for breaching several SCPs' containment. He then gives personal details about the researchers assigned to these SCPs, including their daily routines, before offering several potential ways to murder them. An interesting detail about this episode, at one point, an animated depiction of a particular SCP Foundation researcher is seen to walk past Bobble. A clock on the wall shows the time and this same researcher later confirmed that they did, in fact, walk through the video archive at this exact time, but had no recollection of seeing an animated clown filming a television program in the room when they did so. Episodes of Bobble the Clown continue to be broadcast from an unknown source, but future episodes are to be intercepted using Protocol Upsilon Beta 3 to prevent them from being seen by the public. All broadcasts are recorded for the Foundation's archives, and in order to perform research on the anomaly, subjects under the age of 10 must be used to view them. Once the viewers have described what takes place in the episode, they are then to immediately be administered Class A amnestics. Despite the danger these episodes pose to those who view them, since they are able to be reliably blocked from public broadcast, SCP-993 has been classified as safe, and for now, Bobble the Clown appears to be contained as well as it can be. It's late on a Saturday night in New York City, 11.55 p.m. to be exact. A man is running towards the subway station on 59th Street. He's just gotten off from work at the restaurant where he waits tables, and he's in a hurry to get home and spend some time with his girlfriend. As he approaches the station, he notices something strange. Someone has placed a wooden barrier in front of the entrance. The man has never seen something like this before, but he hasn't lived in Brooklyn very long. Everything about the station looks normal behind the barrier, and he's in a hurry. He doesn't want to have to go several blocks to the next station, so he hops the barrier. What's the worst that could happen? As the man walks onto the train platform, he starts to second-guess his decision. The platform is empty, and come to think of it, he hasn't seen anyone in the station at all. Maybe he did make a mistake. Maybe the station really is closed for repairs. He turns around to leave. But just as he does, he hears a train. Good. Everything is normal. He checks his watch. 11.57 p.m. on the dot. The train comes to a stop, and its doors slide open. It looks a little older than the trains he usually rides, but it appears to be in perfect shape, and it's going the direction of his home. So he steps on board. 
Just like the station and the platform, there's no one else on the train. Strange, but he's ridden nearly empty trains before, especially late at night, though usually at this time on a Saturday there's at least a few people on board. Just then, he hears something in the station. He turns to see someone running down the platform crying out. Stop! Stop! The man in the mass transit authority vest cries, dropping what looks to be his dinner on the platform as he runs. While the MTA worker is still several feet away, the doors snap shut and the train begins to move. The MTA worker cries out again to stop, but he knows there's no point. He watches as the train heads down the tracks and disappears into the darkness. With a sigh, he takes out a walkie-talkie and it squawks to life. We've lost another one, he says. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-052, also known as the Time Traveling Train. SCP-052 appears to be a standard-looking Type R4 New York City subway train. Official city records state that the train was built in 1932 and decommissioned for scrap in 1975. Despite the fact that it should no longer exist, SCP-052 continues to appear on the Uptown AD track at the 59th Street and 8th Avenue station at exactly 11.57 p.m. every Saturday night. The train appears to be in perfect condition, just the same as when it was built over 80 years ago, and it is marked as an A-train. Each Saturday, the train arrives at exactly the same time, opens its doors to accept or discharge passengers for precisely five minutes, then closes its doors and disappears until the next week. Where did the train come from? And where does it go in between the weekly appearances? These are questions the SCP Foundation is trying to answer. But perhaps the most frightening aspect of SCP-052 is that once you get on the train, there's no guarantee of ever getting off. Sadly, the majority of subjects that have been observed boarding SCP-052 have not been heard from again. The rare few that have been recovered claim to have boarded the train on various dates, ranging from 1976 all the way to the year 2204, with the latter claiming he thought he was boarding a special 300th anniversary train. Thus far, none of the recovered passengers have reported any memories or knowledge of their time on board the train between entering and exiting. Any passengers spotted disembarking from SCP-052 are to be immediately brought to Site-21 for questioning to determine their origin and assess whether they pose any threat to the current time stream. The Foundation has had great success administering Class A amnestics to passengers who arrived from the past and reintegrating them into society. But any passenger who is identified as being from the future must be held indefinitely to prevent potential disruptions to this reality's time stream. Per Order 69-A1 from O5 Council Member O5-9, there are currently 26 recovered passengers being held at Site 21 who fit this description, and there are not yet any procedures in place that would allow for their safe release into modern society, nor has there been any workable theories for how to return them to their original home time. Despite the protocols in place to prevent public access, some passengers from the present have still managed to accidentally board SCP-052, and subjects from other times continue to appear. Following interviews, it's been discovered that some of these subjects arrive from alternate timelines and realities. This raises the question of whether it is possible for SCP-052 to appear in other times and places, which may require the containment of additional locations, and reports of any suspicious activity involving unscheduled trains are being monitored and investigated around the world. Following its initial discovery, Several tests were attempted in order to better understand the anomalous train and what may be happening when it is no longer visible. The first test took place on May 31st, 2009. An agent was told to simply board the train. They did as requested and have yet to be recovered as of the present date. A second test took place a week later on June 6th. This agent too was never recovered, though reports indicate that he may have returned to our timeline in 1980, at which point he was killed in a confrontation that has since been classified. A third test was conducted the next week on June 13th. Once again, the agent was told to board the train and did so. This time, though, the agent returned. Just two weeks later, on June 27th, the agent stepped back off the train, with his hands appearing to have been surgically removed. A note had been placed in his pocket that had the simple message, Send no more, written on it. The agent claims not to remember any of his experiences on the train over the two weeks he was gone, or 
what may have happened to his hands. Following this third test, O5 Command issued orders stopping the use of Foundation agents as passengers on SCP-052. D-Class, due to their disposable nature as convicted felons and death row inmates, were considered as potential replacements for the agents in the exploration of SCP-052, but the risk of releasing them into the past, or the future, was determined to be too great. Other than the agent who knowingly boarded the train, several other notable passengers have been recovered. One case involved the recovery of a woman who entered the train on July 14, 2012, but was recovered four years earlier, on March 8, 2008. She entered the train while on her way home from the theater, and was surprised to learn she traveled four years into the past. Because another version of her existed at the time she was recovered, she was held to prevent unwanted temporal effects. Another subject was recovered in 2008 who claimed to be from the year 1976. Although there was nothing physically wrong with him and no risk of time stream disruptions, Foundation psychiatrists recommended that he be held indefinitely, as 32 years was believed to be too long a period of time to successfully reintegrate into society. Perhaps the most interesting recovery was of a man claiming to be a Level 4 supervisor from the SCP Federation, who boarded the train in December of 2124. He said that he had been administered a Class A amnestic prior to boarding, and remembered nothing until his recovery in 2010. While the agent can clearly never be released into society, O5 Command has approved the sharing of classified information about various anomalies, in the hopes that he can provide additional information on possible containment procedures. Because SCP-052 has so far proven impossible to stop or remove from the New York City subway system, it has been classified as Euclid but its predictable nature means that the Foundation is usually able to prevent the public from encountering it. The 59th Street ABCD station is closed to the public between 11 p.m. on Saturday night and 1 a.m. on Sunday morning, under the pretext of track maintenance. Any passengers seen leaving SCP-052 must be taken to Site-21 for debriefing and processing, and members of the public who simply see SCP-052 may be released after the administration of a Class B amnestic. As for what happens to most of the passengers who board SCP-052 and are never seen from again, we simply don't know. At first glance, it looks like a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Nothing to suggest that anything weird is going on here. Certainly, if the D-Class personnel assigned to investigate this facility had encountered this room in the wild, if you walked into a bathroom that looked like this while visiting a friend's house or lunching in a restaurant or even stopping at a gas station rest stop, he wouldn't have any reason to think anything was amiss. But this is the SCP Foundation, so he knows that nothing here is as it seems. He glances briefly up at the camera installed in the ceiling. The lens aperture dilates briefly, focusing on his face, and he knows that an SCP technical on the other end is watching his every move. He grimaces, fully aware that his status as a member of D-Class personnel means that every experiment could be his last. That knowledge doesn't exactly endear him to the Foundation or its mission, but it's not like he has much of a choice in picking his assignments. Suddenly, a voice crackles to life over the intercom. Please step fully into the bathroom, says the researcher on the other end of the camera feed. What's this all about? asks the D-Class personnel. This is just a bathroom, isn't it? What's so special about this place? His eyes scan the room. The floor is covered with smooth white tiles. The walls are a soothing light blue color, reminiscent of a calm ocean, the sort of color that you might pick for its soothing effect when you need to make use of these facilities. A large mirror is fixed to the wall, before a countertop with a sink. Next to the sink, there's a toilet, and next to that, a bathtub with a shower. There's a scrubbing brush and a plunger stashed behind the toilet tank, and a fuzzy shag cover stretched over the toilet lid. It's all very ordinary. It's much too ordinary, he thinks. A sudden horrible thought occurs to him. You're not gonna watch me use the toilet, he asks, a slight edge of panic in his voice. That's absurd, of course, but here at the SCP Foundation, there's nothing that he would put past these people. They've always got some new weirdness happening, and it wouldn't at all surprise him to learn that they would want to watch him at his most exposed. The voice comes back over the intercom. What? No, you don't need to use the... Look, just step forward. Literally all that I want you to do is to step into the room. The D-Class smirks to himself. He's already been through more of these crazy experiments than he would care to remember, and he has the scars to prove it. It gives him a small measure of satisfaction to hear the agent getting flustered. Even if he has to participate in these dangerous experiments, he can at least make things awkward for his tormentors. That seems like a little bit of poetic justice to him. 
As the agent requested, though, he steps forward. The moment that he's cleared the threshold, the door slams behind him with a crash. The D-Class jumps in surprise and shouts, What the? Why'd you do that? I didn't do that, says the voice over the intercom. Of course, thinks the D-Class personnel. He should have expected this. He grabs the doorknob and tries to yank the door open, but the door is stuck fast. He yanks again, harder this time, but the result is the same. The door doesn't budge at all. The door's stuck, cries the D-Class. He feels his heart start to beat faster and his temperature begins to rise. What terrible thing does this room plan to do to him? But after a moment, he begins to calm down. It doesn't seem like this room is planning to do anything. Maybe it's just a room with a weird door. But if that were the case, then why would the SCP Foundation be interested in this? Just hang tight, says the agent. I'll see what I can do about getting that door open. A few moments later, the agent arrives at the door to the bathroom and gives it a sharp yank. It doesn't budge. Door's stuck, she says. The D-Class rolls his eyes. Of course it's stuck. Hold on a second, I'll go get a technician, she says. The D-Class personnel listens to the sound of the agent's feet retreating into the distance. He sits down on the closed toilet and buries his face in his hands. What a day. Is he going to be trapped inside this bathroom forever? He can't help but speculate, but he tries not to think about it. He's more annoyed than anything, truth be told. He wonders if the agent is actually going for help, or if she's still just sitting in her cubicle, watching him through the camera and waiting for the other shoe to drop. His eyes flick to the camera, and he furrows his brow. He's so intent on the camera that he doesn't notice as a dark shape slowly bubbles out from the bathtub drain. It's a cockroach, a perfectly ordinary cockroach. Or is it? The roach remains motionless for a moment, perfectly still, except for the subtle twitch of its antenna. Then, all at once, it starts to move. The roach scuttles across the tub, scaling the porcelain walls, and runs across the counter. Like all cockroaches, it seems confused now that it's emerged into the light and eager to find a dark corner where it can hide again. It reaches the edge of the countertop, but, of course, a sheer cliff is no obstacle for an insect. It shimmies down the cabinet and makes a dash across the tiled floor. That's when the moving roach finally catches the eye of the D-Class personnel. He yelps in surprise and pulls his feet up, his knees going flush with his chest. The roach looks oddly out of place in this clean and well-maintained bathroom, and the sight of this disgusting little vermin fills the D-Class with a sudden and deep sense of loathing. That's one massive cockroach, he mumbles to himself. Almost as if it heard his words, the roach starts to skitter toward him. The D-Class does not like that at all. Without hesitation, he immediately stomps on the roach, bringing his foot down with a definite thud, and then grinding the unfortunate insect under his heel. The sound is loud enough to attract the attention of the agent behind the camera. Apparently, she must have returned to her post after sending a request for a technician. What was that? She asks, her voice crackling over the intercom. There was a really huge cockroach, just came out of the tub. Come on, hurry up and get the door open. I don't like it in here. There might be more of them. Okay, okay, says the agent. Just hold on for a second. Help will be here in just a couple minutes. Don't be so jumpy, it's just a bug after all, nothing to worry about. The D-Class personnel isn't so sure of that. After all, when you're dealing with unknown anomalies like those in the SCP archives, can you ever just not worry? He pulls his shoe off, stands up from the toilet, and walks over to the sink. Grumbling to himself, he turns the faucet and starts to wash the insect icor off the bottom of his shoe. He's too intent on his activity to notice that a second cockroach has already popped out of the bathtub drain. Like the first one, it hesitates for a moment, and then it scuttles across the tub, scales the walls, and makes a beeline for its deceased comrade. As this happens, a third roach emerges from the drain, and a fourth. By the time the D-Class turns around, a whole battalion of cockroaches has entered the bathroom. His eyes go wide as he takes in the scene. A good dozen roaches have clustered around the first smashed roach, all feeding on its carcass. It's a grisly scene, and the D-Class is immediately revolted. He knows nothing about roaches, nothing that might suggest to him that this is in any way unusual behavior for these insects, but he doesn't really care. It looks disgusting, and he's positive that it isn't natural. I don't like this, I don't like this, he yells, panic rising in his voice. Get me out of here! Hurry up and open the stupid door! The observing agent, safe in her office, doesn't share the D-Class personnel's terror. From her point of view, she's just watching a man freak out over a couple of perfectly ordinary bugs. Of course, the scene takes on a whole different feel when you're not the one being asked to expose yourself to strange and potentially dangerous SCPs. She can't help but chuckle at the scene. It's not funny, cries the D-Class, once again jumping on the toilet and pulling up his legs into a fetal position. Those things are huge! You better get me out of here now, or… 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 
He struggles to think of some threat that might convince the agent to take him seriously, but he fails. The agent is too busy taking notes on the situation. The roaches look to be ordinary specimens of the American cockroach, each about 5 or 6 centimeters long. When the group of roaches has devoured their smashed comrade, that's when things start to get really strange. The small group turns as one toward the D-Class. Now that is weird, thinks the agent. The D-Class probably thinks the same, because he starts to scream incoherently. Both Agent and D-Class are so focused on the roaches that they don't notice something even more sinister happening in the bathtub. A dark, tar-like substance has started to seep out of the drain, gradually filling the bathtub. The Agent is too busy trying to soothe the D-Class, trying to convince him to stop screaming and start explaining the scene to her in rational detail so that she can add his observations to her notes. Meanwhile, the oily black tar continues to bubble from the drain, the surface level rising, until the tub is approximately one-fifth full of black goo. The D-Class's eyes suddenly alight on the tub. What the… What, what's this? He mutters. Suddenly, dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds, of roaches start to rise from the black goo. They boil over the sides of the tub in massive chitinous waves, spreading across the floor of the bathroom in a solid sheet of glimmering black carapaces. It happens so fast that the D-Class can only gibber in mindless terror. There are too many roaches. For the moment, the D-Class seems safe perched on the toilet. The roaches can't scale up the shiny porcelain, slipping back down at every attempt. He scrambles to his feet, standing on top of the toilet lid and praying that it will hold his full weight. Otherwise, he's going to tumble head first into that writhing, seething swarm of vermin. He stares at what looks like an ocean of living insects, the light reflecting off their chitinous shells with an evil, oily gleam. It's like a scene out of a cheesy horror movie, but it's all too real. Through his panic, the D-Class vaguely recalls that when he was a kid, he once read a book about ancient life on Earth during the Permian era, when the Earth was a hot, humid jungle, when high temperatures and oxygen-rich air made the world perfect for giant insects. Cockroaches have lived on this Earth for how many million years, he wonders. He knows it's a lot, and he can't help but think about that legacy now that he's confronted with a living carpet made entirely out of roaches. Aren't scientists always predicting that cockroaches will eventually outlive humanity? They're the only nasty little things tenacious enough to survive a nuclear holocaust or the punishments of climate change. He's less worried that cockroaches will outlive humanity right now, though, and more worried that they might outlive him personally. The roaches can't get up the toilet, but they have more success in scaling the walls. Soon the walls are covered in a mass of roaches, the air filling with a constant cacophony of chittering and scratching that sends chills up the spine of the panicking D-Class. The roaches start to march across the ceiling, and the D-Class gets the distinct impression that, if he doesn't do something fast, he's going to be completely covered. In desperation, he throws his shoe across the room with all his might, shouting curses as he does, but it doesn't do any good. His shoe hits the opposite wall and bounces off, dropping into the swarm and quickly sinking beneath the rolling tide of chittering insects. His futile attack only provokes the insect mob, and several dozen roaches take flight, launching themselves at the D-Class. He shouts and claws them away as roaches land on his face and shoulders. They scramble up his neck and tangle themselves in his hair. He keeps shouting and swatting them away, but there are more and more of them every second. More roaches are swarming out from the black oil simmering in the bathtub every second, and now they all seem intent on the D-Class. They crawl inside his mouth as he screams. He gags and coughs, trying to spit them out, but it seems that they're already crawling down his throat. In his panic, he slips and lurches forward, screaming and flailing his arms helplessly. He dives into the writhing mass of roaches. Within seconds, he is covered in a sheet of living insects. The observing agent is speechless, unable to comprehend the sheer insanity of what she is seeing, but watching the D-Class be consumed by cockroaches prompts her to vomit in disgust. The retching, gagging noises can be heard over the intercom, hardly professional behavior, but we're way past worrying about that by now. By now, the bathtub is almost completely filled with black goo. The roaches start to return to the bathtub, scaling the tub walls in vast waves and throwing themselves into the pool of dark tar. As they retreat, they reveal the decimated remains of the D-Class. The corpse is ragged and bloody, partially eaten, its stomach visibly bloated. It twitches slightly, and the observing agent momentarily wonders if it's somehow possible that the D-Class personnel survived his ordeal, even though even a brief glance at the state of the corpse should make it clear it would be impossible. There's just far too much damage. It's obvious, in fact, that the twitching is caused by roaches that have burrowed into the body, squirming beneath its skin. Suddenly, something else begins to rise from the bathtub. It's another corpse, one in a much more advanced state of decomposition, to the point that it's nearly skeletal, but there's still enough flesh clinging to its bones 
that you might be able to recognize it for the person it used to be. Under the black ooze, there's still a ghost of a face clinging to the skull, liquefying eyeballs still rolling around loosely in its dark sockets, tattered lips hanging off of stained teeth. Its eyes swivel toward the prone body of the D-Class with malevolent intention. Black tar drips from its arms and skull. It places one hand against the rim of the bathtub, the other against the blue wallpapered wall, and slowly hoists itself up and out of the pool of black tar, displacing another few dozen cockroaches with its movements. The corpse slowly stumbles to its feet, dribbling black ichor, and steps out of the bathtub. It staggers across the room with sticky, uncertain steps, leaving a trail of roaches and black goo. When it reaches the body of the D-Class, it grabs it by the leg and then drags it back across the bathroom floor toward the tub. The skeletal corpse pulls the body of the D-Class personnel into the tub, and both of them submerge into the black goo. The remaining cockroaches follow suit, jumping into the black oil and slowly sinking below the surface. At the same time, the level of the black substance begins to fall as it starts to swirl away down the drain. After several minutes, the black goo has completely drained away, leaving no trace that it ever existed. The roaches, the strange living cadaver, and the corpse of the D-Class have all completely vanished, so that by the time the door of the bathroom clicks open again, there's nothing to suggest that there's anything at all strange about this room. Too late, the agent bursts into the room, flinging open the now unlocked door with all her might. She scans the room in confusion, knowing that just moments ago, it was the scene of grisly carnage. There's no evidence of that now, but just the memory, the sight of the D-Class's bloated corpse, the sound of thousands of cockroaches marching and scuttling in unison, is enough to make the bile rise in her throat. She leans forward, hands on her knees, and vomits again. She's seen a lot as an SCP Foundation agent, but this SCP is definitely not one for the faint of heart, or the sick of stomach. What just happened here? Unfortunately, this is far from an unusual occurrence when you're dealing with SCP-6698. SCP-6698 is to all appearances a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Until it started to manifest anomalous behavior, it existed as a second-story bathroom in a private residence somewhere in Alabama in the United States. The first instance of anomalous behavior happened the day after a resident of the household, a 16-year-old male, reported killing an unusually large cockroach in the bathroom. The following night, when using the same bathroom, that same resident was overheard yelling in fright. His screams were followed by sounds described as a sink breaking and then a body falling against a crunchy and wet surface. Other members of the family attempted to respond to these sounds, but found that the door to the bathroom refused to open. Once the noises subsided, they found the door suddenly quite pliable, but when they checked inside, they could not find any evidence of the bathroom's teenage victim. The SCP Foundation quickly responded to the incident, amnesticizing the family and planting a suggestion that the missing teenager simply ran away from home into their subconscious. The family was moved from the residence, which was then purchased by a Foundation shell company to allow for further testing. When a human enters the room, the door to the bathroom immediately closes and locks. The door will remain locked until the event is completed. Attempts to physically damage the door when it is in its locked state have all met with failure. A recording camera was installed in the bathroom to allow agents to observe the event as it unfolds. Victims who unknowingly wander into SCP-6698 will find themselves trapped. Moments after the door locks, cockroaches will start to emerge from the drain of the bathtub. Once the swarm has reached sufficient mass, the roaches will attack and feed upon the victim. At the same time, a black oil will start to fill the tub, laying the stage for the emergence of the mysterious tar zombie, which then removes the corpse of the victim from the scene. The observing agent noted that the skeletal corpse she saw emerge from the tub bore a superficial resemblance to the missing 16-year-old male, raising questions about how SCP-6698 might have bonded with its original victim. Testing was suspended following the death of the D-Class personnel, so it is currently unclear if the same tar zombie appears during every instance, or if perhaps SCP-6698 pulls from a rotating roster of previous victims during its manifestations. At this moment, the relationship between the Tar Zombie, the Black Ooze, and the legions of carnivorous cockroaches is unclear, but large amounts of spectral energy have been detected in the room, leading to an assumption that the event must be supernatural in nature and to the involvement of the Department of Spectral Phenomena. Since SCP-6698 only attacks victims who enter the bathroom and does not appear to be capable of manifestation once the door is open, the SCP Foundation has attached a special apparatus to prevent the door from closing of its own accord, and assigned SCP-6698 a designation of safe. One thing that is for sure, though, is that of all the ways that deadly SCP anomalies might choose to do away with their victims, 
being eaten alive from the inside by a swarm of scuttling cockroaches probably ranks up there as one of the worst. So that's something to think about the next time that you're looking for a little privacy in the bathroom. The young man watches as the lily-white coffin is lowered into the ground. He's surprised at the dryness of his eyes, seeing as it's his own mother being buried. But now isn't the time for questions. When the dirt is piled on and the small service comes to an end, the young man is the last to leave. Other than the eulogy, he never says a single word to anyone. She'd been difficult towards the end. He'd cared for his mother until her disease had made it so that she wasn't really his mother anymore. And then for another two years after that, things had been said and done that he wished he could remove from his memories of her. But the past is forever set. As he looks up from his mother's gravestone, he notices something strange in the distance, perhaps 30 feet away from him. A little girl, maybe about 10 years old, in a school uniform, standing behind another gravestone. She's wearing a worn-looking plastic pig mask and carrying a dirty rag doll. The young man stares into the dark eye holes of her mask for a moment, wondering if he's really seeing this or if she's a figment of his imagination brought on by stress and grief. Then he blinks and she's gone. For a second, he feels a frightening sentence looping through the dark recesses of his mind. You're starting to lose it already. A few years ahead of schedule, you'd make your mother proud. The young man shakes his head and leaves for home. Of course, he might see things on a day like this. The mind does funny things when it's in a state of extreme emotional distress. It was perfectly natural that he'd see strange things on a day like this. But that little girl in the pig mask really did look real. Arriving home is a surreal experience. It's the first time in a long time that he's truly felt alone, like a child lost in a vast and unfamiliar space. Something about it just felt wrong. He makes himself a microwave meal and eats it silently in the kitchen. The place is so quiet, no panicked yells or cries of pain. He sighs and looks out the kitchen window as he washes the dishes and, in the distance, he sees another strange sight. A young boy, 12 years old or so, standing out in the cold, dark woods next to his house. He's wearing only swimming trunks. Swimming trunks and a worn-looking plastic mouse mask. A rag doll hangs limply from his thin, pale arm just like the one the girl in the graveyard was holding. The young man's first instinct is to go out and help the child. After all, it's a cold night, he could catch his death out there. But with another blink, the child is gone, just trees in the dark. He breathes a ragged sigh and takes an aspirin. Something must really be wrong with him if he keeps seeing strange children with animal faces out there. He trudges upstairs, hoping that maybe he'll get some sleep tonight and feel a little better in the morning. Shadows dart in the corners of his eyes, but he pays them no mind. He can't trust anything he sees today. He pauses for a moment in front of the room where his mother used to sleep. It looks cavernous without her tiny form nestled in the bed. He thinks about how she'd last been in that same room a little more than a week earlier. He sighs, turns off the light, and goes to bed. That night, the young man has strange dreams. He feels like a tiny fish at the deepest, darkest point of the ocean watching huge black shapes loom and shift around him. He's afraid. He feels like he's being watched. The sudden spike of terror jolts him out of his sleep, and that's when he sees them. The children in the animal masks, seven of them now. They stand around his bed, hand in hand, like they're playing some kind of game, but in dead silence. Each one has a rag doll sitting patiently at their feet. Logically, he should be more afraid upon seeing them. It's the strangest experience of his life. And yet, he feels an odd sense of empty calm settle over him, like a warm blanket. His eyes close, and sleep takes him again. When the young man wakes up the next morning, something doesn't feel right. He's already dismissed the strange children with the animal masks and the dolls as a figment of his imagination, a half-waking dream. But what he can't dismiss is the numbness in his fingers and toes. It's like he'd spent all night sleeping in the cold outside, despite his room being perfectly warm. Perhaps he's coming down with something. Other strange things start to happen over the next few days. He makes himself a sandwich, and as he bites into it, he notices he can't taste a thing. Come to think of it, he really can't smell that much either. Could this be a cold? The flu? Something worse? Also, he just can't shake the feeling that he isn't alone in the house. It's as if he can feel a presence there with him. And not just one presence, but multiple. Could it have something to do with those strange dreams and hallucinations, the children in the masks? 
He suppresses the thoughts, not wanting to consider their implication. He can scarcely dare to ponder what's worse, that there really are strange little children in masks creeping around his home, making him sick, or that he's losing his mind, just like his mother. He puts it out of his mind, but every so often, when he happens to glance out of the window, he can't help but see little shapes moving in the distance. When he watches the TV or tries to listen to music to distract himself, he notices that he needs to turn up the volume more than he ever did before. His hearing is getting worse. Could this be some kind of sinus thing? It's the only rational explanation, but it can be hard to apply a rational explanation when what's happening is inherently irrational. Several days later, after getting out of bed in the morning and standing in front of the bathroom mirror, the young man notices something is different. It's his skin. It's a pale, almost creamy color now, like all the life and vitality has been leached out of it. But it's not just that. He looks closer at his face in the mirror. His eyes. Have they always looked like that? Were they always that shade of dark, murky brown? Maybe it's his addled mind, but he can swear something is different, like the ground is shifting underneath his feet. That's when he notices something in the corner of the mirror. A little boy with dark blue overalls and a grinning cat mask. He just stands there, watching. The young man turns, hoping to finally see one of these strange children up close. But of course, there's nothing there. Over the following days, it all gets worse. Two weeks since the funeral, and his senses of taste and smell haven't returned. His hearing gets worse by the day, until he's almost entirely deaf. The sightings of the children don't stop but they're harder to make out. Over time, his vision starts to blur, and no matter how hard he rubs his eyes, they never clear. He stubs his toe, cracking the toenail open from tip to base, and he doesn't even notice. Little by little, feeling itself is starting to leave him. He doesn't even notice until the day he decides to chop some carrots for a soup he's making, hoping in vain that this one might be the meal he can finally taste. But his vision is getting so blurry now, he can barely... The knife cuts into his palm. It takes him a second to even register, because there's no pain and no blood. He stares at the clean wound in his palm with detached fascination, trying to work out the shapes in front of him to make sense of it all. What are those thin white strands sticking out of the cut? He grabs the edge of the skin, though it doesn't look much like skin now, more like pale ragged fabric, and he peels it back. No blood, no sinew, no flesh. just puffy, white stuffing underneath. He's in bed, and has been for a few days now. He can't taste, smell, hear, feel, or even see. All he can do is think in the dark. He's confused and afraid. He wants his mother, but she's long gone. On the outside, he's shrinking away, drawing into himself. He can't move or talk as he gets smaller and smaller. They walk in through the walls, the children in masks, ready to receive their new toy. The young man is nothing more. All that's left is another rag doll with a pair of brown button eyes laying on the bed. A little boy in a rabbit mask steps forward and picks it up. He stares at it for a moment before the children leave and the house is empty once more. This is the kind of unpleasant, anomalous experience you can expect from a close encounter with SCP-747, aptly nicknamed Children and Dolls. SCP-747 specifically refers to the phenomenon of these strange, anomalous children wearing animal masks. Studies have shown that, masks aside, all of these children are identical to children who have proven to have died around the time that their anomalous counterparts first manifested. This leads us to the working theory that the SCP-747 instances are spectral manifestations of the children they once were, twisted somehow by the unifying force of SCP-747. This is a theory supported by several pieces of unsettling information. Agents from the SCP Foundation disguised as grief counselors conducted interviews with the bereaved parents of each of the deceased children, and through these heart-wrenching interviews, they were able to discover that each of the children who died had possessed a doll that they loved very dearly. So much so, that the dolls were each buried with them, because on some level, the thought of separating them from this last comfort of the mortal world was too painful for the parents to bear. Given the preoccupation with dolls exhibited by SCP-747 instances, the Foundation found these facts to be highly illuminating. The physicality of SCP-747 instances, or rather, the lack thereof, also points towards the theory of them being powerful spectral manifestations. They are able to phase through solid surfaces of up to 10 centimeters in thickness, and can sometimes have difficulty in holding solid objects due to their partially solid nature. They live mysterious and lonely lives on a plane of reality adjacent to our own, and they have never been seen to speak, 
though it's likely that they do have some form of communication with one another. Outside of individuals they're directly targeting, the SCP-747 children show little interest in other non-anomalous humans. They mainly seem to occupy themselves with their dolls and with each other. It is unknown to what extent the children are truly sentient, but they do appear to have some form of self-comprehension, manifesting in an awareness of the space they take up and their surroundings, which keeps them from bumping into things as they walk. But of course, their spectrality is hardly the most unsettling or eye-catching feature of SCP-747. No, the real danger of SCP-747 is the fact that they're able to turn human beings into dolls, a process which takes a matter of seconds to instill but 21 torturous days to finally take effect. In order to begin this process, the children will select a human that intrigues them, perhaps one that would fit in nicely with their collection. The Foundation isn't currently aware whether there are any fixed criteria for victim selection or if it's just a matter of wrong place at the wrong time. When the time is right and their selection is secure, they'll lock hands and form a ring around the human in question for five to seven seconds. This is all it takes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven seconds. And you're already at the point of no return. After completing this brief ritual, the children will go their separate ways, and the process will begin to take hold. This is why it's so imperative for the SCP Foundation to keep a lid on SCP-747's activities. While there's no cure for the process once the ritual is done, it is possible to prevent the ritual from being completed in the first place by escaping the circle and leaving the SCP-747 children. However, they have cognitohazardous measures against this, with many victims reporting a sense of blankness or thoughtlessness while within the circle. They induce a placid state of mind to prevent resistance from the horrible fate they're bestowing. The transformation doesn't incur any immediate symptoms. However, after 15 minutes or so, the victim will begin to experience numbness in the extremities, much like the kind caused by cold weather or poor blood circulation. Symptoms will gradually worsen over the next 21 days, though if the victim enters a state of chronic stress or anxiety, this process could potentially shorten to as little as 10 days. The conversion can often be neatly divided into three distinct stages. Stage 1 – Loss of Minor Senses The most frightening aspect of this initial stage of transformation is the fact that many of its symptoms could easily be written off as that of more common minor ailments. The senses of smell, taste, and hearing will begin to dampen and then disappear entirely, in what may at first seem like a severe cold. The victim may express a sense of distress at their condition at this stage, but will remain largely mentally stable. Any deviations from that expectation into more extreme mental instability should be taken as a sign of an accelerated transformation rate. However, towards the end of stage 1, a more pronounced change will start to take hold. The victim will notice a slow shift of their eye color and skin tone to reflect the colors of the doll, though this is only the beginning. Stage 2 – Loss of Major Senses over the next 13 days, the victims will begin to lose their senses of sight and touch, resulting in extreme mental instability and stress. The victims may attempt to perform gruesome experiments on themselves, trying to rediscover feelings in their body, only to become more unstable upon realizing that these senses are gone for good. At this stage, the frightening anomalous physical changes will become even more pronounced. The skin of the victim will take on a rough, ragged quality as it transforms from normal skin into a variety of fabrics. The internal organs are also slowly transformed into a patchwork of synthetic stuffings, and even the victim's eyes will start to harden into buttons. However, the victim will remain alive throughout this entire grim process, even as their autonomy over their own body rapidly fades away. Stage 3 – Full Transformation Within 24 hours of entering Stage 3, the victim is fully and irreparably turned into a doll. The SCP-747 children will treat this doll just like they treat any others, and if ever a doll created by the influence of SCP-747 is destroyed, they will show greater interest in humans once again until a new target for conversion is selected. The SCP Foundation currently has seven SCP-747 specimens in containment. SCP-747-01 is an approximately seven-year-old male wearing a set of blue pajamas and a zebra mask. SCP-747-02 is an approximately 12-year-old male wearing swimming trunks and a mouse mask. SCP-74703 is an approximately 10-year-old female wearing a uniform typical of an expensive private school and a pig mask. SCP-74704 is an approximately 14-year-old male wearing a winter coat and a rabbit mask. 
SCP-74705 is an approximately 12-year-old female wearing a striped sari and a giraffe mask. SCP-74706 is an approximately 5-year-old girl with a bright pink dress typical of a beauty pageant contestant and a goat mask. And finally, SCP-74707 is an approximately 9-year-old male wearing blue overalls and a cat mask. Interestingly, he was also found with a physical note, containing a short story about a mother searching for her child in the afterlife. Interestingly, the mother of this particular entity, before becoming an SCP-747 instance, is believed to have died in childbirth. All of the SCP-747 instances that the Foundation has in containment are kept in a single containment chamber, 30 meters by 10 meters in size, with concrete walls at least 15 centimeters thick to prevent the children from phasing through them. It is mandatory that any unusual behaviors by the children are reported to a superior immediately. If the children seem to take an interest in any members of the staff that research, guard, or attend to them, that member of personnel must be transferred to a different project immediately. The children are allowed a total of 25 dolls to keep them placated, excluding ones created by their anomalous influence, and the SCP Foundation only permits their dolls to be temporarily removed from the containment chamber for examination and repair. Any staff members who begin to show the previously described symptoms of anomalous SCP-747 influence are to be quarantined and contained separately. Task Force 747-B8 remains on call in the event of a containment breach to handle tracking, capture, and containment. Due to the incredibly volatile and dangerous nature of interfacing with SCP-747, Level 3 staff and above are only able to come into contact with them if the situation absolutely demands it. SCP-747 has been given the containment object class Euclid due to their phasing abilities and unpredictable nature. After all, who could ever really know what's going on behind those masks? But there's one more detail about SCP-747 that is perhaps the most frightening of all. There is evidence that suggests that the victims who have been turned into SCP-747 dolls may not actually be dead. In fact, they may still remain conscious, cut off from all their senses, slowly descending further into madness. It's an average day at Site 43 of the SCP Foundation, and a new researcher has arrived for her first day at the site. She fills out an intimidating stack of onboarding paperwork, takes a picture for her new ID badge, and meets her direct supervisor. There's something you should probably know about working at this site, he begins, but an alarm sounds down the hall, and he has to rush away to attend to it. We'll finish this later, don't move! He calls to her before he disappears from sight. Then she's left alone, twiddling her thumbs, shifting from foot to foot, and looking at her new workplace. It looks like any other Foundation site for the most part. One unusual thing does catch her eye, though. There are mirrors everywhere, all along the walls of the hallway, seemingly all the way down until the hallway bends out of sight. What could those possibly be for? As she runs through the possibilities in her head, she hears the squeaking wheels of a mop cart coming toward her. A janitor is making his way across the floor, mopping at the tiles as he goes. He has a pair of headphones covering his ears, and she thinks about interrupting him to ask about the mirrors, but doesn't want to disturb him. Then, she spots something just behind the janitor, reflected in the mirror, that makes her scream and drop her clipboard. There is a face, ashen and ghastly, like some horrible phantom out of a scary story. She spins around, expecting to see the horrible face lurking behind her, but there's nothing there. Whatever the thing is, it's just in the mirror. When her supervisor returns, he finds her pale and sweating, her hands shaking. She stumbles over her words, trying to tell him what she just saw. He laughs at her <laughs> wide-eyed expression and says, Oh, don't worry, that's just Philip and his constant companion. Then, he tells her all about SCP-5056. SCP-5056 is a hairless humanoid entity with gray matte skin and three slash-like scars on its face, resembling the placement of eyes and a mouth. It does not have a physical, corporeal form, at least on the visual spectrum, and can only be seen in reflective surfaces. It appears to prefer manifesting in glass, especially mirrors and lenses. Any equipment or media that captures the entity's image will begin to degrade on an atomic level. Though anyone can see SCP-5056 when it appears in a reflective surface, only one person is able to hear it speak. Philip E. Deering, also referred to as SCP-5056-B. Philip Deering is a white man with brown eyes and brown hair, standing at 172 centimeters tall. He joined the staff of SCP Foundation Site-43 as a custodian in July of 1999, and for his first three years of service, there was nothing notable about him. He was a pleasant man, though occasionally prone to bouts of depression, and was a reliable employee. 
In September of 2002, however, his behavior changed following a disastrous incident involving anomalous materials in Acroamatic Abatement Facility AAF-D. After this incident occurred, Philip began exhibiting signs of auditory hallucinations, reacting to sounds that no one else could hear. At first, this was thought to be the result of a mental health episode brought on by stress and trauma, but the discovery of SCP-5056 soon proved that the voice he was hearing was not, in fact, in his head. Since the first day it appeared to him, SCP-5056 has followed Philip everywhere he goes. It has not expressed interest in any other people or entities, except for situations where it felt that Philip was being threatened. It is aware of other entities, it simply does not care about them. As for its behavior toward Philip, SCP-5056 has historically behaved in a way opposite to Philip's emotional needs. When Philip is trying to sleep, it opens its mouth scar and screams. It picks verbal fights with him when he is overwhelmed or sad, including reminding him of estranged family members, awkward social interactions, and personal failings. He has gotten used to his companion over the years, even giving notes on its less-than-effective insults and encouraging creativity. He has even given the entity a nickname, Doug. SCP-5056 becomes enraged when separated from Philip, and if there is no available reflective surface upon which it can manifest and speak to him, it will begin to act out. After nine seconds have passed without SCP-5056 having access to Philip, it will begin to vibrate at an intense speed and emit an endless 119 decibel sound that reverberates through the entirety of Site-43. As soon as Philip is returned to 5056's line of sight, both the sound and the vibrating will immediately stop. Staff in the area have been made aware of the entity's presence and its aggressive tendencies. Following an incident involving Dr. Bradbury, who experienced immense psychological distress after SCP-5056 appeared in one of the lenses of her eyeglasses that led to her eventual resignation, no one wearing glasses or any other reflective eyewear is permitted to interact with Philip or SCP-5056. Because SCP-5056 has no physical body, it cannot be truly contained in a traditional sense. However, its location seems to be bound to Phillips, and therefore limiting Phillips' movements to Site-43 has provided the Foundation with a workable solution. Aside from the issue with Dr. Bradbury, there has only been one other notable incident involving SCP-5056 so far. On January 23, 2003, Dr. Falkirk decided to perform an experiment that would prove Philip was not necessary for the containment of SCP-5056. Philip was sent to an observation room and instructed to turn on recording equipment. In the room, there was a steel table, a steel chair, and a hand mirror. After Philip sat down in the room, SCP-5056 warned him to get out. He ignored it and proceeded to talk with Dr. Falkirk. Falkirk gave an order to initiate phase two of the experiment, and Philip began to have trouble breathing. After several seconds, he lost consciousness. Dr. Falker turned his and his assistant's attention to the mirror, where SCP-5056 was still present. It became enraged, yelling for Philip, and attacked Dr. Falker. Though the specific details of the attack are lost from official records, he was subsequently given medical treatment for blood loss, facial injuries, and the loss of his left eye. He has been under intensive psychological care ever since. Though no one but Philip is able to hear a word SCP-5056 says, any recording device that he activates will pick up the entity's voice. In order to give the research team a better sense of SCP-5056's behavior, Philip's uniform contains a microphone that is always on and always recording his conversations. It has, over the years, picked up everything that passes between Philip and the world around him, from his conversations with co-workers to the tiny torments and verbal barbs from SCP-5056. In 2020, however, the microphone recorded a series of events that would change Philip and his relationship to the anomaly in the mirror forever. Philip was struggling with a sense of crushing isolation, with the majority of his social interaction coming from Dr. Ngo and SCP-5056. The only bright spot in his days was the presence of Chief Amelia Terosian of the janitorial and maintenance section, who would often visit Philip to chat while he was mopping. They spoke regularly for months, joking with each other about work, Amelia asking questions about Philip's life with 5056, all while the entity needled Philip about his apparent crush on Amelia. On September 9, 2020, however, Amelia confessed something. She returned his feelings. The audio transcription from this day captured this revelation. I never really thought… I didn't think you… Philip began. Really? Really, Amelia retorted. Yeah, really. Well, I mean, I didn't think you… Either, she admitted. Philip laughed at this. Are you kidding? You've got to be kidding. I mean, you're... 
A moment of silence passed between the two, the air crackling with nervous excitement. How long, he began, she interrupted, since I met you. He laughed again, a giddy sound. You had that on speed dial. Well, how long, she started. This time, he interrupted, since I met you. They both laughed for a long time before falling silent once again. What are you thinking about? Amelia asked. Can't you tell? She shook her head. No? Confusing me with your anxiety surrogate? He hasn't said a word tonight. Philip smiled softly at this. I must not have any anxieties right now. The two quickly developed a romantic relationship, Philip brushing off the doubts that SCP-5056 tried to plant in his mind. On June 11, 2021, Dr. Ngo conducted Philip's annual psychological review, and they discussed the notable changes in his demeanor and worldview. The audio from the session has been transcribed. Thanks for letting me do this a day early, Philip began. Well, hey, I have a social engagement tomorrow, Dr. Ngo replied. Philip laughed heartily at that. You know, that might be the first time I've heard you laugh. Let's talk about that. SCP-5056 started to speak. Yes, let's talk about... But Philip cut it off. About how humorless and morose I am? The entity was stunned into silence. Dr. Ngo spoke up. Was he about to say that? Are you finishing his thoughts now? Why not? They used to be my thoughts. What changed? SCP-5056 spoke up again. Nothing. Philip disagreed. A lot of things. Some of them because of Doug. Some of them because of me. Some of them... Chief Tarosian. Dr. Nyo finished the thought for him. Yeah. I guess I didn't really care about improving myself until I had someone to improve for. Doug beat a lot of my flaws out of me. There just wasn't enough room in my head for self-pity or self-loathing or even selfishness with him nattering away in the background all day every day. But Amy gave me something to actually work toward. I actually... This time, 5056 finished his thought. You stopped wasting your life. Go on, Dr. Nyo encouraged. It feels strange to say, because this has been a terrible year all over, but it still meant so much to me. Dr. Nyo nodded. You achieved something. I achieved something, and I reached out. My life isn't one long, indifferently narrated one-man show anymore. Sure, I'm still stuck underground, but I'm not alone down here anymore. SCP-5056 spoke up, giving one final thought. You are never alone, Philip. You will never, ever be alone. Never again. What's he saying? Something spooky? Dr. Nyo asked. Philip shook his head. It's phrased that way, but that's not how I'm taking it. The next morning, Philip prepared to take a life-changing step. He stood in front of a mirror, dressed in a tuxedo, and adjusted his bow tie. How do I look, Doug? He asked. Because I can't see with you in the mirror. SCP-5056 replied, You're making a mistake. Philip laughed it off. Yeah, I've never been good at bow ties. I'd use a clip-on, but Amy would never forgive me, and anyway, you will clash with the tuxedo. SCP-5056 pushed further, refusing to let it go. You aren't ready for this. I definitely am. But hey, if you have objections, feel free to shout them out at the appropriate time. Nobody but me will hear you, but if you make good points, I'll be sure to pass them along. You won't hold up your end. I'd do anything for her. You don't have the energy. I've never felt this good. Are you even trying here, buddy? It won't change who you are. It already has. It won't fix you. <laughs> Philip laughed, pulling his bow tie tight. He turned away from the mirror and toward the next chapter of his life with one final statement. I don't need to be fixed. As long as she had known him, Amelia Tarosian had demonstrated kindness, care, empathy, and curiosity toward Philip. Unlike her colleagues, she was not put off by the presence of SCP-5056, but approached it with an open mind and an appreciation for the entirety of Philip's self, the man beyond the anomaly. The two were married in Ipperwash Provincial Park on June 12, 2021, and have been together ever since. Notably, Amelia has reported that SCP-5056 remains largely dormant in her presence, allowing the two to spend their time together without interruption. Following Philip's relationship with Amelia and the improvement to his mental state, as well as changes to SCP-5056's behavior, the Foundation conducted a review and reassessment of the anomaly. Several high-ranking Foundation staff wrote down their changing thoughts on SCP-5056 and contributed them to the official revised file. Amelia R. Tarosian, chief of the janitorial and maintenance section and wife of Philip Deering, wrote, I don't think anyone understood Doug when he first manifested. 
They all thought he was an anomalous abuser, a demon with a short fuse, existing just to get a rise out of someone. They tell me Phil was plenty risable back then, introverted and absent-minded, the perfect jump scare target. But once he stopped being jumpy, Doug started needling him about his low self-esteem. Once he started standing up for himself, Doug made him worry about other people's needs. By the time I met him in 2019, Phil was considerate, unflappable, and still absolutely miserable. That's when Doug started bugging him about his love life. I don't think Doug is preying on Phil. I think he's trying to help. Dr. Harold R. Blank, chair of the Archives and Revision section, contributed, For the longest time, we thought Phil might be anomalous as well. We even tossed around the idea of classing him Thaumiel, which obviously didn't fly. At the very least, we were pretty sure Doug was an unconscious manifestation of his internal monologue, so we labeled it 5056-A and made him 5056-B. After nearly two decades of observation, however, I can say with near certainty that there is nothing at all remarkable about Philip Eugene Deering beyond his unusual equanimity in the face of enduring trauma. He is no longer considered an SCP object, and his paranormal paramour has been reclassified as simply SCP-5056 a self-containing, incorporeal, emotional parasite requiring no containment because it voluntarily restricts itself to the presence of a man who voluntarily restricts himself to a secure underground bunker. We're still not sure what will happen when Phil dies, but my guess is 5056 gets one last class change to neutralized. Dr. Melissa Bradbury, chair of the research and experimentation section included, Now I can't tell you what I saw, but I can tell you what I felt. That's only after more than a decade of Foundation psychotherapy, mind you. I was comatose for 11 months and endured three years of blurry vision because I couldn't put on a pair of specs or contact lenses without having a panic attack. When that thing filled up my vision, it felt like someone had gut-punched my brain. You know that late-night experience where you suddenly remember some stupid or embarrassing thing you did in your life and it makes you feel ashamed? Well, imagine if you suddenly thought of every stupid or embarrassing thing you'd ever done, all at once, like your conscience finally got fed up and decided to go nuclear on you. No wonder Falkirk tore his eye out. Delfina M. Ibanez, chief of the Pursuit and Suppression section, had this to say. When Blank said we should let Deering keep playing janitor under his pet monster's watchful eye scars, I was skeptical. I was chief of security and containment, and that sounded like the polar opposite of both concepts. I'm happy to say I was wrong. Deering has absolutely nil combat utility, and without 5056, his disaster response priority would be somewhere just above the D-Class, and we don't even have D-Class at 43. But with 5056, He's practically an intruder deterrent system. You know what they say, a friend is someone who will help you move, a best friend is someone who will disintegrate your enemy's eyes. Dr. Noon T. Nyo, chair of the psychology and parapsychology section, wrote, SCP-5056 has co-opted JM-64's negative thought processes, externalizing his melancholy and self-doubt. His earliest psych evaluations suggested a proclivity towards intrusive anxious thoughts. Because these thoughts are now literally intrusive, he can assess them much more rationally than he could without anomalous intervention. We still don't know what 5056 is, but I can say this much. It is devoted to its opposite number and wants to help him. It expresses affection in a grating, alien manner, but there's no arguing with the results. It's taken 19 years, but Deering has finally made peace with himself. Of course, he's had a little extra help in that regard. Finally, Dr. Polixeni Metaxas, chair of the spectrometry and spectrometry section, said, They've called this a haunting for 19 years. It's even entered the general terminology. A Deering class haunting denotes the stalking of a corporeal being by an incorporeal one. Nobody really thinks of 5056 as a ghost, however. Nobody but me. The materials handling disaster which created Doug also annihilated at least two of our subjects in containment. The nature of those subjects is highly classified, but I can say this much. They are intimately connected to the cycles of guilt and apathy through which human society writ large regularly cycles. Is it too much of a stretch to suggest that one of them, or a fragment of one of them, was reconstituted in that thaumaturgical soup into Deering's inescapable conscience? If that's what happened, well, perhaps it still doesn't make him all that different from the rest of us. We're all haunted by something, and we're all haunting something ourselves. Our hopes and fears are just voices in our heads that only we can hear. Everything we are is just the hallucination of a hollow frame of meat and bone. So what separates us from the thing on the other side of the mirror? three dimensions, and room to grow. Since the reassessment, the containment measures for SCP-5056 have been updated. It is now considered to be self-containing, with its position fixed to that of Philip. Philip is prohibited from leaving SCP Foundation facilities without direction from security clearance level 4-plus personnel, and must carry at least one reflective object on his person at all times. 
Any new or visiting staff must be briefed by Philip on the nature of SCP-5056. He is also required to undergo mental health treatment, mainly exposure response prevention therapy, which allows him to respond to his intrusive thoughts without acting on them. Though SCP-5056 once terrified Philip, bringing him endless distress, he has grown accustomed to its presence. Even when the things 5056 tells him are upsetting, he considers them to be necessary reflections of his inner life, providing him with introspection he has never been capable of on his own. Since Philip's marriage, the entity has grown more and more passive, appearing only to bring up areas that need improvement in the relationship, reminding Philip of ways he can be a better husband to Amelia. Just as Philip has become more comfortable with the presence of SCP-5056, so too has the rest of the Foundation staff. Perhaps, even if they're not entirely aware of it, they recognize something of themselves in that dynamic. Don't we all live with demons of our own, constant companions whispering our insecurities back to us, reminding us of the ways in which we fall short? They may not be as anomalous as SCP-5056, but their hold on us can be just as powerful, just as destructive. The only way to contain them is to look them in the face, learn to talk back, and decide against all odds to go after what we want anyway. We may never be truly rid of them, never be completely alone and without that gray shadow lurking at our side. But that's okay. We can carry it with us, accepting that our fears, our hurts, our nagging anxieties are necessary parts of who we are. But we can also argue back against the voice that tells us we'll never be truly happy and say, yes, I will, because I deserve it. Eventually, we might just believe it enough for that voice to finally shut up. The boy screams as his body transforms. His bones warp and twist as feathers emerge from his pores and his skull sharpens into a long, hard beak. He's in a living nightmare. And who could have guessed it all started with an innocent attempt to play hooky? It's an ordinary Monday morning, and all over town, children are waking up and reluctantly dragging themselves out of bed for school. Some are oversleeping, hitting the snooze on their alarms, and getting a bit of extra shut-eye before their exhausted parents notice, wake them up, and rush to get them to school before the first morning bell. In one particular bedroom, a young boy is awake but still in bed, brainstorming as fast as he can. He is determined to skip school today however he can. He usually doesn't mind school very much, but today, all he can think about is the math test he didn't study for and the mean classmate who likes to knock his books out of his hands. But he can't just ask to skip school for no reason. He has to come up with a plan. He runs to the bathroom, splashing hot water in his face to give him a flushed appearance and a warm forehead. Then he hops back into bed and begins to loudly cough and sniffle until his mother comes to check on him. He complains that he doesn't feel well enough to go to school, and sure enough, when his mother feels his forehead, it is hot to the touch. She agrees to let him stay home from school for the day, provided he stays in bed and gets plenty of rest. He promises that he will, and she leaves to go to work. On her way to work, the boy's mother remembers that there isn't much for him to eat while he's home alone all day. At least, there isn't much that he would want to eat while he's sick. She decides that she can be a little bit late to work for the sake of her son's health and pulls into a nearby grocery store. She rushes out of her car and into the store, making a beeline for the soup aisle. She reaches for her usual go-to brand of chicken noodle soup, but finds the shelf completely bare. That's right, it's flu season. Of course, the soup is sold out. Oh great, this is exactly what she needs. A sick kid at home, one can of chicken noodle soup left at the store, and the machine won't even scan it. She smacks the side of the machine in frustration, and the screen reads, invalid code, transaction cancelled. With a heavy sigh, she glances over her shoulder. No one is watching. She tried to pay for the can to do the right thing, but the machine wouldn't let her. So she grabs the can and runs out of the store before anyone can spot her. While his mother is out, the boy is at home raiding the pantry for snacks to sate his not at all sick appetite. He fills up on Oreos and toaster pastries, cheesy crackers and chips. When he hears his mother's car pulling into the driveway, he quickly wipes the crumbs from his face and jumps back into bed, just in time for his mother to find him there, resting like he promised he would. She gives him a kiss on the forehead and tells him that she'll heat up some chicken noodle soup for him to eat. She's in a hurry to make it to work though, so she'll need to leave it in the microwave for him. She pours the contents of the soup into a bowl, adds a bit of water, and pops the bowl into the microwave for a few minutes. She calls up to her son, letting him know that the soup will be ready when the microwave dings. Then she rushes out the door and heads to work for the day, confident that her son will be fine through her shift. 
if he happens to meet anything, he can call her and let her know. The boy hears the microwave ding, but his stomach is too full from his rummage through the pantry for him to want any of the soup, in spite of its heavenly aroma. Instead, he creeps into the living room and sits down to play video games until his eyes start to hurt. As he boots up his gaming system, he thinks for a moment that he can hear a strange noise coming from the kitchen, a soft, clucking sound, like the chickens he saw on his grandparents' farm. But he quickly forgets about the sound as the screen lights up, and he disappears into the world of his favorite game. He plays for hours, until the grumbling of his stomach interrupts his concentration. He's suddenly very hungry, and remembers the soup his mother left in the microwave. It is certainly cold and unappealing by now, but he can just reheat it first. He punches the buttons on the microwave and waits for the soup to be ready. Again, he can hear strange noises coming from the microwave, but he doesn't think anything of it. The microwave dings, and he pulls out the bowl of soup, grabs a spoon, and digs in. A little while later, the boy's mother pulls into the driveway in a panic. She left work early when her phone rang with a call from her son. She answered, asking what was wrong, but he wouldn't answer her. All she could hear on the other end was rustling, heavy breathing, and some pain grunting. Fearing the worst, she drove back as fast as she could, running several red lights along the way. Now she fumbles with her keys as she unlocks the door, terrified of what she will find. She grips her phone in her other hand, thumb hovering over the buttons, ready to dial 911 if the situation calls for it. She pushes the front door open, calling her son's name. He doesn't answer, and her stomach drops. Suddenly, she hears the loud thud of something heavy being knocked to the ground. Something is terribly wrong here, and even though she might find her worst nightmare, she has to face whatever is waiting for her inside. She runs into the kitchen and finds it a mess. The bowl of soup is shattered on the floor, congealed, cold soup pooling on the tile. The kitchen table is turned over on its side. The kitchen chairs are in disarray. But the strangest sight is the dozens of tiny, white, fluffy things on the floor, counters, and furniture. She picks one up for a closer look and finds herself even more confused than before. It's a feather. They're all feathers. She calls her son's name again, praying for a response. This time, she receives one, though not the one she hopes for. She hears the sound of shuffling footsteps up above, followed by a strangled sound like a scream caught in someone's throat. She sprints up the stairs as fast as her legs can carry her, throwing open the door to her son's bedroom. There, she finds him. But this is not the bright-eyed boy that she left behind when she left for work. His arms are covered with a thick layer of white feathers, the same feathers that are beginning to poke through the skin of his face. The top of his head has elongated into a floppy comb of excess skin, the same sort of excess skin that is wobbling below his chin. And his mouth, it doesn't look like a mouth anymore. It's pointed and hard, and his lips click together when he speaks, or rather, clucks. His bare feet are scaly and red, with claws protruding from his toes. He flaps his wings frantically, eyes wide and wild, clucking and running back and forth across the room. When he looks at her, she does not see recognition in his gaze. Her son, her beloved boy, has turned into a chicken. Unable to do anything else, the mother calls an ambulance. At first, the paramedics that arrive on the scene think the call was some sort of elaborate prank, but when they set eyes on the boy, they agree that something truly bizarre is going on. They speed to the hospital with the chicken boy in tow, but sadly are unable to save his life. The mother turns over the can of the mysterious soup to the authorities, who launch a formal investigation. Unfortunately, they are unable to trace the can to any store, nor are they able to verify the existence of the company name on its label. Employees of the grocery store where she found the can insist that they have never seen it in their lives. Several weeks after this incident occurred, the SCP Foundation conducted a raid on a New York office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. For those of you unfamiliar with the organization, and that is most of the general population by design, Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD is an extremely powerful multinational corporation founded by three individuals with those surnames, specializing in the acquisition and sale of anomalous items, entities, and experiences. To put it simply, they run the largest anomalous black market in the world and are the crime bosses of the paranormal world. During this particular raid, SCP Foundation operatives recovered 17 different unusual items. Among the items discovered was a shipping crate recently delivered by the Federal Postal Service from an invalid return address. This crate contained 103 cans of SCP-2057, as well as a copy of a letter 
written to one of the company's associates. So far, the letter has not been traced to an address. It reads, Dear Cyrus, Maria has told me of the unfortunate circumstances that have befallen your children. I had hoped to hear about the improvement of their condition soon. As their godfather, I am extremely distressed to hear this. Having experienced a child suffering from the measles myself, I know how terrifying it can be when it seems as if they are getting worse. Recently, we received a shipment of something that I hope can help your family. There is a crate in the storage area marked with Wondertainment Discontinued Item. It will not be there long, as it goes to auction next week. I will leave a key under the photo of your family on your desk. Follow the instructions exactly. Do not, under any circumstances, do anything different than what is directed on the can. Destroy this message as soon as possible. I do not want any of this to come back on us. Be careful, my friend. Williams. SCP-2057 consists of 92 318 milliliter can fied or measured in the analyzed soup samples. The ingredients are listed as ultralicious chicken stock, enriched Chinese egg noodles, finest cooked chicken breast, farm fresh carrots, crispy crunchy celery, sweet Vidalia onions, no paint thinner, fresh mountain spring water, vitamin W. Contains less than 2% of the following ingredients. A pinch of salt, a smidgen of chicken fat, sprinkle of spice extracted from rare plants, a dash of high-quality unicorn tears. The instructions for heating read, Hey kids, feeling sick, icky, or downright yucky? Just pop open a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Place contents of the can in a medium-sized soup pot. Add a can of water, stir, and heat. Watch as the fun begins. Eat hearty, and you'll feel better and ready to play with Dr. Wondertainment toys in no time. All of this is relatively straightforward, give or take a few unusual ingredients. Someone taking only a quick look might mistake a can of this soup for any other chicken noodle soup. However, it does have something that most ordinary canned soup does not, a warning label. Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids is intended to be eaten while it is hot to make you feel better in no time at all. Do not consume after it has become cold. Do not reheat. By purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment, you agree to not hold Dr. Wondertainment or any of Dr. Wondertainment's affiliates accountable for injuries or damages incurred by your product. Thank you for purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment. So what exactly is in a can of Dr. Wondertainment's ultralicious chicken noodle soup for kids? Well, when the SCP Foundation first opened a can to take a look, they found that it was filled with condensed chicken broth and a mass of egg noodles shaped like an egg. When water was added and the contents of the can were heated to a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, the noodle-based egg hatched. Inside was a small domesticated chicken made up of egg noodles, carrot, celery, onion, and cooked chicken breast. For simplicity's sake, this chicken noodle soup chicken is referred to as SCP-2057-1. As the Foundation researchers continued to heat the broth to a higher temperature, SCP-2057-1 began to move around, make audible chirping sounds, and eat the broth. As it ate, it grew larger and larger until it reached a mass of 85 grams and resembled a miniature adult chicken. At a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, SCP-2057-1 behaved much like an ordinary chicken. It continued to behave normally even as it was consumed or cut apart, apparently feeling no pain or awareness of its situation. Dissection of SCP-2057-1 revealed that its insides were made up of soup ingredients, including celery and onion bones, cooked chicken breast muscles, carrot beak and legs, and chicken broth blood. When SCP-2057-1's temperature dropped below 35 degrees Celsius, it stopped moving and collapsed into the soup. At a temperature below 20 degrees Celsius, it became congealed and unappetizing. With these observations completed, the Foundation then attempted to measure the effects of this unusual chicken soup on a person that ingested it. When test subjects were fed samples of the soup at a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, they had a very positive experience. The soup's taste was described as excellent, delicious, and homey. Though the meal caused a bit of psychological distress due to the soup chicken's realistic appearance and behavior, it improved every test subject's physical well-being. This eventually applied to test subjects with a case of influenza, measles, or the common cold. Following consumption of SCP-2057, each subject with a diagnosed illness of this kind reported immediate relief from their symptoms, including fever, aches and pains, cough, and congestion. With this positive, if a bit disturbing, effect documented, 
the Foundation next set out to determine what would happen if they let the soup get cold before it was eaten. Test subjects served this version of the soup had a far worse experience, describing the taste of their meal as bland, disgusting, and repulsive. 67% of the test subjects experienced cramps, chills, and diarrhea following their consumption of the soup, and 62% found themselves making involuntary clucking noises, as well as experiencing a strong aversion to poultry products. Again, several test subjects were deliberately selected based on their cases of influenza, measles, and the common cold. These test subjects immediately began to develop troubling symptoms, including the growth of pin feathers on their forearms, loosened excess skin on their heads and under their chins, a change in their ability to walk normally, and distressing hallucinations of being hung upside down by the ankles. Following these two rounds of testing, the research team decided to see why exactly the warning label advised against reheating the soup. D-Class 45782 was selected as the test subject for this particular experiment and was instructed to reheat a bowl of cooled SCP-2057-1 in a microwave on high for 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Then, he was to consume the reheated soup and report his experience to a camera placed in the room with him. As instructed, D-45782 microwaved the bowl of soup. As it heated in the microwave, it emitted unintelligible vocalizations in a deep voice. After removing the bowl from the microwave, D-45782 noted that it was gelatinous-looking, with blackened burnt bits around the edges. He took three bites of the disgusting, hot and cold at the same time mixture before spitting it out onto the floor and refusing to eat another bite. Fifteen minutes after tasting the reheated soup, D-45872 began to exhibit significant distress, plucking angrily into the camera. Five minutes later, D-45872 became more difficult to understand clucks and other chicken-like vocalizations, making up most of his attempted speech. He began scratching vigorously at his arms to the point of drawing blood. Loose skin could be seen gathering on the top of his head and under his neck. Six minutes later, D-45872 had lost the ability to speak. Large white pin feathers had sprouted from his arms, covering the skin, and smaller white feathers were beginning to sprout from his face. After 16 more minutes passed, D-45872 began attacking other objects in the room, attempting to destroy the microwave, knocking the bowl of soup to the floor, and flipping over a table and chair. He had grown feathers over 67% of his skin, and his face had begun to change drastically. His nasal area was elongated and hardened, joining with his lower jaw in an appendage resembling a bird's beak. His upper lip had disappeared into his nasal cavity. Only five minutes later, D-45872 suddenly stopped moving and collapsed to the floor, dead. Following D-45872's death, an autopsy was performed. These were the findings. Autopsy revealed D-45782's cause of death was due to extreme and sudden physical change of internal organs, resulting in shock and cardiac arrest. 93% of the subject's skin was covered in feathers. Physical changes in the face resulted in a beak-like alteration of the nose and mouth, Loose skin under the neck and on the top of the head resemble a waddle and comb. Subjects' lower legs were found to be covered in thick, scaly skin, with the toes of the subject's feet ending in small, rounded claws. The subject and instance of SCP-2057-1 were incinerated after testing and autopsy. Whenever not being used for approved experimentation, all cans of SCP-2057 must be stored in a standard, large-volume storage locker in Containment Area 27 and kept at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Because SCP-2057 is in limited supply, all experiments must first be approved by at least two personnel with 2-1103 clearance, as well as receiving the go-ahead from Dr. Applegate. There are still 41 cans of Dr. Wondertainment's chicken soup unaccounted for, and the Foundation has been unable to track them down so far. Who knows where they ended up? Maybe at another office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. Or maybe, just maybe, one made its way onto the shelves at your local grocery store. Best to be careful out there. When you're feeling sick, hungry, or in need of a little pick-me-up, there's nothing quite like a steaming hot bowl of chicken noodle soup. Just make sure to read the label carefully and always follow the printed instructions. If you ignore them, you might just find that your chickens have come home to roost. After all, as the saying goes, you are what you eat. And the lights go out on Maple Street as a young woman takes stock of her marriage and the man she once thought she knew. She sits at the kitchen counter, absently stirring a cup of tea that went cold hours ago, but she just can't bring herself to stand and heat it back up. 
She glances at the baby monitor sitting next to her, grabs it, and holds it to her ear. Steady, peaceful breathing. The baby is fine. No one needs a thing from her right now. She stares at the seat across from her, where her husband sits every morning, sharing coffee and breakfast before they start the day. She glances at the clock. 8 p.m. He'll be home soon. She'll have to face him, have to find a way to look him in the eye, force a smile. Pretend she doesn't know that he's getting home two hours late from who knows where. The thought turns her stomach. It wasn't always like this. Their marriage wasn't always a tense charade, their home a haunted house. He was sweet that first year. He'd buy her flowers and take her out to dinner. He'd kiss her in the morning before they'd even brush their teeth. He wouldn't come home smelling like his secretary's perfume. But ever since the baby, something's been different. The light behind his eyes has gone dim. He won't help with late night feedings, won't change diapers. Most of the time, he acts as if the baby doesn't exist. His own son. He just comes home, stares vacantly at the TV, and expects her to handle everything without so much as a single complaint. She hasn't slept in weeks. She hasn't been down to her art studio in the basement in months. Then, a sound shakes her from her thoughts. She hears the unmistakable rumble of a car pulling into the driveway and fixes a stiff smile on her face. Maybe she'll leave him. Maybe tonight she'll work up the courage to say those words that will change everything. I want a divorce. The baby barely has a father now. What difference would it really make? The woman's husband stumbles through the door, lipstick on his collar and the smell of whiskey on his breath. He greets her with a kiss on the cheek, more out of obligation than anything else, and grabs himself a can of soda from the fridge. She offers him some stew from the stovetop. He brushes her off, saying, I already ate. She doesn't bother asking when or how, when he supposedly came straight home from work. There's no point. She knows he'll only lie. Do you want to say goodnight to the baby? She asks. It's a test, as she watches his face for any flicker of fatherly affection. Isn't it asleep by now? It. He calls their son, It. He's sleeping, but you could still go up and see him, if you're quiet. I had a long day. I'm tired. I'll see you in the morning. She can't help herself. Him. What was that? Him. He's not a thing. He's our child. He sets the can on the coffee table with a heavy clatter. Do you have to nitpick every word that comes out of my mouth? She deflates at the outburst. No. He sighs, shaking his head. Don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. She averts her eyes, looking down. Fine. I'll go up and check on him. You enjoy your relaxation time. That's it. Tonight is the night. She's going to pack a bag tonight. She'll leave and start a new life, just her and her son. He won't even miss them when they're gone. It'll be better for everyone this way. She'll just go upstairs, check the baby, wait for him to fall asleep. Then she'll just cut and run. It's not like he deserves a proper goodbye from her. She can go away, go to her sister's place. As she fantasizes about leaving him, spending peaceful days in a little country house with her son and maybe a dog, she finds that the baby has spit up all over his pajamas. She scoops him up into her arms to make sure everything is okay otherwise, and he's fine, just a mess. As she holds him, he stirs awake and begins to cry. Oh, sweetheart, oh, I need to change you and give you a bath. Shh, sh it's okay, you're all right. What's wrong? Her husband's voice comes from the doorway, startling her. It doesn't concern you. She can't help herself. Her resentment creeps into her voice. He just needs a bath. What, you think I can't bathe my own son? He scoffs. That's it? Well, you haven't done it yet. So, when she turns to look at her husband, there are tears in his eyes. I'll do it now. Something in his voice is so sincere, she falters in her determination for a moment. Maybe he'll really try. Maybe things will go back to how they used to be. And she really, really needs a rest. So she hands the baby over to him and sits down in the soft chair in the corner of the nursery. Before too long, the exhaustion overcomes her and she nods off. In her sleep, she can't see her husband leaving the bathroom to go downstairs and catch the last 20 minutes of the Dodgers game, leaving the baby alone in the tub. When she stirs awake, the crib is still empty. She can hear the water running and she knows. She just knows what has happened. What she let happen, no what he did. A glance into the bathroom confirms her suspicions, and with a primal scream of pain, rage, and heartbreak, she tears down the stairs to confront the murderer himself. She finds him asleep on the couch and takes a moment to catch her breath, to wipe the tears from her eyes. 
did he do it by accident or on purpose to punish her, to free himself from their marriage once and for all, to break her heart beyond repair? It doesn't matter in the end. What's done is done, whether he meant it or not. But what can she do? What could ever make this right? She wants to scream, to set the house on fire, to tear him to shreds. Then she spots it. The baseball bat leaned against the wall by the door in case of an intruder. She picks it up, feeling the weight of the wood in her hands, the heft of it. Swung hard enough with real intent behind it, it could really do some damage. Slowly, thoughtfully, she walks back toward the couch, raises the bat, and swings. It only takes one good hit to get the job done, but she swings the bat a few more times anyway as something inside of her bends and bends and breaks. Until the tears stop falling, until her vision comes back and everything stops looking like a wash of red. He doesn't even scream, never wakes from his stupor to see the look on his wife's face when she gets her revenge. He's just gone. She wipes the red from her eyes and lets the bloody bat drop to the floor. She started the day as a wife, as a mother, but now she's ending it as a killer. He deserved it, she tells herself. He took her baby from her, so she got him back. But why doesn't she feel any relief? Why does she still feel the gnawing grief in the pit of her stomach, feel the darkness clawing at her heart? First things first, she needs to get him out of the living room, out of sight of prying eyes and nosy neighbors. She could try to bury him, but where? The yard isn't exactly private and she's not sure how much she could even dig up before sunrise. No, that won't do. Then the idea hits her, and she grabs him by the arms and begins dragging the lifeless body of the man she once loved toward the basement stairs. He's heavy, much heavier than she expected, but she supposed they called it dead weight for a reason. She grunts and struggles as she drags him down the stairs, wincing as his head bumps against the steps, before reminding herself he's not using it anymore. She surprises herself with a laugh, a dry sound echoing in the empty basement. She drags him past the last chair, and he lands on the floor with a thud in the room that she converted into her home art studio when they first bought the house, back when things were still good. Her eyes dart about the room, the half-finished paintings, the wood carvings she abandoned when she got pregnant, the paints and long dried out lumps of clay, the potter's wheel in the corner. Her eyes settle on a metal frame, large and twisted into a vaguely human shape. She had crafted it years ago intending to cover it with concrete and paint it, but never got around to it. No, she had been forced to put it away. Her husband hadn't liked it, had thought it was creepy and odd, and didn't want her working with such heavy materials. Just another thing he took from her, another dream he destroyed. It's just about his size, now that she takes a look at it with him lying limply on the ground so close by. With a little bit of muscle, some determination, he would fit right inside and there are the tubs of cement, still sealed tight and ready to mix, just as she left them. She could shove him into the frame, paint him with layer on layer of cement, and it would be like he had disappeared in the night. A fitting coffin for the man, she thought. The perfect place to hide him, too. No one would ever know. No bones to dig up in the garden out back, no smell of rot seeping out from beneath the floorboard. She smiled to herself, just a little bit. In death, her husband would help her finish her greatest work. She didn't consider herself a wife or a mother, not anymore, but she was still an artist, and he would be her art. As she mixes the cement, she hums a little song to herself, beginning to feel something like peace. Everything is ruined, her life as she knew it completely turned upside down, but she is here in the art studio, creating again. Not a waste of time now, is it? She remarks to her husband's body. He doesn't answer. Typical. Why get an art degree, you said? Well, it prepared me for this, didn't it? I wonder what I'll do with you when you're done. Maybe I'll keep you down here. That seems like a waste. Maybe I'll get you displayed in a gallery. Let people buy tickets to take a look at you. You'll be my masterpiece. You'd hate that, wouldn't you? Me, thriving, creating. All without you there to make snide comments and treat me like dirt. As she waits for the concrete to become usable, she turns her attention back to the metal frame. Time to put her ex-husband in his place. She lifts him and begins to wedge his body into the metal structure. He's heavy, getting heavier all the time, and left a trail of blood behind on the floor that she would have to clean up and bleach later, but after several sweaty minutes, he is in place. He looks correct to her, sitting there in the frame, ready to become something new, something different, 
something better than he ever was in life. The concrete is ready, and she begins to smooth it over the body and metal frame, flesh and blood, and sweat and grit, layer upon layer upon layer. Mix, smooth, wait, mix, smooth, wait. All the while she talks to him, weeps bitter tears into the concrete. At one point, she pricks her finger, her blood dripping into the mixture and becoming part of the sculpture. For days she carries on this way, not breaking to eat, bathe, or sleep. After three days pass, she runs out of concrete, but the sculpture is not finished. She'll need to go out and get more. She takes a shower, washing away the dust, the blood, and the guilt, changes into fresh, clean clothes, and takes a drive into town. She picks up more concrete first, telling the clerk some story about home improvements she's working on. He asks if she's married, if her husband will be helping with the work. I'm recently separated, she replies. On the way home, a small store catches her eye. It's a place she's driven by plenty of times, a little occult shop filled with herbs and tapered candles and strange leather-bound books. She isn't sure if she believes in this sort of thing, not really, but something makes her park and walk inside anyway. A gnarled old woman behind the counter spots her, and without speaking, points her toward a room in the back. It's different there, darker, filled with vials of thick, dark liquid, shelves full of skulls that might be human, though she isn't sure. In the back of the room, there is a bottle of paint, deep red and vibrant. What it's doing here, she couldn't be certain. But as soon as she sets eyes on it, she knows she needs to have it, needs to add it to her sculpture to make it truly complete. She brings it to the woman at the counter, but she just says, Take it, no charge. I can tell you really need it. Just be careful what you use it for. It's powerful stuff. She wants to ask what that means, what's so powerful about this little bottle of strange red paint but she doesn't. She's much too exhausted and much too determined to get back home and put the finishing touches on her masterpiece. She drives straight home and hauls the concrete and paint inside, carrying it down into the basement. She's dizzy from hunger and lack of sleep, but she doesn't care. She has one singular vision right now, and she must see it carried out. She mixes more concrete and slathers the whole shape again, sculpting out the round, bulbous head, the arms at its sides, the legs and feet the curve of the whole figure covered in thick gray sludge, in potential, a blank canvas. Before it dries, she opens the paint. It smells musty, rich, and somehow ancient. It clings to the bristles of her brush like a living thing and takes to the surface of the sculpture eagerly, spreading out as if of its own volition as she brushes it on evenly. She paints the whole thing, every inch of it. At first, it doesn't seem as if there will be enough paint to finish the job. But somehow, that little bottle coats the whole figure in deep, dark red. She looks down at her hands, stained just as brightly as they were when she swung that baseball bat. She looks back up at her creation, the amalgamation of the fear, the pain, the heartbreak, the pure, primal rage, and begins to cry. The tears fall freely into her palms, and without thinking, she smears them into the concrete and paint until they disappear into the art. Then, she takes a step back, watching it all dry. All of that work, all of that time, that great yawning chasm of loss. And this is what she has made of it. She loves it, and she hates it all at once. And she can't stop staring at the place where its eyes would be if it had them. She half expects to see something looking back. She shakes her head, looking down at the floor for a moment. Then, she hears the sound of stone and metal grinding together. Her gaze snaps back up and she sees that the sculpture has moved just a little, its head turned in her direction. In an instant, her husband's words come back to her, Don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. It couldn't be. She stares at it for a long time, her eyes watering from the effort. She blinks. Her eyes open, and the sculpture is gone. There it is again, the grind of metal and stone against each other. Then, with the sound of bones snapping, everything went dark. Her hate, her vengeance, her desperate act of violence and creation, with a splash of the most unusual paint, led to the creation of a deadly masterpiece that would one day be known as SCP-173. There are no streetlights on this stretch of the old, narrow road which runs through a rural part of West Virginia. A car has gone off the road into a ditch and needs to be pulled out. A common task for this tow truck driver, and he's often in the area doing similar jobs, though he's never been on this particular road, 
and he has to keep his eyes peeled for any signs or other markers that might give him an idea of how close he is to his turn. He spots something up ahead, but as he gets closer, he sees that it isn't a road sign, it's a billboard. As he passes by, he can make out the weathered lettering advertising a diner 20 miles down the road that's probably been closed for at least as many years. As he continues driving, he sees more dilapidated billboards, advertising other long-since shuttered businesses like gas stations and auto body shops. But then he sees one on the road ahead of him that's nothing like the others. This one doesn't look old at all, in fact it looks quite new. He drives by and has to question if he saw it correctly. It seemed like all it said was, get away over and over, and then the name of a road. Is that an invitation or a warning? It wasn't even clear what kind of business it might be advertising. He continues driving, but he can't quit thinking about that strange sign. He even feels compelled to turn around so he can get another look at it. But there's no need, because as he rounds a curve, there's another of the same sign. This time he slows down as he passes to get a better look, and he was right. It just says, get away multiple times with the name of a road. Wagriwa Road. Must be Native American or something. Now he really can't get the billboard out of his mind. What does it mean? What is it advertising? And why is there a third one of them just ahead of him? He pulls his truck to the side of the road, stopping with his headlights illuminating the sign. He gets out of the truck and stands in front of the billboard. It's just the same as the others. Get away, written over and over. Wagriwa Road. He can see now that the background of the sign is a picture of some trees on a gray, cloudy winter day. He also notices for the first time that there's another line at the bottom. Find what you are looking for. What does it mean? Find what you're looking for on Wagriwa Road? Where even is that? There's no directions, no address, no phone number. He takes a step back from the sign and looks up and down the darkened road. What is he doing out here on the side of the road? Someone is stranded in a ditch waiting for him and he's staring at a billboard? He gets back into the truck, puts it in gear, and drives away. As he continues down the tree-lined rural road, though, he inevitably finds his thoughts turning back to the signs. Get away. But find what you're looking for? Doesn't make any sense. Or are you supposed to get away to Wagriwa Road? Who would put these up? And why do they look so new? Everything else out here looks like it's for a business that shut down years ago. What are they trying to- <gasps> He suddenly slams on his brakes and comes to a screeching stop in the middle of the road. His eyes are locked on what's in front of him. His headlights aren't lighting up another billboard, though. This time, it is a worn road sign. Wagriwa Road. He can't help it. He has to know what's down this road. He has to know what these signs are about. The stuck driver can wait a few minutes longer. He turns his truck onto the narrow gravel road and drives for a few hundred yards, following it around a couple of bends as it winds through the trees until it abruptly ends. There's nothing out here. No buildings, no signs just what looks to be a dirt path leading deeper into the woods. The tow truck driver switches off the ignition, and the road is plunged into darkness. He reaches under his seat and takes out a flashlight before getting out of the truck. He shines the light into the woods surrounding him, but there's nothing to see. No, wait. There is something, and it's coming down the path out of the trees. Phil? Phil, is that you? The figure that stepped out of the woods is talking to him. He shines his flashlight at them, and they raise a hand to shade their eyes from the light. Sharon, what are you doing out here? It's Sharon, the tow truck driver's ex-wife. But he thought she'd move to Colorado after she remarried. Why would she be here? And what was she doing emerging from the woods? Phil, come here. I need to show you something. Huh? He hesitates for just a moment, but then finds that he's walking towards his ex-wife. Before he can reach her, she turns around and starts walking down the path back into the woods, and he follows. He walks just behind her, his flashlight illuminating the path in front of them. He thinks he hears a rustling coming from the woods next to him and searches the trees with his flashlight, but doesn't see anything. Come on, it's just a little further, she says. Where are we going? What's just a little further? What you're looking for. The woods suddenly open up, and he finds that they are standing in a clearing. She stops walking, and he pauses next to her. He opens his mouth to speak, but she quickly shushes him. Quiet, they're almost here. The tow truck driver looks around, but he doesn't see anything just the faint outline of trees that are barely visible on this moonless night. But then he watches as several creatures begin to emerge out of the woods into the clearing. They're… deer? He watches as just a few come towards him at first, but then he notices that they have completely surrounded him. There must be over twenty. Turn off your light, she tells him. He obeys, and in the darkness he can see now that there is something special about these deer. Their eyes are glowing with a pale white light. 
one of the smaller deer steps forward and cautiously approaches him. He squats down and holds his hand out, showing it that he means it no harm. The deer looks back nervously at a larger one that he thinks must be its mother. It looks like it nods in approval, and the smaller deer moves closer. He can clearly see its big, beautiful doe eyes glow brightly in the dark. You're okay, he says, and leans forward to give it a reassuring pet when... Following the mysterious disappearances of multiple people in an area of West Virginia near the town of Harper's Ferry, the SCP Foundation soon became interested in a particular stretch of road where it appeared that many of those who had gone missing had traveled just prior to their vanishing. Agents were dispatched to the area and immediately detected high levels of thaumaturgic energy, with the epicenter appearing to be on a plot of privately owned land. Investigation of local records revealed that the land was owned by a man named Richard Redkin. The Foundation staff contacted Mr. Redkin under the guise of being federal agents investigating a crime that had been committed on the property while he was away. Mr. Redkin happily cooperated with the agents, explaining to them that he had never experienced any abnormal events on the property while he was living there, but that he had not resided on the land for some time. Strangely, he claimed to not know the road as Wagriwa Road, insisting that as far as he knew it had never had an official name, being nothing more than a long driveway out to his property. When asked if he could remember anything else abnormal about the location, he told the agents no, but that his daughter had written many fictional stories about strange happenings on the land, and perhaps those had somehow turned into rumors and then urban legends, though that was a long time ago. When the agents requested to meet with the daughter, he explained that it was impossible. She had drowned many years prior in the nearby Shenandoah River. The agents again examined the local records and found that Mr. Redkin wasn't lying. His daughter really had passed away, and her body was found in the river. The timing of this accident was quite coincidental though, as it had occurred exactly one week before the first missing person in the area was reported. Quickly realizing that something was not quite right with this piece of land, the SCP Foundation authorized the purchase from Mr. Redkin, who was more than happy to sell, and a research outpost was constructed to further investigate the anomalous events which had collectively been dubbed SCP-4434. While exploring the surrounding area, they soon found what so many others had before. The bizarre billboards, imploring one to both get away as well as come to Wagriwa Road to find what you are looking for. The signs, which were designated as SCP-4434-A, were found on roads across the West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia tri-state area, but their locations would often change, with the billboards only manifesting for short amounts of time before vanishing and reappearing elsewhere. Bizarrely, when attempts were made to photograph or videotape the signs, the resulting footage would show only a blank white sign. The Foundation knew that they needed to investigate further, and several experiments were authorized to find just what was happening on the land at the end of the mysterious road. A D-Class personnel, D-84021, was given a radio and implanted with GPS locators in his neck, torso, and thigh, and sent down the road with orders to report back on what they experienced, though unlike the people who had gone missing, he was not shown the billboard prior to entering the area. The D-Class walked to the end of the road, where he reported that a creature was emerging from a path leading into the woods. He soon exclaimed that the creature was a dog that he used to own. The researchers monitoring the test were confused since the dog had apparently been deceased for some time, and yet, here it was standing in front of him. Although the D-Class had seemed hesitant at the start of the mission, once he saw his childhood dog, all of his fears were set aside, and he willingly followed it deeper into the forest. After 90 seconds, the D-Class reported that he had entered a clearing and was being surrounded by a group of deer. The report stopped soon after and were replaced by the sound of screams as D-84021 was attacked and apparently consumed by the deer. Two of the three GPS trackers remained active for the next 40 minutes, and SCP researchers followed their path as they moved to the middle of the clearing and then appeared to enter a sinkhole or cave of some sort, where they traveled slowly in a winding pattern downward until contact was lost. Following this test, the Foundation researchers suspected that the creature that would emerge from the woods, which had been designated as SCP-4434-B, was able to change forms into one that would be trusted by those who entered the 4434 area. The deer, on the other hand, seemed to always maintain their appearance, and the whole group was designated as SCP-4434-C. The tests were far from over, though. For the next, two D-classes were sent into SCP-4434 in order to see what form 4434-B would take when more than one person was present. Just like before, an entity emerged from the woods, but this time, it took the form of a young man in a suit, who immediately offered to clear any and all debts the D-classes held, as well as expunging their criminal records, freeing them from their life as test subjects. 
All they would need do is follow him into the woods. The agents monitoring the test ordered the D-classes not to follow the man, but they were ignored, and the researchers listened as they instead began conversing with SCP-4434-B, seeming to be quite interested in his offer. They soon followed him into the woods, and just over two minutes later, they too were attacked and consumed by SCP-4434-C. It appeared now that once someone entered the SCP-4434 area, they were all but helpless to resist the compulsive effects of SCP-4434-B. The Foundation researchers wanted to test the limits of SCP-4434's power, and so they then came up with a rather creative procedure for the next test. Another D-Class personnel was sent down the road, but this one was wearing a body harness that was connected to a pulley system, as well as being equipped with a camera. He was ordered to wait at the edge of the SCP-4434 area until the 4434-B entity appeared. The entity soon emerged, taking the form of a middle-aged woman. As soon as the D-Class was seen conversing with the entity and agreed to follow it, the pulley was engaged in order to forcibly pull him out of the area. This was followed by an entirely unexpected event. The middle-aged woman quickly produced a knife and with a supernatural speed, severed the rope on the pulley system. The now free D-Class stood up, followed the woman into the woods, and was consumed soon after. The researchers were growing frustrated with their lack of advancement in understanding the anomaly, and so for the fourth test, they decided to take quite extreme measures. A drone was used to fly over the area, which identified the mouth of the cave that the GPS trackers had been taken into. It was a three and a half meter wide hole in the ground, too dark to see anything past the entrance, and the drone installed an anchor point in the ground at the mouth of the hole before flying in to explore further. But the signal was almost immediately lost. Progress had been made, though. Yet another D-Class was selected, this time one who had climbing experience. D-84041 was warned in advance that the SCP-4434-B entity would appear to her and would have a compulsive effect, and that she was to ignore them no matter what form they took and instead proceed as quickly as possible to the cave, which had been designated as SCP-4434-D. D-84041 was taken to the road, and she immediately began running down the path into the woods. She was able to reach the mouth of the cave without seeing any anomalous entities, neither 4434-B nor the carnivorous deer. She quickly attached the rope she had brought to the anchor that was installed by the drone and began rappelling into the hole. As she descended down, she described the normal, rocky cave one that grew wetter the further down she went. Surprisingly, she soon reached the bottom, where she found a spherical room, roughly eight meters across. But this was not anything like the entrance to the cave. The floor of this room wasn't made of rock or dirt. It was more like flesh, and it appeared to be breathing. And there was something else down there too, a folded piece of paper with writing on it. The D-Class was ordered to pick up the paper, take a sample of the cave floor, and exit the area as soon as possible, as there was no way to predict if the SCP-4434-B and C entities, or something worse, would soon appear. After taking a sample, she began climbing out of the cave. When she emerged, there were still no signs of any anomalous creatures, but she quickly made her way down the road and out of the SCP-4434 area. When she reached the waiting agents at the edge of the area, D-84041 handed them the sample and the paper that she found but then stopped and turned around. There on the ground roughly five meters away was a plate of food. Without any hesitation, she walked back into the SCP-4434 area, picked up the plate, and walked back into the woods. She was never seen again. It was now clear that 4434-B could take forms other than just humanoids and animals. As the objects that the D-Class had managed to get out of SCP-4434 were analyzed, the area's former owner, Richard Redkin, was again questioned by Foundation agents. They asked him if there was anything he failed to mention in their previous interview, and he told them that there was one thing that he preferred not to normally discuss. Just before his daughter's death, in addition to her fascination with writing and coming up with stories, she had become obsessed with the occult. When they asked him about the paper they had found within SCP-4434-D, he told them that it was very likely that she had written it. The SCP Foundation now understood why they had detected so many thaumaturgic particles in the area which is the residual energy left over from a particular form of ritualistic practice that is more commonly known as magic or witchcraft. The contents of the paper found in the cave seem to add additional weight to the theory that his daughter may have been involved in a ritual that led to the creation of SCP-4434, because written on the single page is a poem which reads, The forest is a sea, the wind is the waves, and the water is the leaves. The streams become undercurrents, the birds become fish and coral finds its home as fungus, growth sprouting as I wish. 
The ground is the shore, pulling me by the feet, dragging me down and pulling me back, back and forth on repeat. I dove down past the light, down where I couldn't breathe, and found nature looking for a fight. Yes, the forest is a sea, but I've made it barely big enough for me. The forest is a sea, so now something's bound to come eat. Things only became more mysterious, though, when Foundation researchers performed a DNA test on the sample taken from the bottom of the SCP-4434-D cave. What they found was that it was, just as D84041 had described, a flush-like substance, and that it was a 78.9% match to Melanocetus johnsoni, better known as the deep-sea anglerfish. And there was one final discovery to be made as well. Linguistic teams within the Foundation investigated the name of the road that had appeared on the SCP-4434-A billboards, and discovered that the word was very similar to the Native American Tutelo tribe word Wagriwa, which roughly translates to the phrase, I have come back. Introducing Tamagotchi. Are your parents super lame and refusing to buy you a pet? Well, eat my shorts, mom and dad. With the all-new Tamagotchi, you can have the best pet you could ever ask for living in the Digisphere in your pocket. With three simple buttons and a chain to hang your key rings on, you can make your Tamagotchi your own. Care for it day and night, watch them sleep, play bodacious games, and make sure you keep an eye out for if they need to go to the toilet. P.U. Throw it in your backpack and take it to school. Just don't let your teacher catch you. Oh, snap! Tamagotchis are da bomb! Bet you really want to go and buy one now, don't you? The detective throws her bag onto the couch. She wanted nothing more than to have thrown it off as soon as she walked through the door, but if anything in it broke, she'd be screwed. They don't have the money for rent at the moment, can't be adding additional costs onto that. Her boyfriend barely glances up at her from the couch, still wearing the same blue t-shirt he'd worn to bed last night and with a packet of Doritos next to him. It's pretty obvious how he spent his day. The TV switches to another commercial. She taps him gently on the shoulder, offering him a warm smile. He jumps a little, seeming to come out of a little reverie. Affection fills his eyes as soon as he sets them on her. He hastily brushes Doritos dust off his hands and holds them up, tapping out words in sign language. Sorry, I zoned out. How was your day? The detective sinks into her usual spot on the couch and snuggles up next to him, nuzzling her head into his neck. After a quick hug, she untangles her hands and signs her reply. Long. He kisses her on her forehead. She goes on to tell him all about the case she's been working on. It's more of a hunch at this point than a case, really. There's been a big spree of shopliftings, burglaries, and muggings over the last couple of months. A significant uptick from this time last year, but everyone is at a loss to figure out why. She's having to spend a lot more on gas driving around to break-ins at the moment. Her boyfriend watches her hands recount the events with a tender look of concern on his face. Don't worry, she signs. I'll make sure they reimburse me for the gas. He nods and seems to relax a little. She hesitates before signing the next bit. Did you do any job applications today? Her boyfriend sighs and shakes his head. He looks ready to be told off, but instead she gives him a big cuddle. Something in him seems to break, and after a moment she can feel him shaking in her arms. Even though she can't hear him, the detective knows her boyfriend well enough to know that he is crying. She pulls away from him and makes firm reassuring eye contact with him before signing. It's okay. We can do the next one together if that would be easier. And so the two of them do that. They cook dinner together, her boyfriend listening to the radio while she enjoys the feeling of the bass in her chest. Then, once everything is washed up and the apartment is dark and cozy, they sit down at their kitchen table and hand write a cover letter. They would have typed it up on their Macintosh, but they'd sold that and their printer a few months ago to cover their utility bills. But handwriting is okay too. Her boyfriend had been working at Dell when they met, 1993, the height of the dot-com boom, when any kid with a math degree and a keyboard could shoot up the ladders in tech giants across the country. Two years later, that bubble burst, and he'd lost his job. Fiercely smart and incredibly kind, her boyfriend hadn't been able to find work for around 13 months now. Every day, the detective's heart broke a little more to see how low his confidence was dipping. He was an amazing person, by far the most exceptional guy she'd ever met and ever would meet and yet the constant rejection letters, failed interviews, and lack of options had steadily worn him down to a delicate and exhausted ghost of himself. But that only makes her want to love and support him even more. He scrawls a signature at the bottom of the cover letter, and they carefully fold it along with his resume and slide them both into an envelope. 
She cuddles him from behind and gives him a gross wet kiss on his cheek, enough to make him giggle. There, at least he's got one happy moment from today. He turns to her and grins, raising his hands to talk to her. I might buy a Tamagotchi. A what? The commercial on TV, it was playing when you got home. I really want one. Can I buy one? A little twinge pulls at her heart. She really ought to say no. Money is so tight at the moment with them both relying on her income. And it's hard to... Nah, what is she saying? He's clearly going through a lot right now, and maybe something fun would be good for him. Even if it does just look like some silly kid's toy from Japan. She raises her hands. Of course you can. And the pair of them go back over to the TV and flick it on. The next day is a bit of a blur. It's the detective's first day on yet another shoplifting, her first foray into fashion. Pairs of Air Jordans on display had been stolen, smashed glass everywhere. The thieves had left all the cash in the register. A couple other items were missing too, all very hip stuff. Tie-dye shirts, Janko jeans, a lot of camouflage, that kind of thing. Stuff that's on TV and the radio all the time at the moment. By the time the detective gets out, She's only got 10 minutes to rush to Toys R Us before it closes. Thankfully, the Tamagotchi display is right by the front entrance. Almost totally sold out, but with one lone box left, she snatches it up and cheerfully takes it to the cash register. As she walks out of the store and looks down at the box in her hands, she can't help but wonder, why the hell would her boyfriend want to play with a little children's toy? As soon as the detective opens the door to her apartment, she is struck by a change. Instead of sitting on the couch watching TV, her boyfriend is in the kitchen, radio belting out at full volume. Her heart flutters. Could it be? Has he heard back from one of his jobs? He sticks a head out from around the kitchen door and grins at her, beckoning her inside. She grins back, quickly hiding the Toys R Us bag behind her back. It smells amazing in here. Onions and garlic, oregano, rich tomatoes, a hint of wine in the sauce. He's really gone all out making her favorite chili for dinner tonight. He waves her over to the pan and motions for her to take a deep smell. She does enjoying all of the aromas filling the air. There's something smoky in there too, a new smell she doesn't recognize. She turns to her boyfriend quizzically. He grins and explains to her in sign language that it's charred peppers, held over the flames on the hob just long enough to blacken and then thrown into the food processor to... Hang on, she interrupts him. We don't have a food processor. Her boyfriend grins proudly and steps to one side to reveal a brand new shining food processor sitting proudly on their countertop. He explains to her that he bought it that day. It has 10 speed settings, multiple blades you can switch out, a miniature container for spice blends, and she stops him again. How much did this cost? He looks sheepish. A wave of realization crosses his eyes, and he looks back at it guiltily. I just really wanted it, he signs. Thought it would make a nice romantic dinner for us. The detective softens. Of course, he was just trying to make the effort for her. It wasn't fair of her to tell him off for doing that. Opening the Toys R Us bag, she pulls out the Tamagotchi and holds it out to him. Compared to this expensive food processor, her gift looks pretty insignificant, but her boyfriend's face lights up straight away. He grabs it off her and rips the toy out of the packaging in a frenzy. His eyes shine and dance around as he hatches his first Tamagotchi. He looks like a child on Christmas Day. She can't help but join in laughing with him as they go to sit on the couch and watch some TV together. But the next day, when the detective gets home, she notices a hole in their wall a literal hole. Their landline is missing. Her boyfriend's face pops out from around the corner, just as it did the previous day, with that same grin. Only this time, he's brandishing a brand new cell phone in his outstretched arm. It's tiny, about the size of a brick, with the name Nokia emblazoned across the top. That can't have been cheap. This time, she doesn't share in his excitement. Indeed, the next day, she can't even muster up a smile when he proudly demonstrates the alarm on his new G-Shock, laced up his new Jordans, and started excitedly flipping through his box set of R.L. Stein books. That is enough. She can't deal with this anymore. She's been struggling so hard to make ends meet. Meanwhile, he's throwing away hundreds of dollars on products he had never mentioned before. She snaps. It can be very frustrating being mute, because you can't shout to let your anger out. All that energy instead goes into her sign language, her hands swinging and slapping into each other as her face contorts. What's wrong with him? Why is he being like this? She's doing everything she can to keep a roof over their heads, while he's just throwing all of her money down the drain. How could he be so cruel? The more she rants, the more guilty her boyfriend's face becomes. Tears fill his eyes, his bottom lip starts to tremble, and before long, he's bawling in front of her. Can't keep going, not seeing him like this. Her hands fall limply to her sides. After a moment, he raises a sniffling face to her and signs something simple back. 
It's the TV. The commercials, they're just too persuasive. She snorts a laugh. And that's it. If he's not going to give her a serious answer, she's not going to have a serious conversation. She storms off up to bed, leaving him alone downstairs. He switches the TV off. That next day, she wakes up to breakfast in bed, but no sign of her boyfriend. She doesn't touch any of it, getting a coffee and croissant on her way into work instead from this up-and-coming coffee place called Starbucks. Today is a chance for her to take her mind off things. She's at a crime scene in a poor neighborhood. The previous night, the man who lived there had been sitting downstairs with his blinds open out to the street. He'd noticed a suspicious figure walking past who'd peered in through the glass. Before he knew what was happening, a brick crashed through his window and the burglar was in his home, running from room to room, ransacking the place and trying to make off with different items from the house. The homeowner had run to his gun safe and shot the burglar in the back four times. The crime scene investigation was mostly a formality, but as the detective arrived, one of the officers came over to her. He didn't know sign language, so the pair of them wrote down their conversation on her detective's notepad. Yes, she carries a notepad, some stereotypes are true. The officer has a hunch, and a good one. The burglar broke into the house knowing full well the homeowner was watching him, a highly risky thing to do. But what was most peculiar was the list of items that the burglar had been trying to steal. The officer shows her the list, and her jaw drops. G-Shock watch, food processor, Nike Air Jordans, R.L. Stein books, a Tamagotchi. An officer across the room remarks that these are all really high-demand items at the moment. His own wife and kids have been pleading for some of these for weeks. The crime scene photographer agrees. It all gets written on the notepad so that the detective can follow the conversation. What was this man's employment status, she asks. Unemployed. She looks around the room. There's not much in the way of furniture here, just a couch pointing at a big TV. The detective drives home right away, to the surprise of her boyfriend. He gets up from the couch and comes to see her right away. He's dressed much better, a white shirt on. He's tidied the house. The TV is off. He goes to start apologizing as soon as she walks in, but she brushes it aside, signing urgently to him. I need you to tell me everything about what you've been watching on TV. Confused, he runs through his list of regular shows that he's been watching. Buffy, Quantum Leap, The Fresh Prince, Friends, of course. She shushes him. What about commercials? All the things you've bought recently, talk to me about those commercials. He looks stumped. They're just normal TV commercials, nothing special or exciting. They're all different, different actors, messages, companies. It clicks in the detective's head. That's it. What about the voiceover? I don't know, it's a man, I think. Yeah, it might be the same man. You know what, I think it is. It's the same voice each time. And he only does those commercials? Her boyfriend thinks hard for a second. He nods. It takes a long time for the police to mobilize, as usual. The detective takes her findings to the commissioner at her first opportunity, but he looks pretty nonplussed. This spate of burglaries and muggings, all because of some persuasive voiceover actor, really? Everyone wants a Tamagotchi, everyone wants a pair of Jordans. These are just passing fads, that's all there is to it. So, she does it herself. The detective visits all of the advertising agencies that ran the local versions of the commercials she has listed, and finds the details for the voice actor on her third try. He's in the same state, but another city. But by the time she gets an afternoon to drive out and pay him a visit, it's too late. The apartment she visits is empty. After banging on the door for several minutes, a neighbor sticks their head out of a window and yells something at her. The detective can't understand, however, so the woman comes downstairs and writes a grumpy note. He's dead, yacht accident or something. Only she can't spell yacht properly. The detective pushes open her apartment door dejectedly. All that effort, all that chasing, for nothing. It wasn't so much about trying to solve the burglaries. Those were just things being taken. It was about understanding what had happened to the love of her life. Her kind, caring boyfriend. The man who'd brought her so much joy. Who had always been so considerate and gentle with her. Suddenly going on a spending spree and almost bankrupting her. It just hurt too much. And now, coming back to her apartment and having to face up to that tense relationship just felt... Arms wrap around her and hold her tight. Her boyfriend's hand brushes the back of her hair, and the smell of his cologne fills her nose. After a moment, her arms wrap around him. After another moment, they both start to cry together. He leads her into the kitchen, where he's cooked her favorite chili again, only without the smoky smell. She looks around the kitchen. The food processor is gone. He pulls away from her and explains that everything is gone. All of his bad purchases he'd made have been returned. He hands her the cash for them in full. He still wants those items, he wants them more than anything else, he explains. But more than any of those things, he wants her. 
the TV is gone too. So as they sit down that evening together, they just enjoy doing nothing together for a bit, catching each other's eyes over dinner and smiling uncontrollably before getting out a sheet of paper and writing another job application. There's something about this application, the detective thinks. This one could just be the one. Ask anyone about the 90s, and they'll have more fads to tell you about than historical events. Furbies, Beanie Babies, Gel Pens, Napster, the list goes on. But for residents in a certain part of the USA, some of these trends seem to touch more… obsessive. And that is all down to the actions, or rather, the voice, of one man. SCP-661, the world's best salesman. We didn't get to meet SCP-661 today, so allow me to introduce him to you. The salesman is a middle-aged Caucasian male. He is somewhat overweight, but with no major health issues aside from what is typical for someone of his age and size. If you were to have a conversation with SCP-661, and I advise you not to, you would find him rude, abrasive, and tiresome. He has a short temper and makes regular demands. You would quickly find that he is very much used to having his own way, and for good reason. For you see, this salesman is persuasive. Very persuasive. Foundation testing has found that this SCP is capable of extreme manipulation, verbally persuading you to want what he tells you to want, virtually instantaneously. It sounds dramatic in those words, but the effect is far more subtle than you may realize, which is the reason why he was able to operate for a while before being discovered by the Foundation. Test subjects report the effects of his persuasion as feeling like a continuous, low-level compulsion, a desire bubbling away underneath the surface until they encounter an opportunity to act on it. At this point, it becomes an all-consuming obsession, not satiated until you have fulfilled the urge. The effect is strongest with physical objects, which is likely why this salesman enjoyed so much success providing voiceovers for local marketing campaigns. Any product that he was selling would fly off the shelves anywhere where the commercial featuring his voice were aired. Perhaps those crazes in the 90s weren't so innocent after all. Testing on the salesman has proved enlightening. D-Class personnel were ordered to physically assault him, but he was able to stop the attack almost immediately by simply explaining to them that they didn't want to hurt him. However, test subjects who were threatened with execution if they stopped attacking him were able to continue to beat the salesman up for several minutes before the researchers decided he'd had enough. Though notably, they made it abundantly clear the entire way through the assault that they didn't really want to hurt him. SCP-661 naturally poses some level of threat to the general public, as his abilities could easily be used for far more nefarious purposes than selling a few more troll dolls, and so guards have permission to terminate him in the event of his escape. That seems… unlikely. SCP-661 is held in a standard holding cell measuring 6 meters by 8 meters. Any researchers interacting with him must wear noise-canceling ear protection at all times, unless they are deemed to be totally deaf by SCP medical staff. Incidentally, it was the work of the detective you heard about today that drew the Foundation's attention to SCP-661. Unaffected by his commercial work, she was in the perfect position to connect the dots and uncover his existence. With operatives through law enforcement, the Foundation was quick to catch on to her theory and apprehend him before word traveled too far. That yacht accident story was enough to keep the public from ever discovering his existence. That said, you should still be careful out there. Who knows if another instance of this SCP exists somewhere? Have you ever seen a commercial too tempting to ignore? Watched a YouTube ad that you decided not to skip? No? Me neither. But still, be careful. The rain patters incessantly against the hiker's hood, the sound that has been accompanying her for the last four hours of walking through the Blue Ridge Mountains. Just that noise and the squelch of her shoes as they tread their way up the gravel path. It doesn't help that it's now almost pitch black. Come to Blue Ridge. You'll love it here. We can go out together. Yeah, right. Her friend had bailed on her at the last minute, taking half of their equipment with her so the hiker had to buy herself a whole new tent and sleeping bag that morning. Now, as she trudges her way up yet another trail in the pouring rain, she seriously wonders if it was worth the trip out to Virginia. She is so absorbed by the rain and the darkness that she fails to see the man walking towards her until the last second. He isn't coming along the path, not at all. Instead, he is marching straight up the ridge on her right, making a beeline for her. He is dressed in ragged waterproof clothes that catch and tear on the bushes as he pushes his way through them. He closes the gap to her startlingly fast, so quickly in fact, that she has to jump back out of his way to stop him from walking right into her. She catches her heel on a rock and loses her balance, landing squarely on her tailbone. A dull ache shoots up her torso, enough to wind her. 
but as she gasps for air, the man just walks right on past. He crosses the path and strides up the embankment to the left, disappearing into the woods without so much as a glance back at her. By the time she's got the air in her lungs to call out at him indignantly, he's long gone. Her breath doesn't fully come back, though. Some part of her feels rattled. As she gets up, feeling that familiar squelch in her boots, and continues along the trail, she can't quite settle her lungs into their normal pattern. She walks another mile or so, but the anxiety doesn't go away. That settles it. She won't camp on her own tonight. There's a hostel just up the ridge that she can go to. It might be quiet because of the weather, but there will at least be some company there. The last thing she wants is to be a woman camping alone with a strange man marching around the woods like that. Safety in numbers. And numbers there are. As she approaches the hostel, she spots a small gang of tents surrounding it. There's a little canopy outside with an open fire underneath. Rain-bedraggled campers huddle around the flames like a group of waterlogged moths. Their brightly colored raincoats are draped heavily over their shoulders, lit up eerily by the orange glow. The nearest guy, in a blue coat, waves her over and explains that the hostel is already full. Apparently hikers have been flocking to the building all day to escape the rain. Some of them are too exhausted and wet to say a word, just heading straight inside and sitting in a bunk. They are packed in there like sardines, apparently. Definitely a fire hazard. The smell in there, he explains, is unbelievable. She's probably dodged a bullet being late and having to camp outside. A girl from the group gets up and shows the hiker to a good spot, raised slightly above the puddles that threaten to turn the grass into a swamp. The hiker thanks her and starts to set up her new tent. It goes terribly. She's never set up one like it before. Whoever designed it had clearly never gone camping in the rain. The inner has to go up first before she puts the outer rain cover over it, so right away, her room for the night has been drenched in rainwater. Perfect. She throws her bag inside and hurries back over to the fire, eager to get out of the rain for a bit. There's quite a crowd gathered around the fire. They mostly just sit in silence, only a handful of campers keeping the conversation going. Many of the strangers don't say a word at all, just sit there staring into the flames. The hiker does the same for the longest time, just enjoying the feeling of having her hood down, some warmth at her wrinkled fingertips, and a bit of human company around her. After what feels like an hour, the guy in the blue coat asks if anyone wants to hear a ghost story. Immediately, four different people start yelling at him to stop being such a cliché. They're grown adults. Surely they can have a normal conversation around a campfire at night without having to reach for such low-hanging fruit. They can't. A woman starts things off. She talks about a boy from her school who'd gone missing up in these mountains years ago. On the night of his junior prom, he'd skidded off the road and down a ravine. No one ever found the body. Then, as if by magic, he'd appeared at his girlfriend's house on the following year's prom night, dressed in the same clothes he'd gone missing in. But when her parents came to wake her up in the morning, he had mysteriously vanished. No one finds it particularly scary. Someone else jumps in with a story of his own. Similar theme, really. A cousin had a friend who knew someone who owned a kayak that he'd capsized on some rapids. Ten years later, he turned up at a campsite in the middle of the night, and so on and so on. Safe to say, none of the ghost stories are any good. The hiker stops listening, staring into the flames and letting her mind drift. She can't help but let her mind drift back to the man from earlier. The hiker shudders involuntarily. One of the campers around the fire asks if she's okay. She tells them it's just the rain. That man. Something had been seriously wrong with him. Dressed in tattered waterproof clothes, walking in such a straight line, totally ignoring her. Not just ignoring her, but nearly walking through her. Should she tell someone? Maybe he's still somewhere out there. Maybe he's sick. She should say something. The hiker sits herself up straight and looks around the circle. She's just opening her mouth to speak when she freezes. There he is. The man, sitting two places to her left. How had she missed him? Rain drips from his hood and runs down his sleeves. He isn't looking at her. He isn't looking at anything. Just staring straight ahead at something beyond the fire. Is everything okay? The guy in the blue coat asks, noticing the hiker's discomfort. She gathers herself and tells him everything is fine, but the interruption is enough to kill the conversation. An uneasy atmosphere settles over the campfire. No one knows quite what to say. The only sounds are the crackle of the campfire and her breathing. She can hear it speeding up again, her lungs falling out of rhythm, out of sync with her body, in sync with her growing panic. Is he following her? It's too much. The hiker excuses herself and gets up from the fire. She walks in the direction of her tent, but with every step, she finds her lungs falling further out of rhythm. Breathe in, breathe out. Simple as that. One breath in, one breath out. In through the nose, 
out through the mouth. Is he behind her? Is he? She wheels around. No. No, he is still sitting with the crowd staring into the fire, just like the lady next to him and the young kid next to her. In fact, half of the people sitting around the fire don't seem to be moving at all. In fact, none of those people looking into the fire have said a word all evening. Not a laugh, not a smile, nothing. And come to think of it, there must be 11 of them sitting around that fire, but there are only five tents set up out here. A figure emerges out of the darkness so suddenly it makes her jump. He can't be more than a few feet away from her, but in the darkness, she would never have guessed he was there. This new stranger walks straight past her, over to the fire, and takes her empty spot. No introductions, no asking if that space was taken. He just sits down. Quietly as she can, the hiker walks back over to the group, careful to hang back just out of the flickering glow of the fire. She watches as the newcomer takes the exact same pose as the others sitting around the fire, blank expression, staring straight ahead. The guy in the blue coat welcomes the new guest. No response. He puts an arm around the stranger. Nothing. He asks if he's okay. Had a long day? Silence. The concern seems to register on the guy's face, and indeed on the faces of the others sitting around the fire. Or rather, on half of the faces of those sitting around the fire. The other half just carries on staring into the flames. The faces. There's something strange about their faces. Their skin it isn't just rain-soaked and cold, it looks slightly bloated, sallow, like a thin layer of plastic wrapped too tightly around a piece of meat that had been forgotten about. All of a sudden, the guy in the blue coat stands up sharply. I'm going to bed, he announces in a slightly choked voice. I... Then he runs, scrambling away from the fireside and out into the rain. The hiker catches up to him and grabs his arm. He wheels around and stares at her with wild eyes, looking her up and down, then pulls away, heading for the door to the hostel. From behind her, the hiker hears the others from around the fire all getting up to leave too, and this time it really is everyone. Even the strangers with their bloated skin, everyone is getting up. She turns back to Bluecoat and implores him to let her come and stay in the hostel for the night. She doesn't feel safe out here anymore. He just shakes his head at her, mouthing noiselessly. His eyes lock with something over her shoulder. She spins around to see the stranger, the newest one to join them at the fire. He's right behind her, inches from her face. The smell hits her. It isn't overwhelming, but it is there, sure enough. The smell of rotting meat, barely making it to her nostrils as if it was seeping through the gaps of a closed dumpster. The stranger does not look at her, though. He raises a lazy arm and pushes her out of the way, eyes fixed on the door to the hostel. Bluecoat drops all pretense and starts running for the door. He reaches it, dives inside, and slams the door hard behind him. The stranger continues to walk to the door, all the way to the doorstep, then stops. Another of the strangers joins him. Then the stranger with the tattered waterproofs. Then the others. Seven figures standing by the doorway, not knocking, shouting, or doing anything at all. Just waiting patiently, as if at any moment someone will come and let them in. The hiker stands motionless. She holds her breath. Maybe they've forgotten that she's here. She glances around back over to the fire. The others seem lost as to what to do. All of them are right on the verge of running, only there's nothing to run from. The strangers aren't doing anything. They aren't even looking at them. Just waiting by the door to the hostel. The hiker, still holding her breath, creeps over to the group. Three girls, including herself, and two guys. They all exchange silent looks of fear with one another. Maybe they're overreacting. Maybe these strangers don't speak English. Maybe they're just exhausted from the wet weather and acting strangely because they've become a little delirious. Maybe it's all just one big prank. Maybe, maybe, maybe. For a long time, they stand like that, the five of them huddling near to the fire, the strangers waiting by the door to the hostel. No one speaking, no one moving. The fire sputters and shrinks the longer they stand there. The strangers remain totally still. Creepy? Yes. But nothing bad has happened. No one is being attacked. No one's in danger. Maybe they are overreacting after all. Tiredness sets in. It must be 2 a.m., maybe 3. Would it be crazy to just go to bed? Those strangers, odd as they are, are not actually doing anything. And it's so dark and so cold. Maybe if they just get into their tents and go to bed, everyone would be gone by the morning. So that's what they do. Agreeing with their plan in hushed whispers, the hiker volunteers to go last. The others all get their things and disappear into their tents as she stands to watch. None of the seven strangers by the door move. They just wait there patiently, expressionless, slightly bloated, waiting to be let inside. Finally, it is her time to go to bed. Quickly as she can, she unzips the door and ducks inside. The zip is loud, much louder than she expected. 
stupid new tent, so loud that as she closes it behind herself, she sees the stranger in the tattered coat turning to look at her through the closing gap. Then nothing. She's on her own. Finally. She's holding her breath again, and through what she thought were impenetrable canvas walls comes a sound, just audible over the pattering rain. Footsteps. A shadow falls over the tent. The zipper slowly drags its way open. The rainy wind blows in, carrying with it the stench of rotten meat as the stranger crouches down and crawls into the tent. There isn't space in there for the both of them. He crawls virtually onto her lap, his face inches from hers, looking right at her, but not seeing her at all. Now she is breathing hard and fast, shallow breaths that rack her lungs and send her whole body into convulsions and heave that horrible smell into her nose. More footsteps. The whole tent lurches to the side as another one of the strangers crawls in, stretching the canvas out to the left. He puts a heavy clammy palm directly onto her arm, absently pinning her down. Once he's in, just like the other stranger, he just stops and waits. The third one forces his way into the tent. The hiker is now lying flat on her back, half pinned down. There's nowhere left for her to go. There is physically no space left in the tent. There's no air to breathe, nothing but these strangers. Footsteps surround her, yelps from the other tents, zips opening, poles bending, then silence. Nothing but the patter of rain as the five campers lie there closed in by these seven strangers. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, rotten meat, breathe out. The hiker lies there totally still as panic attack after panic attack racks her body as the strangers in her tent do nothing. Time warps out of shape. She has no idea how long it has been, but every so often, a new set of footsteps will march themselves purposefully up to the entrance of her tent, and a new shadow will join those encircling her. How many are there now? She can count them by the light of the fire. Nine? Twelve? The counting gets easier. Somehow the fire is growing steadily brighter, brighter and brighter, until she can feel the warmth of it even from here. But no, it's too bright, too warm. That can't just be from that fire. Besides, no one out there is feeding it. Then the screaming starts. Just a few muffled yells at first, rising to blood-curdling shrieks within seconds. Within a minute, the sound of a roof collapsing. Sparks land on the tent and sear little holes into the material. The hostile. It's burning. The hiker wants nothing more than to break out of the tent and run to help, but the strangers surround her, doing nothing, just pinning her down, motionless, stinking. She blinks. They're gone. The pressure on her arm isn't there anymore. The shadows on the fabric are gone. Just the light from the fire remains. That and the smell still wafting in the air. The hiker gasps for air and receives a lungful of smoke. She throws herself forward and out of the opening in her tent. It is too late. The hostel burns fiercely, just as the morning sun crests over the horizon and the last droplets of rain fall at her feet. That morning, the hiker found herself standing right in the middle of SCP-1102. You see, this particular anomaly is not a creature at all, as you might have expected, but rather a region. Within the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia, USA, is a geographical area known for a disarming but ultimately harmless supernatural occurrence. Well, mostly harmless. Only occurring at night and during periods of rain or snow, a seemingly random area within the Blue Ridge Mountains will undergo a strange event. All of the corpses within that region will seemingly come back to life. This is no simple reanimation, however. The original bodies do not suddenly rise out of the ground. Instead, exact copies of those bodies appear. While these copies are close enough to the original person to fool observers from a distance, they fail to be all that convincing upon closer inspection. The skin is the biggest giveaway, looking somewhat deteriorated and different in color from the original person. The most obvious difference, however, is the behavior. Corpses created during an SCP-1102 phenomenon lack full brain function. While studies have found flickers of activity occurring between the neurons, it is nowhere near enough to sustain intelligent thought. These bodies find themselves driven by one simple and very human desire. They want company. Any corpses, human or otherwise, will seek the nearest crowd of their own species and gather with them. Beyond this drive, little is known about their motivations. Once with the group, they do not feed, reproduce, seek dominance, or even offer any social interaction. They just return to their nearest point of civilization, simply to be there. Until all of a sudden, they aren't there. When the sun rises after an SCP-1102 occurrence, every walking corpse simply disappears, along with the original corpse that it was copied from. Not a trace is left behind, unless, of course, you happen to get that smell trapped in your brand new tent. 
And this brings us to what was most unfortunate about the incident up at the hostel in the Blue Ridge Mountains that our hiker bore witness to. The fire that started had nothing to do with SCP-1102. All that happened was our friend in the blue coat felt so afraid of the stranger standing outside that he sat himself right up against one of the hearths inside, close enough for the edge of his coat to catch fire. While the whole building did burn down, rescue services only found eight bodies inside, far from the maximum capacity the hostel offered, almost as if everyone else crowded inside that building had mysteriously vanished. Of course, keeping an SCP like this one away from the public eye is no small task. Containing a seemingly random geographic phenomenon is virtually impossible without sealing off the whole mountain range. Instead, a group of dedicated agents has spent several years running an information operation instead, taking the truth of these events and dressing them up as cliched ghost stories, the kind you tell around a campfire. So next time you sit across from someone toasting a marshmallow and telling you about a friend they once had, it might just be worth paying attention to. You never know who might be on their way to join you. The old house sits, crooked and dilapidated, on the very end of the last street in town. It's the kind of house that children share stories about and warn each other to stay away from. There isn't even any graffiti on it, rare for an abandoned building in this town. But nobody is brave enough to get close to it and risk their life if the rumors of its history are to be believed. A black van containing four men pulls up along the curb outside the house. One of them has been black bagged, zip ties cutting into the skin of his wrists. He was leaving a bar in town when suddenly he found the barrel of a 9mm semi-automatic pistol looking him in the eye, held by a man with every reason to pull the trigger. Two other men had then emerged from the dark behind him. There was a brief feeling of cold metal against his skin as the twin metal barbs of the stun gun were jammed into the man's neck. His body then began to convulse as 50,000 volts of electricity ran through his body, and when he was finally able to open his eyes again, there was only darkness. The back doors of the van swing open, and the unfortunate man is pulled out by two of his captors. The driver joins to help drag the man down the gravel pathway up to the deserted house's front door. In his desperation, he offers any excuse he thinks might save him. Please, I just need a little more time. I can get the money, I swear. I've got another job lined up, honest. I start on Monday, just a little longer, I'm begging you. All he receives is silence as he's taken into the old house. There's no pleading, begging cliché that they haven't heard before. They've learned to just tune it out and get the job done. Click, click, click. The three men turn on their flashlights. The electricity hasn't been on in the uninhabited house for years. It's the domain of rats, roaches, and spiders now. The only evidence of life being the network of spider webs in every corner and the faint chittering sound of something coming from behind faded wallpaper. The only reason anyone would ever choose to come here is when you needed to do something under the absolute cover of dark, which is exactly what they needed to do. The dark-suited men drop their weeping prisoner to the ground. He tries again to plead with them and receives a hard kick in the gut. It knocks the breath out of the man, and he is left wheezing in quiet pain, no longer able to speak. One of them finally pulls the dark bag from his head. His nose is bleeding. His eyes are equal parts bleary and afraid, like he only half understands his circumstances. What he does understand, though, is that it's looking increasingly unlikely that he'll be leaving this house tonight. The three men look down at the pathetic figure huddled on the floorboards. None of them really want to be here, but this is the job they've been paid to do. They are unaware, though, that they aren't the only ones watching. Somewhere in the dark is someone else who watches them with a detached, almost amused curiosity. Taking in the deep dark of the house, one of the men wonders aloud whether it might be haunted. The man with the gun laughs as he pulls back the hammer on his gun and tells him that there's about to be one more ghost here. But just as he is about to pull the trigger and put an end to their captor's terrified blubbering, he suddenly hears something that gives him pause, something from above them, upstairs. Is he imagining it? Or are those particles of dust floating down from the ceiling, accompanied by the sound of footsteps? All of the men clearly hear it, and the three look around, shining their flashlights into the dark corners of the room. The one holding the man at gunpoint motions to one of the others to go check upstairs. He looks like he'd rather do anything else, but when the man with the gun, who is clearly the one in charge, turns and points his gun at him instead, the man finally concedes that he'll go check it out. He draws a gun of his own from inside his pocket and starts making his way up the creaking stairs to the second floor of the house. 
The leader's mind is still on whatever's upstairs. His dumb lackey tried filling his head with all those goofy ghost stories, but he knows, deep down, it's probably just a raccoon or something. When his driver has ensured there are no other witnesses, he'll finish the job, and they can all get out of this creepy dump. He calls up to the driver and asks him if he sees anything up there. Nothing, he calls down. I think we're... His words are cut off by his own sudden scream. There are two gunshots, followed by a loud thump as something heavy hits the ground. The two men, both with guns out, crouch down in defensive poses. They call out again, asking what's happening, but they're only met with cold, unforgiving silence. Everyone is on high alert now. Even the bound man is now more afraid of whatever's upstairs than the men who brought him here. Nobody dares move as, after what feels like minutes of silence, the footsteps resume upstairs again. The leader calls out again, asking what's going on. Still no reply, just more footsteps. They follow the sound across the floor above them to the stairs, then listen as the steps start to creak again. Their eyes drift over where they see nothing. Are they going insane? The two hired guns share a panicked glance as if to say, what do we do now? But neither has an answer. A quiet, reedy whisper suddenly echoes through the stale air of the house. With what sounds like a female voice, it rasps, what are you doing in my house? The remaining lackey, consumed by panic, begins firing wildly into the dark. The captive and the leader both get as close as they can to the floor as bullets fly through the air, piercing the old wooden walls causing roaches alike to scatter. Soon enough, the bullets are gone, replaced with only the feeble click, click, click of his dry firing. What is going on in here? He thinks. This place really is haunted. Before another fearful thought can cross his mind, a lamp comes flying at him out of the darkness, shattering into pieces of skin carving ceramic against his face. Next comes a book, then an old heavy phone, and then a dusty old brick that strikes his skull with a monstrous crunch. He drops to his knees, bleeding from both nostrils and the deep gash cut into his forehead, before flopping face down onto the floor. He'll be lucky if he ever wakes up. Only the leader and his prisoner are left now, both confused, both afraid, both seemingly beset by a poltergeist. Suddenly, the leader feels a hot breath on his neck and a whisper right into his ear. You shouldn't have come here, it hisses. He turns, screams, and fires once into the dark. Nothing. A strange, tinny giggle suddenly loops around him. It's everywhere and nowhere. He can hear footsteps, but where are they coming from? They're simultaneously getting further and getting closer. An unseen fist collides with his jaw, harder than he's been hit in a long time. He stumbles, looking around for the assailant, panting like a prize fighter in the championship rounds. But there's nothing there. There's nothing. Crack! It strikes the other side of his face, another giggle from the dark. He spits a tooth out as his mouth bleeds. Not knowing what else to do, he extends his arm and fires desperately. Maybe he'll get lucky. Or maybe not. A force wraps itself around his extended arm and pulls on it with a sudden, immense pressure. It snaps before he has the chance to scream, his arm bending at the joint in the wrong direction. He lets out an agonized cry as he drops his gun to the ground, but that scream is cut off when he takes a punch to the solar plexus, sapping the wind from him as he spews out a thin mist of blood that settles onto the shape of a woman's face staring right at him, grinning. His terror and pain overcome him. His mind snaps and he faints from panic, collapsing to the ground in a heap. His jacket opens as invisible fingers work a handkerchief from an inside pocket and wipe the blood from the floating face, leaving only a floating, bloody handkerchief. The man on the ground, the one who was brought here against his will, watches astonished and speechless as the handkerchief flutters down to the ground. All he can do is stare in amazement as the leader's arm flops limply upright, as the gold watch around his wrist unclasps itself and floats into the air and then, with a strange gulping noise, disappears entirely. Footsteps creak across the ground. The front door opens, then closes again, leaving the terrified man in silence, lying on the floor between two bodies. After a time, he finally gains the courage to stand up. He creeps nervously towards the front door and opens it. There's no one outside. Not that he could see whatever assailant just took out the group of men anyway. With one last look back into the dark house, he steps out and closes the door behind him, He's free, and no matter how hard he tries, he will never understand the true nature of the invisible specter that just saved his life. But while none of the men will never know what they encountered that night, the SCP Foundation certainly does, because these are the kind of antics you can expect from SCP-347, also known by the somewhat obvious nickname of the Invisible Woman. 
but she has another name, her own self-chosen epithet. Claudia. Foundation staff are currently unsure whether this is the real name of the SCP-347 entity or a pseudonymized reference to Claude Rains, the English actor who portrayed Dr. Jack Griffin in the 1933 film The Invisible Man. Of course, nothing is really as it seems when it comes to this particular anomaly, though it's easy to be more than what meets the eye when nothing meets the eye at all. Claudia, as I will refer to her both out of respect for her chosen name as well as for the sake of simplicity, is 164 centimeters in height and 55 kilograms in weight. And that's really all that is known for sure about her, because her primary anomalous trait is, of course, that she is completely and utterly invisible. Although she seems to possess them like an average human, all parts of her body, including blood and hair, will remain invisible even if removed from her body. It seems that only saliva and bodily waste become visible when separated from her body, as a number of disgruntled, mop-and-bucket-wielding D-classes are more than aware. Claudia is able to see through what also must be anomalous means, since in typical humans, the cones and rods of the eyes must be visible for them to receive light and thus see. Research is ongoing as to how exactly this is possible, as well as what it could potentially provide for active camouflage technology. By her own description, which due to her skittish and crafty personality must be taken with a grain of salt, Claudia is a mixed-race woman between the ages of 19 and 25, with brown eyes and wavy black hair. She appears to have no anomalous traits other than her invisibility, no super strength or speed, no ability to fly. However, what she does have is a very particular set of skills. Skills that make her a nightmare to anyone wishing to keep her under lock and key. Like, for example, the SCP Foundation. The Foundation quickly learned that Claudia is an accomplished escape and infiltration artist with the lock-picking skills of a veteran thief. She's able to move while making very little noise, which complements her natural stealth advantages perfectly, allowing her to get in and out of secured areas easily. These are skills she's developed not only to survive, but to support certain psychological dependencies she suffers from. While Foundation psychologists have posited a number of mental conditions that could be affecting Claudia, two seem to have risen to prominence, kleptomania and pica. Claudia appears to be compulsively driven to steal as a kind of psychological crutch. Being invisible, naturally, makes her an impeccable thief. However, when she has obtained the item of her desire, said item floating through the air is likely to draw unwanted attention. That is where her second strange habit comes in. Pica is an eating disorder that causes sufferers to consume items that are not food, sometimes damaging themselves in the process. Claudia has developed the unhealthy habit of swallowing some of the smaller items she steals, causing them to seemingly disappear until she later vomits the items back up. When interviewed on the matter, Claudia stated that she'd gotten the idea from watching Stevie Starr perform on a late-night television show. Starr is a Scottish performer known for his ability to swallow and regurgitate items, though Starr's ability doesn't extend far enough to meet the Foundation's threshold for anomalous. Before she was brought into containment, Claudia had a preference for abandoned houses. The home where Foundation agents finally discovered her was one with a long history of reported poltergeist activity. As is standard in instances where spectral phenomena were suspected, the Foundation moved in with infrared cameras, allowing them to quickly detect the humanoid shape of Claudia and move in to intercept her. Without the advantage of her invisibility, she had no chance of either evading or besting trained Foundation operatives in combat. Thankfully, it didn't need to come to that, and after a brief period of deliberation, Claudia gave herself up to the Foundation willingly in exchange for shelter and warm meals, both of which would be provided for her in containment. Prior to this, it's believed that she was effectively homeless for years and had been making ends meet in any way she could. She refuses to discuss her past directly, though a long string of ghost activity across the area and at least two deaths have been solidly linked to her activities. Being unseen for years of her life, has taken an undeniable mental toll on Claudia, the isolation leading to instability and even violent outbursts on occasion. Thankfully, she has responded well to treatment from Foundation counselors and psychiatrists, which has reduced the frequency of these violent outbursts significantly. As she recovers further from her traumatic past, there is hope that Claudia may even begin to recover from her kleptomaniac tendencies altogether, allowing her to live a normal, well-adjusted life or as much as one can hope to live while still remaining invisible. There's even more good news, though. Since entering containment and undergoing recovery, Claudia has become much more social. She enjoys interacting with other people, especially when they treat her as though she's an average person. 
and some of her actions have even been described as bordering on flirtatious. She enjoys interacting physically with people, and often plays impish pranks on the unsuspecting people sent into her chamber, such as rearranging or taking items to confuse them. She also shows, for unknown reasons, a particular fondness for interacting with people as they sleep, often touching and stroking them, though it may have been one of the only ways she was able to have human contact prior to entering Foundation custody. While she describes this as feeling right, those who experience it from the other side describe it as feeling unnerving, as though they've been touched by a ghost. Naturally, due to being an intelligent escape artist that is impossible to see through conventional means, Foundation containment specialists have needed to go all out on her containment measures, both to keep her contained and to keep her comfortable enough that she has no desire to attempt a containment breach. She is kept in a 5 meter by 5 meter room in Site 17, constantly monitored by a remote infrared camera, and in addition to infrared detection systems, Claudia is also visible in ultraviolet light, expanding the Foundation's means of seeing her. Her room has an ensuite bathroom with a shower and bathtub, and is furnished with a queen-sized bed, several oversized beanbag chairs, two armchairs, a desk and swivel chair, several bookcases, and a TV with a DVD player. The bookcases are filled with various books, primarily adventure novels, harlequin romances, and art books. She is allowed DVDs of various movies and TV shows predating her arrival at the SCP facility, and may request new material to be reviewed every so often. Claudia is given access to any clothes she pleases, though she often prefers to remain unclothed to take advantage of her full invisibility. She does, on occasion, wear wigs and makeup for her own amusement. Her room must remain locked at all times when she is inside it, and two guards are required to check the door for any signs of tampering every hour. The door is only unlocked to allow staff members in and out of the containment chamber for the purposes of research and enrichment. Claudia enjoys chatting with staff members who bring her food, though said staff members are discouraged from forming attachments that are too close to Claudia, as it may allow her to manipulate them into helping her escape or gain special privileges. On the rare occasions when Claudia is allowed to leave the room, she is mandated to wear gloves and a layer of grease paint over her face to give personnel awareness of her hands and facial expressions. If she does attempt violent action or escape, she must be apprehended immediately and placed back into her room. In the event of an escape, infrared goggles will be distributed to all personnel, and any strange phenomena around Site-17 will be reported. Thankfully, escape attempts are quite infrequent, and while she currently has the Euclid Object class, pending further therapy, her containment class may be upgraded to Safe class. Of course, the Foundation keeps any containment breaches close to the chest, and if there was a recent containment breach, you'd have no way of knowing. For all you know, she could be watching you right now. So sleep tight. And if you feel someone stroking your hair in the night, be sure to check up on your valuables in the morning. Papers fly up in the air in every direction as the office workers run for their lives. The PA, brand new at her job, can't figure out where on earth the emergency exit is. She tries every door, but they are either locked or go nowhere. The vast office maze, uncanny in its complexity, stretches along endless hallways and old directories. At the end of the corridor, right in front of her, is a door with a touch bar on it. That will surely be a fire escape, a way for her to get away from the monster. She throws her whole body weight against the bar and tumbles through the door, landing in a janitor's closet. No way out except back. Lying there, sprawled amongst the mops and cleaning products, the PA rolls over and stares back down the corridor. Somehow, she still holds the Starbucks iced latte in her hand. A forked tongue appears around the corner, followed by a flattened nose, long razor-like teeth, and a pair of blank reptile eyes. The hulking anaconda winds its way along the carpets, licking the air, tasting the scent of the PA's perfume. She is powerless, lying there crouched in the cramped janitor's closet as the enormous snake slithers towards her. It rears up tall as a human and bears its fangs. The PA closes her eyes, and readies herself for the inevitable bite. The knife and fork land on the table with a loud enough clatter to make all the other patrons turn. A large man with a bushy beard spills tomato soup down his chest while a snooty food reviewer chokes on the seafood she's just been trying to swallow. A woman, shaking with rage, screams into her phone. Next time you'll get my order right. It's a caramel oat milk latte with eight ice cubes. No, no, I don't care that one of them melted. It's not good enough. In her venomous tirade, she threatens the job, life, and even the family of whoever she's talking to. 
The woman slams her phone down on the table loudly enough to make everyone in the restaurant jump again. This time, one of the waitstaff spills an entire tray of drinks over a table of guests. The commotion is loud enough to make the woman's fury shift in their direction. Excuse me, I'm trying to conduct business here. Could you please not be so rude? Stalking into the head office of Louis Vuitton, the woman walks so fast that the brand new assistant following her struggles to catch up. The PA is still signing her contract of employment as they go, doing her best to multitask as she lists off her boss's itinerary. Design meeting from 1 to 1.30, yoga with a personal trainer from 1.30 to 1.45, then into an urgent meeting to get ahead of the latest animal cruelty scandal. The woman struggles to keep track of which issue her colleagues are complaining about this time. It could be the animal testing from the perfume line, the snakeskin rug they've just had to discontinue, or the polar bear scarf they've just announced for the winter collection. She can sense the headache coming on already. The new PA hands her an iced coffee as they get into the elevator. She takes a sip and decides she doesn't even want it, throwing it in the trash as soon as they reach her floor. She's just about to launch into a rant about animal activists and their oversensitivity when the smell hits her. Opening the door to her office, she's punched in the face by the stench of rotting fish. Lying on the floor of her office is a 600-pound tuna fish staring blankly at the ceiling. The woman is so shocked that, for once, she stops yelling and just stares in surprise. In her 35 years in New York, never once has anyone so much as said the word no to her, let alone pulled a stunt like this. She turns around to face her personal assistant and asks for her name. It's Melanie. The poor girl is terrified. She asks Melanie why there's a fish in her office, and before the girl can even muster up a reply, the heartless corporate overlord fires her on the spot. She hadn't even signed her contract yet. Once Melanie the PA leaves the room, the woman finds herself alone with the giant tuna, her anger simmering. Looking down at the dead animal, she sees a crumpled mess of cream-colored silicone under it, along with a few wet articles of clothing. Using the tip of her cigarette holder, she pulls at the crumpled silicone to try and extract it from under the fish. Huh? Strange. It looks almost like one of those human masks you buy at a Halloween store, except it's a full suit. In fact, it looks remarkably similar to her head of innovation and product design. Lying on the floor next to it is something small and innocent looking. It's part of a zipper, broken by the looks of it. The black metal is slightly bent out of shape and worn away at the edges. It looks cheap and used, not the kind of material one would expect to see anywhere within a five-mile radius of this office. She picks up the zipper and rolls it between her fingers. Her headache is back. She needs a coffee. Pressing the intercom button, she demands that her new PA immediately go out and get one, forgetting that she'd just fired her a few moments earlier. Walking over to the window of her top-floor office, she looks down at the crowds of animal rights protesters stories and stories below, rolling the zipper between her fingers the whole time. Her thumb is itching slightly. Looking down at the metal tab in frustration, the woman sees that the zipper has somehow embedded itself into her skin. Puzzled, she leans in close for a better look, going a little cross-eyed. She couldn't have been squeezing it that hard, could she? Tentatively, the woman tries to pull the zipper out, but it just tugs at her skin, not budging at all. A faint sense of panic starts to well up in her chest. She pulls at it again, trying her best to dislodge it from her flesh, but it won't move. Then a second idea pops into her brain. What if she just… The woman slides the zipper down along the length of her thumb. It glides smoothly, feeling just like the one you'd use to open your raincoat. Except, as it travels along her thumb, the skin itself seems to separate and flop apart, leaving a dark, empty space inside. The layers of her skin peel back as if they're made of rubber, and a flow of steam hisses out from the gap in her thumb. The zipper reaches the palm of her hand, and her thumb dangles there limply, empty, as if nothing had ever been inside of it. Her eyes widen with amazement. She continues to slide the zipper across her palm, up her wrist, and towards her elbow. As it goes, that gentle waft of steam continues to escape from the gap, exposing a row of metal teeth. She can't stop. The zipper glides up her bicep and towards her shoulder. In one final move, she slides it directly across her collarbone and falls to the ground, lifeless. The pile of empty skin sits crumpled on the floor of her office, for several seconds, nothing moves. Then, the middle of the skin shifts slightly, almost as if something inside it had moved. 
The same happens again and again, just as the woman's newest PA arrives with a nice coffee held proudly in her hands. Why is it so dark in here? What's happened to the lights? She must have had an episode. She doesn't remember falling over, but here she is on the ground in total darkness. The only thing she could recall was hallucinating that zipper. The woman shuffles this way and that, trying to get her bearings. She attempts to put an arm out to lift herself up, but can't. She tries her other arm, again, nothing, no movement at all. Come to think of it, she can't even feel her arm. Maybe a leg? No luck there either. She must have hit her head pretty hard on the ground when she landed. Perhaps she's got a concussion. The woman does her best to sit up straight and finds that it's actually quite easy. Her back arches and curves effortlessly, twisting at whatever angle she wants. All of that yoga must have been paying off. All of a sudden, she's dimly aware of a light in front of her. What's the old cliche they always say in movies? Don't go towards it? Screw that. The light in front of her is the only thing she can see right now. Without thinking about it, the woman stretches her neck forward and finds that it moves easily and surprisingly far. She must be concussed. It feels like she's almost gliding in any direction she wants. She simply moves her head and she finds her whole body drifting in that direction effortlessly. That spot of light she was looking at? It's not some mystical end of the tunnel situation. It's a gap in whatever material has been covering her. The woman pokes her head out and takes in a breath of fresh air, doing her best to shrug off the rest of the bundle of whatever it was that she had been buried inside. Was it silicone? She turns her head to look back at it and jumps at the sight. She'd been inside of one of those silicone costumes, the same as the other one under the tuna that had been in her office, except this one. She had seen that face millions of times on magazine covers, plastered across billboards in her selfie camera and in the mirror at home. She's looking at the crumpled husk of herself. A scream fills her head, and she darts her gaze around suddenly to see a PA standing in the doorway with a nice latte trembling in her hand. Yes, some good news. The woman opens her mouth to talk to the PA, but the words don't come. She tries her best to squeeze her lungs and articulate her vocal cords, but the best she can manage is a soft hissing sound. That's when she spies her reflection in the mirror on the wall and sees the dead reptilian eyes and enormous curved fangs of an anaconda looking back at her. Pandemonium fills the office of Louis Vuitton as the anaconda weaves its way around the corridors, passing the reception desk and through the break room, approaching anyone it finds and asking for help. The snake tries its best to look very calm and innocent, assuring people that it poses no threat to them. However, that's a very difficult thing to do when every time it opens its mouth, all anybody can see is a set of enormous teeth pointing straight at them. Within a couple of minutes, everybody seems to have evacuated, leaving the snake on her own, winding her way through the corridors, trying her best not to panic. That's when she spies her PA lying helpless in the janitor's closet. Relief washes over her as she sees that the girl has nowhere to run. This should be easy to talk to her then. The snake rushes over and stands tall, looking down at the girl. She opens her mouth, leans in close, and takes the ice latte from the girl's hand. Placing the cup gently on the carpet, the snake slurps a bit of the coffee through the straw. It's absolutely vile, clashing horribly with the hypersensitive taste receptors on her tongue. She tries to spit it out, but discovers that snakes have very different mouth anatomy than hers, and that motion isn't so easy. Besides, she realizes if she's going to have any hope of convincing this girl of who she really is, taking a drink from that Starbucks cup is probably her best chance to do it. Coiling herself up to look as small as possible, the snake sips away at the coffee and looks at the PA in what she hopes is a reassuring way. Very slowly, she can see the cog starting to turn in the girl's face as she realizes what's happened. Reaching into her handbag, the PA, in shaking hands, pulls out a notebook and a pen and offers them to the snake. It's slow progress and takes a lot of work, but eventually, the snake is able to get enough control over the motor functions of its tail to grip the pen and scribble out a few words, just before the pest control team arrives and tranquilizes her. For three weeks, the anaconda is locked up in the animal control center in New York City. The center wasn't equipped for dealing with giant snakes, so they ended up putting her in the largest dog holding pen they had, which only just about fits her if she coils up in the right way. Three times a day, one of the keepers will toss her slabs of raw meat. She'd always been a fan of a rare steak. Little did she know just how enjoyable a raw one could be. 
Aside from mealtimes, she's miserable, doing everything she can to communicate to the workers there that she's really a sentient woman, not only a sentient woman, but also the head of one of the world's largest high fashion brands. She quickly discovers she's talking to a brick wall, or rather, hissing up one. The more she thinks about it, the more her situation reminds her of some of the photos that had been passed across her desk over the prior few months at various planning meetings. Photos from undercover journalists who had visited her company's factory in the Far East and discovered cages upon cages of live animals locked up, either to be killed for their skin or to be hosed down with chemicals to see if they develop a rash. It was lying there on the floor that she discovered that snakes don't have tear ducts. She would have liked it if they did. Maybe that way, she'd be able to get some of her emotions out. The foundation moved quickly as soon as the news story broke. Agents were in and out of the office within hours. The zipper was placed into a sealed bag and transported directly to Site 64, where it has since remained in a standard issue locker. A series of testing sessions were established to ascertain exactly how SCP-3660 functioned. As soon as the zipper is pressed against the skin of a human being, it embeds itself. Test subjects report no feelings of pain and discomfort, just confusion. That's how the zipper has been able to press itself in so deep. Only a handful of subjects have reported feeling a slight itching sensation and the desire to pull out the tab to relieve that feeling. It sits just below the layer of the skin, in the same way that it would on a jacket or hoodie. If left untouched within 10 minutes, SCP-3660 will activate on its own accord, sliding steadily along the subject's skin and unzipping them. As this happens, the subject is instantaneously, and again without pain, transfigured into an animal. This process occurs internally beneath the layer of skin as it unzips. According to the basic laws of physics, a transformation this drastic and quick would require enormous amounts of energy, and so researchers expected to find heat and pressure levels high enough to instantly boil the blood of the subject. However, the only abnormal thermal readings came from a slight hiss of steam escaping the gap in the skin as it unzips. The new opening of the skin is now lined with a row of metal teeth on either side, as the skin itself appears to be transformed into a slightly different texture and material. Researchers note that the empty skin of the test subject looks and feels somewhat uncanny. Test samples taken into the lab reveal that the complex carbon-based multicellular organ has somehow been transmuted into consistent silicone rubber. Several tests involved placing the D-Class personnel atop a weighing scale, and researchers were shocked to see enormous and rapid fluctuations in weight depending on the animal that the subject was transformed into. Transformed is the correct word to use here. The animal that emerges from the opening in the skin is not an entirely new life form. It is difficult to build a method of communication with every creature that emerges from the testing process. Since the animal created seems to be largely random, they can often pose real challenges in terms of setting up a method for feedback on how the test went. For example, three subjects have been transmuted into various species of squid, which had to be quickly rushed to an aquatic test chamber before drying out. Once inside these test chambers, while the squids were evidently very intelligent, they lacked the motor skills and limbs to be able to form any kind of sign language or even point out letters on a board. Great apes, however, have proven much easier to work with, as they can quickly adopt sign language and even attempt rudimentary vowel sounds with their throats. What is clear from this testing is that the animal that emerges retains the memories of the person it has replaced. It has the same attachment to loved ones, the same fears, and the same idiosyncrasies. Or at least it does when these things do not come into conflict with the animal's biological nature. One test subject, for example, had always had a strong affection for hamsters. However, when that test subject emerged from the pile of silicone skin as a sparrow hawk, it had a markedly different relationship with them, something that it expressed guilt over for the duration of testing. Try as it might, however, the hawk could not fight its urge to feed on the hamsters whenever it was offered the opportunity. Similar tendencies can be noticed in animals' mating behaviors. A survey of the test subjects revealed that 94.7% of male species reported resisting the urges of feeding and breeding to be the aspect most difficult to control in their new form. From all of the testing conducted thus far, only amniotes, cephalopods, and chondrichthians have been observed emerging from the test subjects' empty skin sacs. Testing is ongoing to determine if there is a set pattern to the animals emerging, although thus far, no pattern has been observed. One particularly memorable test saw a blue whale emerge from the body of one of the D-Class personnel, causing significant damage to the testing facilities as the room had not been constructed with that large of a creature in mind. 
Since then, testing has been temporarily suspended, as the Foundation discovered that one of the senior researchers was underreporting the level of testing being conducted and quickly turning Site-64 into the SCP petting zoo for highly gifted animals. Fortunately, the head of Louis Vuitton and her PA managed to get in contact with the SCP Foundation. Or rather, the SCP Foundation got in contact with her after she was seen creating a huge social media conspiracy about the fact that her former boss had been transformed into a snake. The anaconda was soon located and transferred to Site-64. Several interview sessions with the snake found an animal humbled by her time in a cage. After a couple of hours of negotiating with the senior researchers, she was able to agree on a deal where she would be used as part of a promotional campaign for charities against the mistreatment of animals. She would attend filming days and perform on camera to show the abuse that animals went through in testing facilities. The general public believes that the footage is computer-generated, and a VFX house has been credited in the adverts. Meanwhile, the Amazon rainforest has one new occupant, a colossal snake that is kind to humans and has a strange addiction to iced coffee. A face screams in terrible agony. In the darkness, you can't quite make out the shape of its body, but it doesn't look human. It's large and square, almost boxy. Two things you should know. This is a fate worse than death, and it isn't the only one. It's a busy but ordinary day in Hangzhou, China. People are rushing to and from work, going to school, going for walks, buying a hot meal and a cup of tea. But for one young police officer, this is a monumental day. He has been assigned the biggest case of his career, and he grips the stack of files with sweaty, trembling hands as he considers the weight of this moment. It isn't just one case, not really. It's actually six. Six separate missing person cases that he's beginning to suspect might be connected. Our detective wishes he could take a moment and transport himself away from these harrowing missing person cases and clear his head. But while he's unable to, we can. Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Raid Shadow Legends, the hit mobile hero collection RPG played by over 80 million players across the world. And they've got some huge news for both new and returning players, the recently added Live Arena. To tell us about it, I've invited a fellow academic to join us today. Professor Death Knight here with a lesson about Live Arena, the new PvP mode where you can fight against other players in real time. <gasps> Sounds terrifying? Well, so's going to the dentist. You should still do it. Live Arena has a draft feature where you can pick and ban champions to fight for you. <laughs> Teamwork! When you win matches, you'll get Live Arena crests towards unlocking special area bonuses, or so I hear. I'm too afraid to try any of this out. All right, class. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Bob here. What's your personal strategy for Live Arena? Well, everyone thinks I'll go in fighting, but nobody expects my charm. My best strength is the gift of gab. So when they try to attack, I'll just be like, Nice weather we're having, eh? Nobody will see it coming. That doesn't sound like a very effective strategy. Do not pick me for Live Arena. Seriously, don't. I'm too young to be bone meal. Well, thank you for your- Class dismissed. Do we have a bell? Oh, we should totally get a bell. Class definitely not dismissed, but there's a bunch of brand new content in Raid Shadow Legends related to the animated limited series Call of the Arbiter including a free legendary champion, the mighty orc warlord Artak. All you have to do to get him is log into Raid for 7 days between now and July 24th. Easy. New players, use my link or scan the QR code right here and get a free starter pack with this cool in-game loot. So just hit my link in the description and I'll see you on the battlefield. And now, back to the case at hand. The detective was beginning to suspect that the six separate missing person cases might be connected. At first glance, they seem unrelated. The victims have very little in common, except one thing. They all worked at the same office. An office that closed one month ago, a casualty of international corporate downsizing. No one from his police department has bothered to look into this angle, assuming that it will lead back to more dead leads. But the young officer can't shake the feeling that there is important information waiting for him in that abandoned office building. So, after finishing up his lunch and dabbing the nervous sweat from his brow with a handkerchief from his pocket, he sets off toward the old office building in hopes of cracking the case wide open. As he makes the trip, he considers some other possible theories. 
Maybe the missing employees skipped town, overwhelmed and depressed from their unexpected job loss. But would they really let their families worry like this? Some of them have wives, husbands, children, all of whom would notice their absence and assume the worst. No, this isn't a simple case of a group of colleagues all vanishing to blow off steam in another city somewhere. Something bad happened. He can just feel it. Maybe they uncovered corporate secrets and someone decided to silence them before they could blow the whistle. But then again, what sort of secrets would be worth killing for at a printer company? It feels worthless trying to guess, trying to fill in the gaps in his knowledge with wild speculation. The only way to find out was to examine the building for himself and see if he can find any clues at all that lead him to the whereabouts of the missing six. When the young officer reaches the building, he finds the door padlocked shut. Luckily, he prepared for this and brought some industrial strength bolt cutters that snapped the lock into pieces with very little effort. Why lock up the building like this? There can't be anything valuable left inside. To prevent squatters, most likely, he assures himself, brushing off the sense of dread creeping up his spine as he walks inside. As he crosses the threshold of the empty office, the first thing he notices is the smell. It reeks of sulfur and bleach and a whiff of something electrical that stings the inside of his nostrils with each breath. New possibilities turn over in his mind. Perhaps some sort of deadly workplace accident claimed the lives of the missing when they came back in to collect their belongings and clear out the building. Before he can decide if that theory holds any water, his thoughts are interrupted by a piercing scream coming from a nearby room. The officer isn't alone here. There's someone in the building with him, and they sound like they're in trouble. The officer grabs the taser from his holster and runs toward the sound. He skids to a stop, nearly knocking over a water cooler when he reaches the source of the screaming. There's a man hanging from the wall, screaming over and over again. The officer can barely process what he's seeing. The man is covered in machinery, all whirring and clicking as it works. Next to him, a printer is printing sheet after sheet of paper, and all the while, the man screams. The officer recognizes the man's face from one of the files. This is one of the missing employees. He can't determine what is causing the man such distress, and he tries to ask the man what happened to him. The man just continues to scream, eyes wide open and wild, rolling around in their sockets, unfocused and unseeing. The officer grabs the man, attempting to remove him from the wall, but he won't budge. It's as if his body is wired into the wall itself, and the harder the officer tugs, the more it appears as if the man's flesh will begin to tear away. The officer stops, turning his attention to the machinery. Perhaps if he unplugs it, he'll be able to remove the man more easily. He starts with the printer, and as he reaches for its plug, he gets a closer look at the paper it continues to spit out. It doesn't look like any paper he's ever seen, and unable to help himself, he reaches out to touch it. It's warm, soft, pliable, and nauseatingly familiar. It isn't paper at all. It's skin. In that moment, all of the officer's training falls out of his mind, replaced with blind terror. He runs from the building as fast as he can, all the way back to the police station, where he tearfully informs his captain about what he found. This is no longer a police matter, his captain tells him. They need to escalate this to a specialized organization. The young officer is sent home, placed on psychiatric leave, and the next day, the SCP Foundation investigates the building it will come to refer to as SCP-2535. SCP-2535 is a former two-story Hewlett-Packard branch office building in the Zhaoshan district of Hangzhou, China. The building's anomalous nature is characterized by the presence of a detailed network of electrical and biological components of unknown origins. The walls of the building's entire first story are covered with 63,512 USB 2.0 standard A sockets, placed in a grid pattern made up of 20-centimeter semi-regular intervals. Each of these sockets is connected to wires running through the walls, but these are no ordinary wires. They consist of a woven mixture of copper strands and human optic nerve tissue, all wrapped in a layer of keratin. In spite of the inclusion of organic material in their structure, the wires have not shown any signs of decay or deterioration since the Foundation discovered SCP-2535. This curious, off-putting mix of the technological and the biological persists throughout the location and only gets stranger as one moves deeper into the building. If one were to follow the path of these wires, going against their better judgment and the scream of their most primal instincts, they would find that the wires lead to a room on the building's second floor. The room is currently inaccessible, but is thought to have once been the server room. 
Whatever is blocking the door is large enough that it cannot be budged, and non-intrusive imaging has determined that it is some sort of biological mass. The inside of the former server room, like the wires that lead there, emits heat at a consistent temperature of 47.6 degrees Celsius. Foundation personnel who approached the room have reported a persistent smell of sulfur and ozone coming from inside, as well as the loud sound of a running printer. 317 of the USB socket and power outlets in SCP-2535 are connected to HP brand USB 2.0 compatible devices. Of these devices, 20 have displayed anomalous, potentially ectoentropic functions. But what exactly does that mean? Allow me to elaborate. Just remember, you asked for this. Don't blame me if you aren't able to stomach the details. There are five former employees of the Hewlett-Packard Hangzhou branch still located inside of SCP-2535. These employees are in an anomalous sort of status, requiring no sleep, food, or water in spite of their continued, seemingly endless consciousness. Since the building's discovery in April of 2013, they have not changed in any way, or at least not in any visible way. All attempts to remove these former employees from their, let's call them predicaments, have proven unsuccessful. Allow me to discard any euphemism and explain just what exactly became of these unfortunate workers. First, there is Guo Pingping, the former branch manager. He can be found in the bathroom near the receptionist's desk on the first floor. Goa's head has been forced into the feed tray of a DP DeskJet 1112 printer, which is plugged into the wall. This is troubling for a number of reasons, one of which is that the internal dimensions of this particular DeskJet model's feed tray are not large enough to accommodate a human head, and its components are not strong enough to crush a human skull into a shape that would fit. Nonetheless, Goa's head is firmly lodged into the feed tray. One would assume this would have killed him, but his body continues to move, kicking and thrashing about as if he is in pain. The former assistant branch manager, James Gu Yonggun, is located in the employee pantry on the building's second floor. His body is attached to the wall in a vertical position, held there via 92 20-inch USB 2.0 M-M cables. Five additional cables have been used to secure the actuating unit of an HP DeskJet 2540 all-in-one printer to Gu's lower jaw. The arm of the actuating unit is also attached to a single HP-10 original ink cartridge in the color black. This ink cartridge is attached into Gu's throat at a continuous rate of one stroke per second and, in defiance of the known properties of ordinary ink cartridges, has yet to run out of ink in the years since its discovery. Gu appears to be partially conscious, but is unable to communicate intelligibly when addressed. The former Human Resources Department head, Angel Li Huimin, is still in her former office on the second floor though she no longer performs the duties of her old position. She is still, in a sense, in human resources, or rather, is a human resource. I apologize, sometimes I have to make a joke to cope with the dark subject matter at hand, but Angel's fate is no laughing matter. Like Goo, she is attached to the wall via a series of USB cables. There is an additional cable, one of unspecified length, inserted into her lower abdomen, which is slightly distended, as though filled with a foreign object. Though a proper analysis has not yet been conducted, the variety of sounds and motions originating from the area seem to indicate that there is a fully operational HP USB single station thermal receipt printer lodged near her small intestine. As a consequence of this, a never-ending stream of thermal receipt paper is pouring from Angel's mouth at all times, causing her considerable pain and distress. Wang Liang, the former head of the IT department, is permanently placed near the water cooler on the first floor. Like the others, he's bound to the wall by several USB cables, 37 to be exact. There are 12 HP ScanJet 200 scanners pressed against his body, all switched on and running at all times. Next to him, an HP DeskJet 1112 printer is attached to the wall and constantly printing out sheets of… something. A closer inspection reveals that it is not paper, but rather, sheets of skin. He is conscious, but no successful interview with Wang has been conducted due to his nearly constant, wordless screams of agony. The fifth human subject found in SCP-2535 is Chen Yupeng, who once worked as a trainee technical writer. Now he spends his days in the branch manager's office on the second floor of the building. His body has been wedged into the paper tray and backup paper tray of an HP LaserJet Pro 500 multifunction printer, which has been plugged into the wall via a standard power cable and a 3 feet USB 2.0 M-M cable. His head sticks out of an aperture, cut into the side of the printer. The printer itself functions normally, 
printing copies of the HP Standard Print Quality Diagnostic Page and the HP LaserJet 500 Technical Repair Manual, alternating between the two. Since SCP-2535's discovery, it has not run out of either paper or ink. Chen himself is unconscious and shows signs of severe blood loss that, under ordinary circumstances, likely would have resulted in death by now. During a preliminary inspection of the building, one Foundation operative discovered a Canon PIXMA E480 printer in the first floor janitor's closet. This printer was dented and heavily corroded, most likely from the application of liquid bleach, and was also covered with human teeth marks. It has spent the most recent several years attempting to print a 91-page document, but has been unsuccessful due to an apparent jam in its paper tray and feed mechanism. The seams of the printer occasionally ooze human blood, which DNA testing has matched to Yan Xiaoxia, former creative consultant of the Hangzhou branch. SCP-2535 must be sealed away from the public under the guise of health and safety concerns. At least two agents are to be stationed in a nearby building at all times for the purposes of observation. Wherever possible, the inside of SCP-2535 must be soundproofed. All material generated by the building's anomalies must be collected and disposed of on a daily basis. So far, these containment measures have been sufficient to keep civilians away from SCP-2535. As far as the friends and family of the missing employees know, their loved ones were never found. It's better that they think of them as lost or dead, rather than learn what truly became of them. As I was poring over the file for SCP-2535, something curious caught my attention. This is not the only anomaly catalogued by the SCP Foundation concerning a branch of the Hewlett Packard Corporation. I considered leaving well enough alone, but I've never been particularly good at that. When another path presents itself to me, no matter how dark or foreboding it may seem, I cannot resist the urge to see where it will lead. In this case, the path led me to SCP-2211. SCP-2211 was a collection of four anomalies discovered in the Shanghai offices of Hewlett Packard. Notice that I said, was, rather than is. More on that later. First, allow me to describe the nature of each anomaly. SCP-2211-1 is a 932MB video file titled simply longsmile.wmv. When played, the video depicts a pair of lips on the right edge of the screen. The lips hold a closed mouth smile for a moment, then open to reveal teeth. At this point in the video, the camera pans to the right, revealing more and more teeth, seemingly forever. Though the length of the video file is listed as 55 seconds, testing revealed that the file will continue to play, revealing endless, maddening rows of teeth for more than 150 straight hours. It will possibly run even longer than that, but testing was through before that could be seen. The video has no audio track. When longsmile.wmv is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device used to play it will begin to secrete a small amount of human saliva. A sample of saliva was collected for DNA testing, but the results were inconclusive and did not match any known human being on record. SCP-2211-2 is a 2.0 megabyte audio file entitled EYEE parentheses 79.wav. Each playthrough of the audio file is different, but tends to contain bursts of modulated static that go on for 2 to 10 seconds before being cut off for around 0.3 seconds of silence at a time. Like Longsmile, this file can play for a seemingly infinite amount of time, in spite of its listed length of 3 minutes and 3 seconds. When SCP-2211-2 is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device will begin to secrete a clear fluid, identified as a mixture of water and sodium chloride, amino acids, glutathione, ascorbic acid, and human collagen fibers. Essentially, the device will begin to leak human tears. SCP-2211-3 is a 599 kilobyte file titled r.exe. When this file is run on a computer, it uses up a great deal of memory, causing the device to overheat and its built-in fans to speed up. In spite of the overheating and any damage it might cause, the computer will continue to run until disconnected from its power source. When the file is run for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, air coming through the built-in fans will begin to emit a strong smell of earwax. Though no physical traces of earwax have been found, SCP-2211-4 is a USB adapter-powered coffee reheater. When it is plugged into the USB port of a computer, any liquid placed into the container will be heated to approximately 65 degrees Celsius and will also transform into human mucus at a rate of 1 milliliter per minute. 
This effect is the same whether or not the computer is on. DNA analysis of the mucus revealed that it is a match with the saliva produced by SCP-2211-1. All of this would have been bizarre enough. A series of files and devices that produce human biological material and are seemingly all connected. But something else happened. All instances of SCP-2211 were kept in a pair of containment lockers. However, on June 10th, 2014, this containment was breached. I have included a surveillance log transcript that captured the incident. It occurred as follows. Sound of banging metal detected near second floor of wing B. Door of small item containment locker DAD-2838 is heavily deformed outwards and has experienced a heavy impact from its inside. The sound of banging metal persists for the next three minutes as the door of containment locker DAD-2838 begins to burst outwards. Security teams are deployed to cordon off the area and manage the situation. Containment locker DAD-2838 is fully breached from the inside when a segmented, humanoid arm emerges, extending to reveal numerous joints along its length. Security teams begin opening fire on the arm to little effect. While the video feed shows that the arm terminates in a seven-fingered hand, personnel present on the scene reported a number of fingers ranging from five to approximately 30. The arm repeatedly strikes and breaches the containment locker containing SCP-2211-4, approximately five meters from containment locker DAD-2838. It subsequently reaches for SCP-2211-4 and pulls it back into containment locker DAD-2838. No further activity detected. Arm presumed to have dematerialized. Following this incident, the containment locker was examined, but no traces of the many-fingered arm were found inside. Further examination of the locker's contents revealed that SCP-2211-1, 2, and 3 had vanished from their storage media. The files were gone. SCP-2211-4, when tested, no longer displayed any anomalous properties. It was just an ordinary coffee heater, though no staff wanted to use it to heat their coffee, no matter how many times it was washed. Head researcher Min declared SCP-2211 uncontained on August 10, 2014. But there was one more unusual finding. The USB drive that once contained SCP-2211-1 was not empty. There was an untitled text file on the drive. When opened, it simply read, Got my my nose, followed by an unusual text emoticon, colon colon o o, and parentheses and parentheses. As a man of science, one who has devoted my life to exploring the unexplained and seeking answers to questions that most are afraid to even ask, Nothing troubles me quite like a mystery left unsolved. But the tales of these Chinese Hewlett Packard offices are composed almost entirely of disturbing mysteries, of frayed wires and broken printers, of survivors that cannot tell their stories, and messages we will never get to read. What happened after that Hangzhou branch closed? Was it connected to the findings at the Shanghai branch? Did that mysterious arm grab hold of the Hangzhou team, contorting their bodies into unrecognizable shapes and forcing them to meld with the products they once sold? Or was it once an employee too, broken down into spare parts and trapped as files and desktop beverage warmers? I can't be certain. But I do know this. I'm throwing out my printer. I think I'll just write my notes by hand from now on. I won't necessarily suggest you do the same, but do be careful while handling the machinery. Treat it with respect. After all, you never know if that printer was once as human as you or me. The Walking Dead, dripping and rotting, with glowing eyes and sharp teeth. A huge black wolf, stalking through the woods as you walk home alone in the dead of night. Even the horrors of the SCP Foundation, the old man, SCP-106. The gray shrieking nightmare of SCP-096, and the relentless hatred and violence of SCP-682. All these things frighten people, even the staff at the SCP Foundation, but one question still haunts them. One terrible, awful question. What's in the attic? What's in the attic? What is in the attic? There's a certain time of night where it seems as if day will never come, where the shadows have stretched long and heavy across the floor, and the air is thick with a sense of shapeless dread. Past midnight, but far before the relief of dawn. It is the time of night when terrors come to life, where fear sits on your chest and refuses to let you breathe easily. Right now, it is that time of night in the Lee family home, 
And with a knife under her pillow and disaster on her mind, Olivia Lee cannot sleep. She holds her breath, listening to the sounds of the house around her. Her siblings were asleep in their respective rooms, snoring away in the kind of peaceful slumber she could barely remember. Her parents whispering together downstairs. She can't make it out exactly, but she has a theory. They're talking about her, most likely. What else could they be discussing? After so many years of seemingly endless fighting, shouting, slamming doors, a porcelain vase or expensive china plate smashed against a wall, she can feel the tension reaching a boiling point. No doubt her parents are plotting, discussing what to do about her. They could kick her out, but she's only 17. No, she has the sneaking suspicion they have something else planned, something more drastic. That's why she snatched one of the kitchen knives yesterday, just in case. She can feel it under her pillow now, its presence radiating through the cool pillowcase against her cheek. Things have never been quite right in this house, in this family. Since she was little, she could feel an aura of wrongness clinging to everyone, to everything. It's only gotten worse over the years, condensing into a fog that chokes her when she tries to act like everything is normal. Like they're a perfect, happy family. Her parents might be content to keep up the charade, but she won't. Not anymore. She's been preparing, packing a duffel bag of clothes, food, a little bit of money, everything she needs to get out of this house, out of this town, once and for all. If they try anything tonight, that will be the sign that she needs to cut and run. Olivia's thoughts are interrupted by the sound of footsteps outside of her room. Two sets of adult footsteps, not her siblings coming to complain of a bad dream. Her parents. She holds her breath, waiting for the footsteps to pass. They stop just in front of her door. The knob begins to turn. She curses herself for not locking it. This is it. Whatever force in this house has made them resent her all this time, it has driven them to act. As the door creaks open, Olivia snatches the knife out from under her pillow, brandishing it in front of her. Her parents look more angry than surprised, as if they were expecting this from her. They shout at her to put the knife down and listen to what they say. Olivia refuses. It's the only leverage she has in this two-on-one confrontation, and she isn't about to give it up. She snatches the bag out from under her bed, and she slowly backs her parents up against the wall. This close, she can see the desperation in her mother's eyes and smell the spirits on her father's breath. Her hand trembles, and her eyes fill with tears. Suddenly, there's a sound from above, something heavy, shifting and moving across the floor. The sound makes Olivia's blood run cold. Up there, that's the attic. There's nothing in the attic, or at least as far as she knows. She's never been up there, could never force herself to climb the ladder up into the darkness without every fiber of her being rejecting it, every primal instinct screaming at her to get away. For as long as she can remember, the attic has been a place she never wanted to go. There's the sound again, louder this time, more insistent. It turns her stomach, a chill running down her spine. Whatever's up there, she needs to get as far away from it, from this house, as possible. She drops the knife, letting it clatter to the floor, and she tears out of the room with her duffel bag. She can hear her parents behind her, calling her name, begging her to listen, threatening her if she doesn't, but she shuts out the noise. The only thing on her mind is getting out of this house. As she runs, she can hear that sound in the attic following her, somehow right above her, no matter what part of the house she's in. She doesn't even bother to put on her shoes, flinging open the front door and sprinting out into the night in her socks. The door slams behind her, and suddenly, Olivia is gone, disappearing into an open world where she can breathe again. Back inside the house, the family she left behind is still taking in the reality of her absence. Above them, in the attic, something shifts. After Olivia leaves, the mood in the house begins to shift as well. Her parents, Franklin and Yvette, had hoped that her absence would make their home seem lighter, but in fact, it's been the opposite. They used to be able to ignore the attic, to glance at it and feel the gnawing sensation that something important, something terrible, was waiting up there, then keep walking and move on with the rest of their day. But now, without their eldest daughter, the thorn in their side who constantly aggravated and disappointed them, the feeling is getting harder to ignore. Slowly but surely, thoughts of the attic worm their way under the couple's skin until there's little else that they can think about. The house has taken on an eerie silence. It doesn't sound like this in a house where a family of five, formerly six, but now five, live. It sounds like a grave. 
Franklin cracks first, gives way to the pressure to climb the ladder and see what's up there in the attic. One morning he wakes up, drinks his coffee, and summons all of his strength, grits his teeth, and starts to climb. He grabs the first rung and begins to pull himself up, one step, one rung, then another, then another, slowly making his way up into the shadowy unknown above. He reaches up with an unsteady hand and pushes the door open. Just as his head crosses the threshold of the opening into the attic, everything goes dark. Franklin suddenly opens his eyes and finds himself sitting back at the kitchen table, his wife across from him, his children playing in the next room while the sound of Saturday morning cartoons blares from the television. He blinks, rubbing at his eyes. Was it his imagination? Did he just have a vivid daydream about climbing up to the attic? He asks Yvette, and she swears that she never saw him get up from the table. He drank his coffee, looked lost in thought for a moment, and then he snapped back to attention. She didn't see him do anything else. She shrugs it off and turns back to the newspaper. Franklin can't shake it off that easily. He goes about the rest of his Saturday as normal, helping tidy up the house, playing in the yard with the kids, and staring off into space. But all the while, he's thinking of the attic. He could swear that he climbed that ladder, and would happily swear it in front of a judge. But it didn't make sense. None of it made sense. He decides to try again, or maybe for the first time. His head aches from the effort of trying to sift through his memories and find what he could be missing. Later that night, after he and his wife settle down for bed, Franklin sneaks out of the bedroom. He tiptoes through the hall until he reaches the ladder up to the attic. Looking at it in the dark, he feels a sense of foreboding, as if his subconscious is warning him to turn back. He fights through the feeling, climbing up the steps one by one. He pushes open the door, climbs up through, and then he opens his eyes, lying on his back in bed, his wife fast asleep beside him. What the hell? Did he fall asleep and dream it? But why would he dream the same dream twice, once at the kitchen table in the bright light of the morning? No, that can't be it. Still, he needs to check one more time, just to be certain. He trudges out into the hall, climbs back up the ladder, and opens the attic door. Once more, he opens his eyes in bed, as if it was all a dream. But he knows better. Somehow the attic won't let him look inside. Whatever's up there, it doesn't want to be seen. He tries to put it out of his mind, to close his eyes and drift off to sleep, but he can't stop imagining the climb up to the attic, can't stop trying to picture what could be hiding above his head. This is his house, damn it! he should know everything going on in here. It just doesn't make sense. Franklin doesn't sleep at all that night, he just lies there, eyes shut, mind replaying the memory of his failed climbs over and over on a loop. The next day he tries one more time only to find himself sitting in his easy chair and watching the television. He tries again throughout the day, every time unable to reach the attic. Yvette notices the change in her husband, but doesn't dare ask what caused it. Whatever it is, he's growing increasingly distressed, angry, and terrified. She can guess what it might be about, and can feel that same uneasy feeling whenever she walks past the attic. The question of it gnaws at her, but she's afraid to try and look for herself. She can see what it's doing to Franklin and imagines what it might do to her. As the week goes on, Franklin and Yvette try their best to ignore the attic, but it grows more difficult with each passing day. By Sunday, Franklin comes home from the office with a box of his things, announcing that he has quit his job. He wants the family to move away from the house and have a fresh start somewhere else. He has a meeting with a realtor tomorrow to discuss selling the house. Yvette starts to protest, but thinks better of it. Best to let Franklin have his way when he gets his mind set on something. Besides, if they can move out of the house, maybe she won't ever have to find out what the trouble with the attic is all about. The next morning, a realtor comes by to meet with the Lees. He has great news. Someone has already put an offer on the house, and it's way more than what they paid for it. For once, things are really starting to look up for the family. They sit on the couch with the realtor, review the contract, and prepare to sign the paperwork. Franklin picks up a pen and gets ready to sign on the dotted line. But the instant the pen touches the paper, he's at the kitchen table again, Yvette sitting across from him with a cup of coffee in her hand. She stares at him, wide-eyed. She didn't forget this time. They both remember being there, ready to sign away their house and start a new chapter of their lives, when all of a sudden, like the skipping of a scratched record, there was a blip of some kind, and they were back here. Franklin rushes to the phone, dialing the realtor's number in an attempt to get a handle on things. It rings once, 
then an error message plays, informing him that the number he is trying to reach has been disconnected. He looks up the realtor, but finds that the real estate agency he was with is no longer in business. Somehow everything has changed, and their lucky brick has vanished into thin air. Franklin throws his coffee cup across the room in a burst of rage, and it shatters against the wall in a flurry of hot coffee and ceramic. The kids stop playing in the other room, coming to check out the source of the loud sound. Yvette shoes them away, then quietly begins to clean up the mess, and they carry on that way until bedtime. Franklin goes to bed early, exhausted from seething all day about the lost opportunity to sell the house. Yvette stays up, reading a book on the couch while the rest of the family sleeps. Just as she goes to turn the next page, she hears something. A voice coming from upstairs. It isn't Franklin. It isn't one of the kids. It's a voice she hasn't heard in a little while. It sounds like... Olivia. Yvette can't quite make out what her daughter is saying, but she knows that it's her. She's certain of it. Just as certain as she is of the fact that the sound is coming from the attic. She's been avoiding it all this time, afraid to become haunted by whatever has been vexing Franklin but she can't resist it anymore. She may have run her out of the house, but Olivia is her daughter, and her mother's instincts can only be suppressed for so long. Slowly but surely, she walks to the attic and begins to climb up. Hearing the noise, the children leave their rooms to come and see what's happening. Mom, what are you doing? One of them asks, but Yvette does not answer. All she can hear is Olivia in the attic. She still can't quite make out the words, but if she can just get up there, get inside, she knows that everything will become clear. She pushes open the door and climbs up into the inky blackness above. Back below, the children stare at the ladder, listening to the sound of hushed whispers. It goes on for several minutes before Yvette climbs back down into view. What was up there? One of the children asks. Yvette turns to look at them, her face pale, her eyes hollow. She shakes her head, silent for a long moment. When she speaks, her voice trembles with a mixture of confusion and horror. I don't know. It wasn't Olivia. As days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, and months turn into years, the Lee family tries everything they can think of to make life with the attic bearable. They try to ignore it, but that doesn't work anymore. They attempt to have the house demolished, torn down so they can build something new on top of the rubble. But after they sign the papers, they wake up in bed and find that the construction company no longer exists. Franklin tries to investigate the attic again, but it just won't let him inside. If he ever makes it all the way up there, he isn't able to remember it. One day, in a fit of desperation, he takes out an ad in the newspaper asking for help from someone experienced in the unexplainable. He doesn't expect much to come of it, but the ad draws the attention of a secretive organization. A group of men come to the door to speak with the Lee family identifying themselves as members of an organization they will only refer to as the Foundation. The men from the Foundation attempt to climb into the attic, only to find themselves standing at the front door again. They begin scribbling down notes after this occurrence, whispering to each other and saying words like cognito hazard and reality altering. The Lees don't understand much of it, but they can tell that it's nothing good. The men from the Foundation block off the house with caution tape, put up a notice of a highly dangerous gas leak, and then ask the Lees to come with them. Over the next few days, Dr. Dorset of the SCP Foundation conducts interviews with Yvette and Franklin regarding the nature of the attic and their experiences with it. He also speaks with the children that still live with them, as well as several of their neighbors. Following these interviews, the Foundation attempts several more manned explorations of the attic, as well as a few unmanned explorations. However, these attempts prove unsuccessful. In the days following these attempts, the Foundation discovers that all records of them have disappeared and that the investigation attempts appear to have never actually taken place. The research team is desperate to put the puzzle together and realizes they're still missing one piece. The runaway daughter, Olivia. The Foundation tracks her down, living under a new name and working as a landscaping contractor, and brings her in for questioning. She is surprisingly cooperative, almost unfazed by the bizarre situation. <laughs> Dr. Garrett is selected to conduct the interview, and he meets Olivia, now Rebecca Feldman, in an interrogation room. He begins the interview saying, Miss Feldman, what I want to discuss with you is a phenomenon associated with your parents' home, likely located in the upstairs... She cuts him off. The attic, I know. I thought somebody would come after me about that. I just didn't think it would be so soon. Dr. Garrett is surprised at her cavalier attitude toward the attic. He asks if she's aware of the phenomenon occurring in the house. 
She nods and says, I left my parents when I was a kid, Dr. Garrett. We, we'd always fought. They weren't happy with the choices I had made, the things I believed in, the people I spent time with. There was anger there. So much anger I thought it might suffocate me. When I left, I felt like I could breathe again. I never went back after that, but sometimes I can still feel it. You know how you feel when you're dreaming and you're trying to run from something, but you can't see it, and you don't know if it's really there, but you run anyway? That's how it feels. He asks her what prompted her to leave her parents. Rebecca looks down at her hands, folded on the table, before she speaks again. There was one night. We had a fight, and my dad was drinking, and mom was even worse off at that point, and I kept a knife under my pillow for a long time in case something happened, and they came into my room that night. I don't know what their intentions were, but I drew it and backed them into the wall. The whole thing felt like I was being choked, and that was the first time I heard it. Something moving above me. I dropped the knife and ran, and I didn't look back. Dr. Garrett only had one more question for her whether she knows about anything in the attic. She looked up from her hands then, meeting Garrett's eyes. There are always secrets, Doctor. There's only so much hate that can build up in a place before it starts hating you back. I don't know what's in the attic, or if there's anything up there at all. I don't think I want to. With that, she stands up and leaves the room. The Foundation plans to detain her and investigate her story further to try and get to the heart of the truth but the next day, they can't find her. As more days pass and they are unable to track her down, they come to a disquieting conclusion. According to all available information and legal documentation, Olivia Lee does not exist. Dr. Garrett insists that he spoke with her and continues to review the transcript of their conversation. She remains clear as day in his memories and in the minds of her family, but in reality, or whatever the entity in the attic molded this reality into, she never existed at all. The boy and his father have spent the entire morning cleaning out the basement of the boy's grandfather, and the boy is absolutely exhausted. After yet another trip up those rickety cellar steps, the boy collapses onto the old living room couch. He can still hear his father puttering around downstairs, yelping and gasping in surprise every time he finds some memento of his childhood stashed among the debris. The boy sighs in annoyance. He doesn't really know his grandfather, so he doesn't feel any sense of loss as they tear through the boxes and bags in the basement. His father, however, insisted that the boy come along. It'll be good for us to spend some time together, he said, and the boy suspects that his father is trying to deal with his own guilt about his strained relationship with the boy's grandfather. Perhaps he hopes that a day of father-son bonding is just what they need to make sure that they don't grow apart as his father did with his grandfather. The boy, however, doesn't think that cleaning out a musty old basement should qualify as effective father-son bonding. It's super boring. Worse, it turns out that the boy's deceased grandfather was an absolute hoarder who couldn't throw anything away, so the house is filled with all sorts of worthless garbage. The boy groans, his feet ache from traipsing all those stairs, and his back aches from carrying boxes. He thinks that he deserves a little break. He pulls a small handheld gaming console from the pocket of his hoodie and turns it on. I'll just play for a couple minutes, he thinks to himself, then I'll go and help Dad some more. He won't mind if I take a short break to recover. The boy is sitting on the battered couch in the living room, playing the latest game on his handheld game console, when his father lurches into the room, carrying a gigantic white plastic box in his arms. Check it out, sport, says his dad, a wide grin on his face. Look what I just found in the basement. The boy briefly looks up from his game, resisting the temptation to roll his eyes at his father's annoying enthusiasm. His father is always getting excited for the dumbest things. As for that white box, the boy's never seen anything like it. It's a Sega Dreamcast, the father says as he sets the white box on the living room floor and starts to untangle the massive wires protruding from the back of the object. This was my favorite video game system when I was a kid. I guess your grandfather just couldn't throw it away. What else is new? mutters the boy under his breath. But he bites his tongue as he watches his father studiously pick apart the knots in the tangled wires. Obviously, this hunk of junk has big sentimental value for his dad. Reluctantly, he slides off the couch and takes a seat next to his father on the floor, and together, the two of them set up the Dreamcast. This had all the best games, continues his father. Soul Calibur, Sega vs. Capcom, oh, you're gonna love these. After a few minutes, his father has the wires plugged into the television, and the hand controller's ready. He nudges his son in the side with his elbow. What do you say, champ? 
You ready to go mano a mano against your old man with some real video games? I'm about to school you in what real games are like, none of this silly, what's it called, Among Us junk like you played today. It's not called Among Us, Dad, mutters the boy under his breath, but his father is already distracted pulling out old games. His father holds up a CD clamshell and pries it open, revealing a stack of silvery discs. And look at this, all my old games, too. The boy tries to contain his boredom as his father rattles off a list of his favorite old video games, none of which are familiar to the boy. But eventually, his father reaches one disc that isn't familiar. Eurythmics, he says, squinting at the title embossed across the disc. I don't remember this one. I wonder if your grandfather got it after I moved out. The father pauses as if overcome with emotion. The boy can imagine what his father is thinking. Did his grandfather buy this disc knowing how much his father loved his Dreamcast video games and hoping that maybe it could serve as a reconciliation present between them? That's exactly the sort of dopey sentimental thing that his dad would think after spending all morning going through his grandfather's junk and reminiscing about what could have been. Uh, it looks like it's some sort of dance game, prompts the boy, hoping to get his father to focus more on the game than his feelings of nostalgia and loss. Oh, right, right, says the father. I wonder why grandpa had this when he didn't have a dance mat to connect. Maybe you just have to hit the control buttons in rhythm? Hmm. He holds it up, the reflective disc shining brightly in the light of the overhead lamp, and the boy stares at the silvery disc in confusion. He's seen pictures of CD-ROM discs before, in old catalogs or even movies, but he's never seen one in real life. Who even uses discs like that anymore? Everything's just downloadable from the internet these days. What is that anyway? asks the boy. A CD? This is not a CD, says his father, a slight edge of annoyance in his voice. The boy rolls his eyes. His father is always acting like he should be familiar with the outdated dinosaur technology of his father's youth. When will his dad learn? Just because this junk was important to his father when he was growing up doesn't mean that it's still important to the next generation. The boy holds his tongue, knowing that his father will probably start to sulk if he's reminded that time marches on, and that he's no longer as hip and with it as he likes to think he is. It's a GD-ROM says his father, as if those words are supposed to mean anything to the boy. It stands for Gigabyte Disk Read-Only Memory. The boy has no clue what that means, and he hopes that his father isn't about to start a lecture on the different kinds of obsolete video game tech that he's suddenly decided are so vitally important for his son to know about. Luckily, his dad doesn't launch into a long-winded talk. He's too curious about what's on this mysterious disk to bother about that now. The father shoves the disk into the Dreamcast and settles down on the floor, gripping the controller with both hands. He's as excited as a kid in a candy store as he waits for the screen to boot up. The boy can't remember the last time that his father has been so eager for anything. But his excitement is short-lived as the first loading screen boots up. A cheerful, happy melody plays from the Dreamcast speakers. The game title, Eurythmics, flashes on screen with options for one or two players listed below it. The father clicks over to two players, nodding for his son to pick up the other controller. The boy does as he's told. He can't imagine that this game is going to be any good. How old is it, anyway? It's from when his dad was a kid, so that's all the way back in the 90s. This game might as well be a hundred years old for all the boy cares. Immediately when the father chooses two players, the screen starts to glitch. The father yells in frustration, throwing his controller to the floor, but the boy sighs in relief. Thank God, at least now he won't have to pretend that this dinosaur game is anything good. I guess it's busted, says the boy, ready to turn away from the Dreamcast. But his father is insistent. No, no, it's just warming up. Watch, I'll fix this. He grabs his controller and tries to click on two players again. The screen only glitches more. Okay, okay, just give me a minute, says the father. If this doesn't work, I'll just take the disc out and blow on it. I'm sure that'll work. The boy stares in confusion. It's a disc, not a cartridge. He doesn't see any way that blowing on it will have any effect. His father is just desperately grasping at straws, upset that his attempt at father-son bonding is being thwarted. Meanwhile, the cheerful loading screen music starts to fray stuck repeating a single reverberating note that gradually degenerates into a tuneless cacophony. The pixels shimmy and wobble on screen, the image fracturing worse and worse as the father struggles to get the game console to respond to his commands. The boy watches the screen with disinterest at first, but then… wait, what's going on? The more he stares at the screen, the more the random noises and broken graphics seem to form into something strange, something unknowable, but also something vaguely coherent? He blinks in confusion, his jaw dropping. He wants to call his father's attention to the bizarre formations on screen, but his father is too busy wrestling with the controller to notice the effect that he's having. Dad, Dad, look at the screen, says the boy, grabbing his father's shoulder and pointing. Huh, what is it, did it work? 
What the? The father furrows his brow in confusion as he notices the wildly oscillating image on the TV screen for the first time. That doesn't look like a Dreamcast game at all. It's all broken, I... I think? The colors swirl around the screen in hypnotic, psychedelic patterns, and both father and son find themselves mesmerized, unable to look away. The boy is only vaguely aware of what computer graphics in the late 90s would have looked like, but he's reasonably sure that no underpowered 90s console could produce something this wild. The boy feels himself getting groggy, his brain fogging over as he stares at the wildly oscillating shapes on the screen. He feels like he could almost make sense of them if he just tried hard enough. It's like looking at one of those old-fashioned magic eye pictures, where the image only collapses into sense if you cross your eyes just right, but these strange swirls of color are something far beyond that. The swirls spiral into distinct vortex patterns, to the point that the boy might almost believe that he's looking at… eyes. Yes, that's it, he's sure of it. He wants to panic as he becomes aware of the sensation of being watched. He feels like something beyond the screen, some malevolent entity has somehow gained access to his world via this video game and is now watching him, sizing him up like a predator would size up its prey. He can't think of anything except those staring eyes with their rotating pupils. He wants to fall forward and disappear into the eternal nothingness of those awful eyes. Next to him, his father is silent. Like the boy, he's also enraptured by the infinite eyes on screen. Oh my god, he mutters, so quiet that the boy can barely hear him. Do you... Do you see the eyes? It's your grandfather. He's watching us from beyond. I know that's him. The boy doesn't know whether his father is right. His father is probably just letting his guilt color his perception, because the boy doesn't feel like there's human intelligence on the other side of the screen. Whatever is out there, whether it's an alien mind from beyond human ken, or simply a computer program given awful sentience by a freak accident, it's not something that the boy can even begin to comprehend. He feels his mind shutting down in the face of that terror, as if his brain simply cannot take the strain anymore. He's only vaguely aware of his father hitting the floor in a dead faint. That should worry him. He should be frightened. He should want to rush to his father's side and try to shake him back awake. But his brain can't make his body respond. He feels his arms and legs getting weak and his eyelids getting heavy. It isn't long before his eyes drift shut and the boy collapses onto the floor next to his father. Hours later, after the sun has already set, a car pulls up in front of the house and the boy's mother gets out. She frowns as she looks at the front of the house, noting that the lights are on inside and the front bay window casts a yellow square of light across the front lawn. The boy and his father must still be inside. They were supposed to have finished moving all that junk hours ago. She's tried calling both of their cell phones to remind them that they should be home for dinner, but neither father nor son has answered any of her calls or texts. She's not worried, though. They often ignore their phones when they get really involved in an activity, and she suspects, rightly, that her husband probably found some childhood relic in the basement that's distracted him from getting the task done. She's willing to bet that the two of them probably haven't even finished cleaning the basement. She walks up the garden path and puts her hand against the doorknob. The door creaks open. She frowns. Nothing sinister about that, right? Of course, they wouldn't bother to lock the door if they were still working inside, right? Nevertheless, she feels a strange chill run up her spine. Why is she suddenly so nervous? She pushes open the door and fumbles for the light switch. The foyer is dark, as is most of the house. The only light comes from the living room, and she can see that something within is throwing dancing shadows against the far wall. She hears a toneless, mechanical drone emanating from the living room. Are they watching television? That would be just like them to turn on the tube and completely lose track of time. But what TV show would make an awful din like that? She storms into the living room, ready to read her husband and son the riot act. But then, she stops dead in her tracks. Her husband and son are here all right, but they're lying in crumpled heaps upon the floor, staring glassy-eyed at the ceiling. She screams as she rushes to her husband, praying that she's wrong, that they're just playing a prank on her, that they just got tired and lay down on the floor to rest. But as she presses her finger against his wrist, she feels that he's cold and lifeless. He's dead, and has been for hours. Her son, pale and cold and lifeless, lies next to him. She looks up, her gaze connecting with the television screen. It continues to flash vacillating images in an erratic loop, nonsense static that she can't understand. But if she didn't know better, she might almost feel like… 
It's watching her. The strange, swirling eyes stare back, unblinking and eternal. What started as a misguided attempt at father-son bonding time ended in tragedy, because those GD-ROM discs weren't ordinary discs at all, but rather instances of what the SCP Foundation has dubbed SCP-4904. SCP-4904 is a set of seven modified GD-ROM discs manufactured by the Sega Corporation. SCP Foundation agents have been able to pinpoint the date of manufacture of each disc sometime between 1997 and 1999. The GD-ROM was a proprietary format originally used for the Dreamcast video game console, developed by Yamaha as an answer to fighting the piracy that was rampant among more standard compact discs and to offer increased storage capacity without the expense of the fledgling DVD-ROM. The GD-ROM seemed promising at the time, as it had a storage capacity of a full gigabyte, 42% higher than conventional CDs. Ultimately, though, GD-ROMs failed to catch on and were quickly outpaced by DVD technology. The seven discs in the SCP Foundation storage are visually indistinguishable from non-anomalous GD-ROM discs, except for their serial numbers. The serial numbers give some indication of the mystery behind their origin, revealing that they were created by Sega's enigmatic R&D Zero division during the height of the 90s console wars. It is estimated that R&D Zero produced a total of between 60 and 100 experimental GD-ROM discs similar to those in SCP-4904, but the rest of the production line is currently unaccounted for. Each SCP-4904 GD-ROM contains one Sega video game, including Sonic Adventure, Sega Rally Championship 2, House of the Dead 2, Sega Bass Fishing, Godzilla Generations, Virtua Fighter 3 TB, and an unreleased 3D rhythm game by the name of Eurythmics. But the result when anyone tries to play any of these different games is always the same. When an instance of SCP-4904 is fed into a Dreamcast console, it causes the optical disk drive's reader to move in unpredictable ways, accessing disk data seemingly at random. At first, the game boots up as expected and seems perfectly ordinary, but when a player progresses past the loading screen, the game very quickly becomes illegible. Sprites and assets blend into each other in asymmetrical chunks, maps recursively render onto other maps, and soundtracks transform within seconds into incessant, oscillating noise. A perfunctory glance at the results seems like absolute chaos, but eventually, observers will start to notice patterns within the noise. These eventually coalesce into complex renderings of landscapes and figures wildly inconsistent with the content of the original games, and computationally impossible for 1990s-era video game hardware to render. Repeated tests by SCP Foundation agents have turned up a recurring motif in the images shown by SCP-4904, spinning disks that resemble malevolent eyes. SCP agents hope that research into R&D Zero and the man responsible for the disk's creation might help to explain the reason or the purpose of SCP-4904. R&D Zero's former lead hardware programmer Ken Matsuya has said on record that the team encountered numerous problems in implementing the disk's anti-piracy encryption measures. The result was unplayable. Frustrated by this failure, Sega ordered that the encryption project be abandoned and the prototype disks quietly destroyed. However, it does not appear that Sega's orders were carried out to the letter. Matsuya himself rescued seven of the disks, hoping to learn more about the issue on his own time, and it's possible that other disks not currently known to the Foundation also survived. With the help of improvised Sega hardware, Matsuya spent the next four years trying to understand the cause behind the disks' erratic behavior. Notebooks recovered from his apartment contain numerous sketches of the disk-generated visuals. Depicting fractal combinations of landscape and figures seemingly drawn from places outside of the game data themselves, and stylized spinning disks in the shape of eyes. Matsuya himself met a strange and untimely end when he was found dead from a heart attack in his apartment in August 2003. Stranger still, an autopsy revealed that large portions of his brainstem and limbic system were missing. His death puzzled authorities, since there was no evidence of any human, or even non-human, intrusion. Matsuya had apparently loaded one of the SCP-4904 instances in his possession into his home Dreamcast before his death, because the distinctive psychedelic visuals were playing on his television screen at the time that his body was discovered. Foundation agents suspected that the visuals might have some connection with Matsuya's death, leading to the disc's subsequent classification and containment, but intensive tests on SCP-4904 by Foundation personnel have failed to shed any light on the situation. Both the disc's strange behavior and Matsuya's death remain complete mysteries. Is SCP-4904 a gateway into some other dimension, and its bizarre images a signal from another world? 
Could it be a message from beyond the veil? Or is it all just due to a simple computer glitch and Matsuya's death just a freak coincidence? Whatever the case, the Foundation is doing its best to uncover the truth. SCP-4904 has been given the object class safe, but should be stored in conditions comparable to those needed to keep non-anomalous disks viable. All seven instances of SCP-4904 are kept in a climate-controlled safe class storage locker at Site-15. Long-term tests lasting over an hour should only be conducted on reinforced, modified hardware to prevent disk deformation or explosion. A satellite floats in the cold depths of space above our pale blue dot. It positions its targeting array down at a point thousands of miles below, and fires. Clack, clack, clack. A tired-looking man sitting in a coffee shop types away on his computer, taking advantage of the free Wi-Fi to send off yet another job application. Nearby, a barista is writing down orders while a businessman takes a call between quiet sips of his mocha. A teenage girl texts her friend, giggling occasionally. An old man chews his bagel just a little too loudly for comfort. Nothing appears all that out of the ordinary. Until the blast hits. Intensity level 25. The job seeker notices a faint whisper in his ear. It startles him, and he turns to look around the coffee shop, but he can't spot who was whispering to him. How odd. He turns back to his keyboard and carries on typing, but a strange feeling hangs over him. This pervasive sense that something is very wrong. His eyes turn to the businessman, and he notices something. His phone is gone, but he's still loudly talking to someone. Someone who isn't there. The barista is smiling as she seems to note down orders, but in her notebook, she's scrawling the words, getting closer, again and again and again, and she doesn't have any idea why. The teenage girl, with shifty, furtive eyes, texts her friend a message saying, this is gonna sound crazy, but I feel like someone's watching me. As the job seeker tries in vain to fight the feelings of unease, he keeps hearing the old man chewing. Loud, incessant, cow-like chewing. It's really beginning to get on his nerves. Suddenly the thought crosses his mind that he'd actually like to kill this man. He'd like to squeeze his throat and break his jaw so that he could never chew like that again. The sudden appearance of this alien thought frightens him, and it's about to get so much worse. Intensity level 35. The job seeker starts to wonder if there's any point to this. He suspected that he'd been fired from his last job because nobody liked him. Did he really think he had a chance at getting this one? Really? What a stupid pipe dream. He's bombarded by thoughts like these that make typing more and more difficult. He notices that his hands are shaking. The chewing behind him is still so loud. He can't turn around. He knows on some level that if he does, he'll say something to the old man that he can't take back. The barista stares off into the distance, a haunted, contemplative look in her eye. The businessman gazes into his mocha like a crystal ball. The teenage girl begins to weep. The job seeker looks up when he notices something strange is happening outside. A middle-aged woman walking her dog suddenly clutches her chest like she's having a heart attack. She bends over and breathes deeply. Her dog barks at nothing, enraged by some invisible force that's all around them. Intensity level 50. Something's wrong. The voice in the job seeker's head is no longer a whisper. It's hissing and barking cruel words at him like, useless, worthless, lazy, disgusting, each one boring into his head like a power drill. But far more frightening than the voices themselves is the fact that he believes every single thing they're saying. He's lulled into a trance by their venomous rhythm. The only thing louder is that unending chewing. The waitress calmly walks back to the counter. She picks up a jug of blistering hot coffee and begins to swig directly from it. She can feel it sizzling in her mouth, and she couldn't care less. The businessman begins an intense screaming match with somebody who isn't there, snarling and practically foaming at the mouth. The job seeker can't take that chewing anymore. He turns to the old man, ready to unload on him. But when he opens his mouth to speak, nothing comes out. He sees that the bagel is gone, but the old man is still chewing. He smiles at him, red liquid streaking his lips and teeth. The job seeker looks down at the table and sees the outline of a fingerless hand under the old man's blood-soaked napkin. Intensity level 75. Inside the coffee shop, pandemonium breaks loose. The old man lies catatonic in his booth. The businessman fights a nearby wall, knuckles and toe bones cracking against the bricks. The waitress has the teenage girl in a headlock as the girl shrieks in agony and stabs at her assailant's leg with a table fork. The job seeker looks out the window at the violence suddenly unfolding on the street. 
Complete strangers are attacking each other with murderous intent, biting, gouging, punching, clawing, tearing, strangling. It all looks like fun. He picks up his laptop and tosses it through the coffee shop window, shattering the glass, as if he was ever going to get that stupid job anyway. He steps through the broken window, a new man, and picks up a large jagged shard of broken glass, ready to join in on the festivities. Intensity level Keter. Thousands of people are changed. They do unimaginable things to each other and themselves. There is chaos in homes and out on the streets as everything collapses in a wave of terrible, unspeakable violence. Nothing will ever be the same. Thankfully, the horrors that you just observed were only part of a simulation, one created by the SCP Foundation and intended to demonstrate the worst case scenarios of various anomalies on their roster. These events have not yet come to pass, but they very easily could if there was even a minor accident with the rogue anomalous satellite known as SCP-923. The SCP-923 satellite consists of a large parabolic dish made from unknown alloys, as well as a powerful internal reactor that produces massive quantities of energy and radiation, all to power the satellite's mysterious anomalous firing mechanism. 923 appears to select specific targets that it then fires a blast of energy at. Those in the proximity of the target when the beam hits are also affected, with the severity of the damage contingent on the intensity of the blast. Like many anomalies, its origins are shrouded in mystery. SCP-923 displays a degree of artificial intelligence and posts reports on its own condition and operations to the O5 Council Secured Information Relay Network, a classified communication network reserved for Foundation employees with Level 5 clearance. According to 923's own data, it was constructed in a Foundation research and development site. This is congruent with blueprints for a planned offensive satellite which was to be constructed at that very site but the project had actually been cancelled due to logistical concerns. The O5 Council deems it extremely important that SCP-923 never be made aware of this fact. Currently, since two-way lines of communication have been established, 923 obeys the orders of the O5 Council, not firing on a target unless given authorization by them. If it ever discovers that it technically isn't a Foundation construction, it runs the risk of going rogue and triggering some extremely dangerous outcomes, to say the least. SCP-923 was first discovered after it started a correspondence with the O5 Relay Network, posting a message that it had completed another successful termination, despite no such termination actually being ordered. Over the next several hours, this process continued as the 923 satellite sent in termination report after termination report, totaling 57 by the time it stopped, 55 of which were later confirmed to be actual deaths, with the other two being deemed inconclusive. Adjustments have since been made to ensure that SCP-923 can't access any information on the network that hasn't been directly intended for it. SCP-923 is an extremely effective weapon. Depending on its operator's level of tolerance for collateral damage, it can completely reverse its orbit to detect and fire upon a target anywhere on Earth in a very short period of time. All it needs are the target's GPS coordinates, their altitude, the intended time of firing, and a selected level of intensity. This, incidentally, is where things get interesting with the tests the Foundation conducted. Naturally, they wanted to see the kind of firepower that each level of intensity was capable of, so D-classes were requested for live tests. The first test performed was at intensity level 10. However, this resulted in an error message, claiming that the 923 satellite isn't capable of firing at an intensity lower than level 23. In accordance with this new information, the Foundation planned the next test at intensity level 25, this time, the effects immediately took hold. The target and those nearby began to experience a degree of paranoid delusion. They would report hearing voices and be seen interacting with people who weren't there. They would experience a sense of crushing terror, impending doom, and also report the growing desire to cause harm to others. Most of all, in debriefing interviews, they would claim that they felt like they were being watched, though they refused to elaborate on what exactly they meant by that. Recovery time from this condition was measured at being between 15 and 19 days. Next came the test at intensity level 35. Everyone affected experienced symptoms similar to intensity level 25, except with powerful new self-destructive compulsions. The area of effect also grew with the increased power. Researchers who thought they were safe over 10 meters away collapsed to the ground in intense panic attacks. The effects were much longer on this setting too, and recovery from this intensity took 6 to 8 months. Interestingly, during the test there was a severe disruption to the audio-visual equipment. Some devices had been displaced, others were fused to the ground. 
The video footage was corrupted beyond use, but the audio retrieved displayed nothing out of the ordinary. However, when survivors of the test were asked to listen to the recorded audio, they claimed to once again hear the voices that were in their head that day and experience the terrible feelings and compulsions start up again. One of the researchers appended a note to the file which read, It looks like this thing actually has a blast effect to it and is not just a laser of madness. The audio and video feed disruptions are particularly interesting. From now on, researchers are to observe remotely, and D-Class personnel are to be secured so they can't harm themselves. We need them alive for study. Next, the intensity was brought up to level 50, and the test was conducted once again. The results were once again similar to the previous one, but with far greater intensity and more pronounced physical effects on its victims. D-Classes who were completely restrained still exhibited cuts and tears in their skin, and audio-visual recording equipment was displaced to an even greater degree than before. Victims of this intensity have not yet recovered, and Foundation researchers are not confident that they ever will. But the effects went further than just the people present. It appears that the area itself was subject to long-lasting effects. Staff who recovered the D-classes from the testing area reported an extreme sense of unease, claiming that the testing area simply felt wrong, but were unable to elaborate further. In spite of this, the tests continued to increase in intensity. Next, the level was increased to 75, and this is when things truly began to go off the rails. The satellite's target was rendered completely comatose, and the D-classes within 16 meters of him broke free from their restraints and began slaughtering each other with their bare hands. Disturbingly, many of the subjects, both living and dead, who were tested after the fact, seemed to bear wounds consistent with attacks by bladed weapons. None of the D-classes were armed, and the wounds seemed impossible to have been caused by mere fingers and teeth. There was an even greater displacement of recording devices, and some were missing after the test. The retrieved recordings caused even worse states of distress for those affected by the blast who were lucky enough to actually survive and could listen to them again. But it didn't end there. Anyone within 50 meters experienced intense panic attacks that often lasted longer than an hour. Observing researchers experienced what could best be described as a slightly more mild version of intensity level 25 symptoms. They reported hallucinations, things moving in the corners of their eyes, hearing voices, experiencing heightened paranoia and feelings of dread. There was even some poltergeist activity recorded, with objects seeming to move of their own accord. The lasting effects on the physical area are even more pronounced, with laser rangefinders indicating a level of permanent spatial distortion at the epicenter of the blast site. A researcher appended a note to this section of the file, reading, This is crossing the line from scientific to just barbaric. SCP-923 has said that its maximum output is 238, which it promptly converts to Keter intensity. Let's just see what this does and report our findings. However, the Keter level intensity proved to be too much to handle, so much so that the entry on its test log begins with the sentence, It is strongly advised that this intensity never be used again. The blast induced psychosis permanently in every subject within a truly insane 2 kilometer radius, including a number of unfortunate researchers who severely underestimated the Keter level blast range. The site is now under permanent foundation protection as SCP-92302 due to the permanent effects the blast had on the landscape. A sense of panic is still felt from hundreds of meters away, and anyone who gets close enough to the center will experience full-blown psychosis just as much as those directly affected by the beam. Spatial and temporal anomalies abound in the area, and the O5 Council has deemed SCP-923 a risk in causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. But the most frightening part of all is yet to come. Every time the SCP-923 weapon is used, it causes a degree of internal damage to the satellite itself, raising the threshold of intensity that the weapon needs to even activate. It used to be that the satellite would fire at intensity level 23, but after extensive testing, its minimum intensity level is now 66. If the weapon is ever used again, it's only going to get worse. Despite this danger, SCP-923 has been classified as safe. But how is an object that is both out of Foundation control and able to operate with a dangerous degree of autonomy classified the same as harmless anomalies that require little to no containment procedures? The answer is buried in the question. The SCP Foundation cannot contain SCP-923, but seeing as there are currently over 7,500 active satellites orbiting planet Earth, 923 doesn't arouse much suspicion, especially with the Foundation cover story that it's merely a non-anomalous military satellite. The only continued containment effort required is making sure that other satellites do not enter its path of orbit to ensure that 923's advanced defense systems don't activate and destroy the interfering satellite, revealing its anomalous nature. 
Now go and watch another entry from the classified files of Dr. Bob, such as SCP-056, A Beautiful Person, or another SCP that'll drive you to do terrible things. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.